The Washington Post newsroom delivers breaking events around the world as they happen. Unrivaled reporting from the journalists you've come to trust to get the facts fast and meet the challenges of today head on. Get the news that matters most with a special offer by visiting WashingtonPost.com slash watch. Subscribing unlocks instant access, bringing you the Post's award-winning coverage anytime, anyplace, because democracy dies in darkness. The CEO of TikTok testifies before Congress for the first time today as the Chinese-based company faces calls for a ban in America or a demand for a new owner. Welcome to this special report from the newsroom of The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey. Well, the head of TikTok, Sho Chu, goes before the House Energy and Commerce Committee. It's a sprawling 52-member body, and this is expected to be a confrontational encounter. The CEO has been preparing for it. Questions today will range from concerns over whether the Chinese government can access user data to the mental health of the young people who use the app. Joining me now from Capitol Hill to preview what is to come, senior congressional reporter Rhonda Colvin, and here in the newsroom, opinions columnist James Homan and technology columnist Jeffrey Fowler. Rhonda, let's start with you. How much anticipation and preparation has gone into this on Capitol Hill? Well, this day has been highly anticipated since the Energy and Commerce Committee announced that they would have Mr. Chu in front of them. He has been sought by other congressional committees, as have other uh, TikTok uh, executives. And there's only been one other time where we've seen a TikTok America executive address Congress. So this is a highly anticipated hearing. I just walked over to where the hearing is going to happen. It's a, it's a bit of a chaotic scene. There are a lot of people there, uh, a lot of media, as well as people uh, from the public who want to sit in on this. When I walked in this morning, I saw uh, people with Team TikTok shirts. There have been a lot of people around Capitol Hill last night as well here to let lawmakers know that the app uh, is uh, very special to them, that they are content creators who have made careers out of using this app, that it was used during the pandemic and fostered a sense of community for people. So there are people here trying to uh, confront some of the lawmakers' concerns about TikTok being such a threat. But let's look at the time of this hearing. This comes at a time where both chambers, the House and the Senate, have proposed legislation that really runs the gamut on banning TikTok or at least curbing it. So he's coming in front of uh, perhaps not a very friendly audience. And as you mentioned, this is a pretty big committee. It's 52 members big. Uh, each member is likely to get five minutes to question Mr. Chu. And from the advanced statements that I've seen from uh, the ranking member on this committee, as well as others in Congress, it looks like he is going to face a real grilling here. Uh, you also have this happening at a time where the White House had said that they would either want this company sold to an American company or banned. You also, uh, just a few weeks ago, had members of the intelligence community testifying in front of the Senate saying that they have raised concerns about TikTok and national security. So you're likely to hear those things brought up as well. Uh, so you can expect uh, a long hearing. We're thinking it will go a few hours, but it'll likely cover a lot of ground, specifically about national security, the algorithms, and sharing Americans' uh, data with Beijing. Thanks, Rhonda, for laying that out for us. James, lawmakers are going to have a lot of questions, but we always wonder in these hearings how much are they genuinely probing right. to get answers and how much are they trying to make political points. Yeah, so, so lay out for us what we should be listening for today and if we really might learn something. So Mr. Chu's going to be under oath. Uh, unlike a lot of TikTok's denials about things related to China in the past, he is, this is sworn testimony. The chair of the committee, Kathy McMorris Rogers, a Republican from Washington, she represents the Spokane area. She supports a national ban, and her aides have said in recent days that there's literally nothing he could say during this testimony that would change her mind. Uh, so in that case, I'm not sure that there's going to be real probing to be persuaded. Uh, we've seen the opening statement that the CEO is going to deliver, and he's going to talk about all these different steps that they're taking. And so I think that there's going to be questions about various reporting over the years about Chinese uh, nationals having access to data or accessing data using uh, some of their back-end information to surveil journalists who are reporting on the company. Uh, he's he's going to be pressed on a lot of this reporting. And as Rhonda was just talking about, you have these intelligence officials who are just up there. Uh, we covered it a few weeks ago, the uh, annual threat assessment hearing, and both the head of the FBI and the head of the NSA described TikTok as a national security threat. 
And so you're certainly going to have members who are kind of saying react to that uh, and looking for assurances. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think uh, the Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo said a couple days ago that uh, she, the politician in her thinks it would be political suicide to actually ban TikTok because no one under 35 would ever vote for uh, for Democrats again. And so the, you know, that dynamic certainly exists as well. Uh, and, and I think, you know, Libby, you and I have <laughs> covered a lot of these hearings. It's not Ted Stevens anymore talking about the inner tubes, but a lot of times these hearings can expose some of the uh, technological illiteracy of, uh, of, of some of the members. In Ted Stevens' <laughs> defense, he actually knew a lot about the Internet. Um, you know, I, I do want to point out, Jeff, it's wonderful to have you here from the West Coast. We're so grateful to have you here on this really important day. And James brings up something so essential, which is that many lawmakers already have their minds made up. So who is this hearing really for? Uh, who, who, who does Xochitl have to convince? He has to convince Americans. This is a big day in the lives of American internet users. 150 million of us use TikTok at least once a month. And it's been a long time, perhaps not since prohibition, that the U.S. government has tried to take something away from that many people. And yet we haven't really heard the U.S. government explain in terms that Americans can understand why this should be taken away from us. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm listening for. Kind of my job at The Post is to be a representative of, of the reader, of the user of this technology. What is the argument to us as the people who use TikTok, as parents who are concerned about our kids using TikTok, why should we treat TikTok differently than we treat other social media apps, differently than Facebook, Instagram, and others? What is it about its Chinese ownership that specifically is a risk to us? Because I honestly haven't heard, and I've had conversations with members of Congress about this, I haven't heard them lay that out in terms. Where is the evidence of the harm to us? Mm. Uh, Rhonda, I want to go to you on Capitol Hill to talk about the climate right now. Donald Trump had called for a ban for TikTok. What's different now? as this is being discussed in the Biden administration and in this new Congress. Well, what's different now is there's a lot of momentum, bipartisan momentum, that we're seeing in both the House and the Senate uh, on uh, curbing TikTok, or at least instituting some sort of ban or protections. Uh, there have been uh, multiple proposals throughout the last few years that target TikTok. Uh, currently, there are several proposals, too, that have gotten uh, some notice. Uh, there is one that would ban it on college campuses, which has actually already happened in, on some college campuses. There are uh, other bills that would uh, take federal funds from any organization that uh, receives federal funds and also receives any advertising uh, money or agreements with TikTok. Uh, so there, there are many proposals looking at small things, but one of the uh, bigger pieces that has been gaining traction recently is a proposal uh, that would give the Commerce Secretary the power to ban TikTok. First, the Commerce Secretary would be given the charge to review if it's a national security uh, issue, as well as any other app that is uh, based in a foreign country, and then to Decide if it should be banned. And that is a lot different from what happened during the time where pres former President Trump tried to ban TikTok. There were concerns from courts that uh, that uh, would not allow free speech. Uh, but giving this power to the Commerce Secretary somewhat goes around that and creates a new legal standard that might be upheld in the courts. One of the reasons I say that this is gaining traction is you have a lot of uh, senators from both sides of the aisles backing this. It's uh, sponsored by uh, Senators Thune and Warren. Uh, it's been backed by a lot of the senators we often look at when there are critical votes, such as uh, Mitt Romney, Susan Collins, Joe Manchin. They're all behind this. Uh, so there does seem to be some, some traction going on right now uh, to give the Commerce Secretary the ability to ban the app. We'll see. Of course, sometimes there's a lot of momentum about things on Capitol Hill and then it goes nowhere. But there seems to be just a lot of chatter about banning the app here on Capitol Hill. Thanks, Rhonda. I want to bring in technology policy reporter Kat Zakreski. Kat, tell us about TikTok's lobbying efforts and the company's and CEO's attempts to build some DC connections, especially in recent weeks and months. So I would say that TikTok has been using what I would call the Facebook playbook. It's been a full on assault on Washington where they've had you know, the CEO on a charm offensive for weeks. Uh, Chu has tried to meet with every member of this more than 50 member House Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, we've also seen this massive ad campaign. Um, pretty much anywhere you go in DC these days, an airport, the train station, you see these big ads, um, you know, talking about the commitments that TikTok is making to data privacy. 
Um, and also we've seen them bring in some um, longtime uh, strategists and lobbyists. They're spending record amounts of money on lobbying Capitol Hill. And what they're trying to overcome is what I would say is a somewhat unprecedented trust deficit here in Washington. Um, they're coming into this hearing with lawmakers perhaps even more skeptical of them than other tech CEOs that we've seen in the past, like Mark Zuckerberg. Thanks, Kat. You know, Jeff, I was remembering when we were together at the Washington Post watching Jeff Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg, excuse me, you're Jeff, watching Mark Zuckerberg testify before Congress. And it really did have this atmosphere of, ooh, what's going to happen? Let's see how this goes. I brought popcorn. You literally brought popcorn. This feels different. It does. Uh, tell us what we know about the CEO of TikTok and, and uh, what your questions are about him and his leadership and how he'll present today. Americans really don't know anything about Mr. Chu. So this is going to be a big moment. Uh, should we trust him? I think is going to be uh, a lot of what Americans are, are asking. So we're going to, it all comes down to how he presents, how he answers. Does he seem evasive? Kind of the core question that I think we're going to hear again and again from the lawmakers is asking him to explain his relationship with the part of the company that is based in Beijing. What what, a, what ability does the Chinese government have to go in and order him to hand over our data, order him to, uh, to change the app in ways that would impact the lives of its American users? What do we know about that? Uh, so far, they have said that the Chinese government has, has never and would not ask for American user data. It says that it has policies in place to prevent that. Uh, but, and, and, and they have been rolling out this plan um, that I'm sure Kat could tell us more about that they're called Project Texas, which would base some of their, uh, or all of the American user data in servers in the US that would be to a certain degree controlled by another company, Oracle. Um, that said, the internet is, a, is, is not, does not care where things are based. And so the question remains, you know, could then folks in Beijing still access some of that information or exert some kind of control over it? So he better have some good answers and convincing answers to those questions. Uh, Kat, tell us about Project Texas. So Project Texas is what TikTok describes as its plan to effectively firewall US user data off from the rest of the ByteDance owned company. And so effectively how this would work is that there would be a US subsidiary run by um, American security workers that would hold all of the US data. Um, this would be overseen by a board that would uh, have individuals who are approved by the US government sitting on it. It would also be subject to regular government audits um, to address uh, security concerns. But the problem is that TikTok has been pitching this plan for months now in Washington. Um, and it has proposed this plan to CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, which has been reviewing um, the company for years now. And it seems that TikTok has not been able to bring lawmakers on board with this idea. Now, despite you know, these, uh, the skepticism and reservation that we've seen from policymakers, we're expecting Chu to go all in on Project Texas to talk about it today in his opening testimony. And um, you know, I think that's where we might see some of the initial disconnect and pushback from lawmakers that this Project Texas proposal is kind of TikTok's best um, you know, foot forward in terms of how they can protect US user data. And lawmakers have already signaled that that's just not enough. Mm. So James, what does TikTok and what do lawmakers do with that, that impasse? I mean, the, the challenge for Chu is to show that he is not part of the Chinese government. When you listen to a lot of members of Congress talk about TikTok, they act as if it is a state-run apparatus. And he is someone who lives in Singapore. You know, he went to uh, business school at Harvard. His wife grew up in Bethesda. They met when they were interning in the Bay Area. He was an intern at Facebook. He is going to try to project that he is a businessman who's caught between two governments in this new Cold War. Uh, and the Chinese foreign ministry has just put out a statement in the last few minutes uh, saying that TikTok is a strategic asset, that they will fight tooth and nail any uh, transfer of the algorithm from China uh, to the U.S. And so essentially he's going to try to present himself as, as not part of China. He's going to distance himself from the Chinese government. Uh, and that could be where he persuades Americans that, uh, you know, and, and what will be really interesting is whether he criticizes there are tribal, like Facebook, there is no national data privacy law. Mm -hmm. And so 
I, I think he could say, look, any concern you have about TikTok should equally apply to Facebook and Instagram and, and any other uh, app. Uh, a few years ago, the U.S. government, the committee that Kat was just talking about, did force the sale of Grindr uh, to a U.S. company from a Chinese-controlled company. And just a few weeks ago, it came out that uh, because of data brokers, uh, the, the private data uh, was about uh, Catholic priests was getting obtained, uh, even though it's a U.S.-owned company. As Jeff was just yeah. saying a couple of minutes ago, the Internet doesn't care where the data is based. And so it, it's hard to imagine to getting into that. Uh, and really bluntly making that argument, but that's certainly what they're saying behind closed doors. Yeah, I want to point out that Michelle Borstein and Heather Kelly did an amazing piece looking at this group that spent millions buying data from data brokers to track allegedly gay priests, and that yeah. happened in the U.S. after Grindr was sold uh, from yeah. away from the Chinese. So that's let's talk about this question of privacy. Yeah, so uh, when you talk to members of Congress and you ask them, what are the reasons to ban TikTok? Explain this to Americans. There are two big ones that come up. Um, there's concern about uh, the power that the, the Chinese government might have over the algorithm, as you were saying, over the information that we see. So we can return to that one in a minute. But the main one they always list is data privacy, that somehow the Chinese government is going to be able to gather lots and lots of information about Americans and somehow use that against us. Uh, the challenge with that argument is America doesn't have a data privacy law. We have very narrow laws in specific areas, things like health, and, uh, and tax information. We don't have any laws that essentially cover uh, what, uh, what TikTok does. But the problem is we also, Facebook also collects this information, Grindr collects this information, and according to US law, it's currently okay to sell this information. So um, if the Chinese government really wanted data on lots of Americans, it has lots of ways to get it. It doesn't need TikTok necessarily to do that. It could buy it. It's completely legal to sell this in America. That's how those folks in the Catholic Church outed those, those gay priests. Uh, so uh, the question is, what problem are we really solving when it comes to data privacy by banning TikTok? I want to talk to you a minute about what a ban would actually look like and how the mechanics of that could actually unfold. But first, I want to go to Rhonda before she heads into the hearing um, to talk about this question of privacy generally, Rhonda. You know, we have heard from people like Senator Mark Warner uh, over on the other side of the Capitol who's involved in intelligence as well as this question of trying to regulate privacy laws. Um, how many lawmakers there in this committee want to regulate privacy data overall versus this question of Chinese ownership and potential uh, uh, China access to data of this specific company? Well, we hear about Facebook and, and, and Twitter and, and other social media platforms. You might, and that is an important distinction to make, is how much do they care about curbing uh, any sort of uh, privacy or attempts to, to get information on Americans' uh, data uh, overall, or is it just TikTok? That's really going to be interesting to see uh, in a few moments when they start this hearing. I would, just out of you know being a Capitol Hill reporter and observer of how uh, this system works, right now you're seeing a lot of bipartisan, bipartisan appetite uh, for criticism to China. Uh, there is a uh, new committee that uh, was set up, a select committee, to investigate our competitiveness with China. Uh, they've held two hearings so far, and uh, that was uh, voted in by bipartisan support to create that select committee. So you're seeing this uh, testimony come at a time where there is real criticism of China happening in both chambers. I expect that to be part of the thinking and the calculation in questioning uh, Mr. Uh, Chu when he uh, is in front of this panel. I will uh, note that I did take a look at his uh, advanced copy of his opening statement. Two things stood out to me. One, it's very long. It does show that he is ready to go on the defense right now for TikTok. And, and of course, we cover congressional hearings all the time. Uh, I have not really seen uh, an opening statement at this length uh, in a long time. Uh, one of the things he is going to specifically address is the privacy concerns. He says that uh, he and his team have heard the concerns from lawmakers and that they should have solutions for pretty much all of the concerns. And he is going to, toward the end of that opening statement, address uh, the concerns that TikTok uh, or Beijing is getting uh, U.S. Uh, data from users of TikTok. He is going to say that's emphatically untrue. So he is going to address that out of the gate. But even though he addresses that out of the gate, this is expected to be a long hearing, and you'll likely see lawmakers ask him those questions over and over and over again. 
All right, thanks so much, Rhonda. Jeff, uh, let's talk about what we know about the data that TikTok actually collects and how it compares to other companies. Yeah, so uh, again, in conversations I've had with members of Congress uh, and with readers of the Washington Post, it seems like there's a lot of misunderstanding and misinformation even out there about what TikTok knows about you. So I got together with some of my favorite nerds out in Silicon Valley, and uh, we poked at the TikTok app. We tried to see what permissions does it have on your phone? What is its behavior um, in a web browser? And so we made a kind of, uh, a nutrition label, if you will, about what data that uh, the app collects. And a couple of things about it stand out to me. Uh, first of all, uh, unlike Facebook, unlike Instagram, unlike Twitter, um, there's some things that, that the TikTok app is not doing. It is not collecting your precise location. It doesn't even ask for permission to do that. What it does is it collects what's called a course location, so it knows what city you're in, usually based on something like your IP address, but not your um, your exact location. And that was the, the core issue in this case with Grindr, right? That was the information, that's probably the most sensitive information uh, that, that an app can collect. That said, it does still access quite a bit of information. Um, you know, it, uh, it's, it's perhaps not as bad as Facebook, but that is not exactly a compliment. Mm -hmm. It still uh, knows and records every time, every, every time you look at a video, it knows how long you scroll over a video, how long you might linger, and it uses all that to feed into its algorithm. It also asks for access to your contacts list. Now, you can say no to that, and I do recommend to all of our viewers today that they say no to that request, or you can even go in and retroactively say, please don't access my, my, my contacts list, because that's really intimate and personal information. The one other thing that we've seen TikTok increasingly doing um, is tracking what websites you go to beyond TikTok. They're starting to put these little uh, tracking technologies on websites all over, all over the internet, including, in fact, on the Washington Post website in some cases, that allow it to know what websites you're looking at. That said, that is straight out of the Facebook playbook. Mm -hmm. uh, that is how Facebook's advertising business work and it works, and uh, TikTok is not nearly as dominant in that as, as Facebook is. Mm. Let's talk about how Americans perceive TikTok, James, and this question of whether or not it should be banned. Um, and who is using TikTok? So, well, um, unsurprisingly, the youth, uh, you know, the, it's most popular among 18 to 35 year olds. Uh, and it is popular among each age group uh, g going up, uh, although in, in, you know, obviously in inverse. Uh, it is uh, disproportionately used by women, by people of color, uh, by uh, lower income folks. Uh, the Washington Post did a big national poll uh, that we released last night. It shows uh, a, a real relationship between who uses the app and what they think of it. Uh, you know, the 150 million monthly users is a lot. It's still just under half the population. Just under half the population. Of the U.S. Yeah. I mean, ima I mean that's, that's imagine, imagine if half the population subscribed to the Washington Post, <laughs> right? Yeah. right? That would be great. I mean, I mean there, there's this question of just how, if we become jaded in this sense of, yeah. of, of these incredible, incredibly strong user numbers. So, I mean, 70% of Americans are, are nervous, essentially, uh, to varying degrees, about Chinese influence over the app. And one thing I noticed in that, in, in that data as well, that about 70% are also nervous about another topic, which is the impact that TikTok, um, like other social media platforms, has on the lives of children, has on the lives of young people. And I think part of what's happening here is, um, is the sort of a blending of these two concerns. Uh, we're concerned about the impact on kids. We're concerned about China. Maybe China is somehow intentionally trying to make our kids dumber. And you see that in some of the arguments, actually, mm -hmm. that come forward. There was this argument that the Chinese equivalent of TikTok, because the TikTok app we use here is not the same as what people in China use, has limits on it that, uh, or had limits on it that didn't exist in the, the US app for how much time you could spend on it, did other things to emphasize educational content that previously the, the US TikTok app didn't have. So I think that's the sort of like Venn diagram mm -hmm. of concerns for Americans, that somehow China is uh, using its influence to maybe make us dumb. Mm. You know, I, I, I wanna go to Kat to ask this question about finding a buyer, right? So if it is determined that there should be a buyer for TikTok, Who's gonna buy it, Kat? That's the multi-billion dollar question right now because TikTok has grown substantially since 2020 when President 
Trump uh, tried to force a sale of the company. And so at that time, some of the buyers that were in the mix were Microsoft, were Oracle, but the company has been growing substantially. We've seen some, some, some projections that say that its ad revenue is expected to surpass YouTube's by the year 2025. And so that raises the question of which American tech companies would be big enough to take on this um, technology. There's also you know, potential antitrust concerns involved. Right now, many of the major American tech companies are facing federal antitrust lawsuits. Facebook is one, um, and that could also complicate any efforts to find a buyer um, you know, if we were to get to a point where it's for sale. But right now, these discussions about a sale of TikTok are in extremely early stages. Um, our sources at the company tell us that CFIUS, that, intergover that intergovernment agency panel that is pushing the sale, has not yet told them exactly what a sale would look like, what, for instance, um, individual stakes might, be need, uh, might need to be sold in the company, and so there's still a lot of questions remaining. Kat Sikresky, thanks so much. I look forward to continuing to read your reporting on this. Jeff, what would a ban look like and how would that actually happen? This is a really good question. And Kat and I were sort of trying to, to figure this out yesterday. We haven't really heard um, anybody lay out, how does America ban an app? Um, first of all, that's, uh, that, that's the kind of activity that we normally associate with China. Right? China has the Great Firewall. It prevents its citizens from accessing certain lots of websites, including Facebook and certain Google properties. So um, is America going to make a Great Firewall of its own? That would seem perhaps un-American. So what are the other levers that the U.S. government could pull? Um, it could ask uh, uh, Apple and Google, which run the app stores, to remove the app from them. That wouldn't make the app magically disappear from your phone overnight. What it would do is it would make the app that's on your phone slowly get less and less secure because then they couldn't push updates to it. That doesn't seem to be a great direction to take. We don't want to have Americans using a, a, an insecure thing. Uh, so then the question becomes, is there some other lever to force, sort of make it so difficult for, for TikTok to do business in America, mm. for people to advertise on it, that it might essentially have to fold, uh, at least for in terms of doing business with Americans. But we don't really have much precedent here. This is uh, for, for how, you, how you disappear an app from the United States. Mm. James, uh, we see content creators on Capitol Hill today. We see people who love and use TikTok as part of their daily experience on Capitol Hill and watching today's hearing. So tell us more about what this recent poll discovered about TikTok's users and concerns about uh, privacy. Yeah, so Jeff's absolutely right that there is this kind of conflation to some degree. In our poll, 71% were concerned that TikTok's company is based in China, 72% concern that TikTok is causing harm to teens' mental health. Very significant overlap. But among the other concerns are that, uh, to, to the point about the algorithm, 56% uh, say that it is likely to be letting China control what content U.S. users see. That was something that Chris Ray, the director of the FBI, raised during his recent testimony, where he said if China invaded Taiwan, they could secretly tweak the algorithm so that people aren't seeing certain things. Uh, the other thing that is coming up here in D.C. a lot, actually, is half of Americans say it's likely that TikTok is encouraging illegal activity through trends on the app. Uh, I was actually talking to the D.C. police chief just yesterday who was, you know, very nervous about people breaking into Kias and, uh, uh, because of some video on the app, you know, and that, that kids learn how to break into cars. Again, that's not, it has nothing to do with the China element of it. It's just that the popularity and the virality of the, the content. Uh, but those are concerns that I think a lot of adults have uh, and, and that maybe they're conflating with all these other worries that are geostrategic. I just want to point out that the TikTok CEO, Xiao Chu, is there in the room. You see those cameras surrounding him, and we are watching. I see the top Democrat on the committee entering uh, the room. Uh, we are watching this committee, 52 members. Each member will probably get about five minutes to ask a question. Uh, so you may hear some repetition. You'll hear some grilling of this witness. And we'll also, frankly, get a sense of just how wise these members of Congress really are about the app, about privacy laws, and, uh, and separating sort of some of the, the fear and the rumor from, from fact. Um, Jeff, I, I wanted you to be able to jump in on what, what James was saying because you've made it very clear there are a couple different issues going in tandem here. The mental health of teenagers, the privacy laws generally, and then this question of Chinese access. Yeah. Um, 
uh, I think it's um, it's it's going to be really really interesting to see uh, which which of these uh, concerns that Americans have stands out at the end of today. Is this going to be seen as a moment where? Uh, the American government finally does something to protect kids, or is it going to be seen as a as a old people versus young people moment? Another um, another like oh they're trying to take away rock and roll music from from ki from kids today. So uh, you know that's going to be in the hands of these members of Congress now. What will you be listening for? I'm going to be listening on behalf of the users of TikTok, on behalf of the parents who are concerned about this, to see is there an argument that they're making to me about why this should be taken away? Like, is there a convincing argument? Because again, not since prohibition have we tried to take away something from this many Americans. So there had better be a darn good reason. What will you be listening for, James? The, the, any definitive statements under oath from the CEO about lack of Chinese access or Chinese access, uh, the, the surveillance of people, the controls that are in place, uh, whether that withstands the scrutiny uh, of repeated rounds of questioning from very aggressive members of Congress. Chair Kathy McMorris Rogers is there. You can see her, uh, the top Republican on this committee. Uh, as we have talked about, she's raised concerns and we know where she stands, James. Yeah, she supports a national ban. Uh, and, and as we watch the hearing underway, I mean, I, I also wonder if there will be interruptions of, you know, TikTok creators, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, it's sort of ripe for that. Uh, and Kathy McMorris Rogers also has the gavel so she can let people have more time if she wants. All right, let's go now the to the hearing will come room. To order. Before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to address the guest in the audience. First of all, thank you for coming. We think engaged citizens are welcome and a valuable part of the political process. I do want to remind the guest in the audience that the chair is obliged under the House rules and the rules of the committee to maintain order and preserve decorum in the committee room. I know that we have deep feelings on these issues and that we all may not agree on everything, but I ask that we abide by these rules and be respectful of our audience members, our viewers, and our witnesses. The chair appreciates the audience cooperation in maintaining order as we have a full discussion on, on these important issues. The chair recognizes herself for five minutes for an opening statement. Mr. Chu, you are here because the American people need the truth about the, the threat TikTok poses to our national and personal security. TikTok collects nearly every data point imaginable from people's location to what they type and copy, who they talk to, biometric data, and more. Even if they've never been on TikTok, your trackers are embedded in sites across the web. TikTok surveils us all. And the Chinese Communist Party is able to use this as a tool to manipulate America as a whole. We do not trust TikTok will ever embrace American values, values for freedom, human rights, and innovation. TikTok has repeatedly chosen the path for more control, more surveillance, and more manipulation. Your platform should be banned. I expect today you'll say anything to avoid this outcome, like you are 100% responsible for what TikTok does, that you suddenly endorse a national data privacy standard, that Project Texas is more than a marketing scheme, that TikTok doesn't harm our innocent children or that your ties to the Chinese Communist Party through ByteDance is just a myth. We aren't buying it. In fact, when you celebrate the 150 million American users on TikTok, it emphasizes the urgency for Congress to act. That is 150 million Americans that CCP can collect sensitive information on and control what we ultimately see, hear, and believe. TikTok has repeatedly been caught in the lie that it does not answer to the CCP through ByteDance. Today, the CCP's laws require Chinese companies like ByteDance to spy on their behalf. That means any Chinese company must grant the CCP access and manipulation capabilities as a design feature. Right now, ByteDance is under investigation by the DOJ for surveilling American journalists, both digital activity and physical movements through TikTok. 
We also know that many of your employees still report directly to Beijing. Internal recordings reveal there is a backdoor for China to access user data across the platform. Your employees said, quote, everything is seen in China. A gateway to spy is not the only way TikTok and ByteDance can do the bidding of the CCP. TikTok has helped erase events and people China wants the world to forget. It's even censored an American teenager who exposed CCP's genocide and torture of Uyghur Muslims. The facts show that ByteDance is beholden to the CCP. And ByteDance and TikTok are one and the same. TikTok also targets our children. The For You algorithm is a tool for TikTok to own their attention and prey on their innocence. Within minutes of creating an account, your algorithm can promote suicide, self-harm, and eating disorders to children. It encourages challenges for them to put their lives in danger and allows adults to prey on our beautiful, beloved daughters. It's also a portal for drug dealers to sell illicit fentanyl that China has banned, yet is helping Mexican cartels produce, send across our border, and poison our children. In China, the CCP proactively prohibits this type of TikTok content that promotes death and despair to kids. From the data it collects to the content it controls, TikTok is a grave threat of foreign influence in American life. It's been said it's like allowing the Soviet Union the power to produce Saturday morning cartoons during the Cold War, but much more powerful and much more dangerous. Banning your platform will address the immediate threats. Make no mistake, this committee is also looking to the future. America needs to be prepared to stop the next technological tool or weapon China will use for its own strategic gain. We must prevent any app, website, and platform like TikTok from ever spying on Americans again. And we must provide the strongest protections possible for our children. That is why this committee is leading on a national privacy and data security standard. It restricts sensitive American data from reaching our adversaries to begin with. And what big tech and data brokers collect, process, store, and sell. It makes it illegal for any platform to track and target children under 17. Mr. Chu, the committee has requested that TikTok appear before us for a long time. For those we serve, we're glad the day has finally come. Today, the world is watching. ByteDance is watching. The Chinese Communist Party is watching. But the answers you owe are to the American people, a free people who cherish their God-given unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all. They deserve the truth. Complete honesty is the standard and the law you are being held to before this committee as we seek to get answers and a full understanding of what happens at TikTok under your watch. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And let me um, say that I agree with much of what you just said, and I certainly appreciate your enthusiasm and your commenting on being a mother and concerned about children. Uh, and I am glad that we are having this hearing today. Um, big tech has transformed the information superhighway into a super spreader of harmful content, invasive surveillance practices, and addictive and damaging design features. Data is big tech's most valuable commodity. And by collecting far more user data than they need, big tech platforms can use, share, and sell information to generate billions of dollars in revenue. Today, the American people are powerless to stop this invasion of their privacy, and we can't wait any longer to pass comprehensive national privacy legislation that puts people back in control of their data. We must hold big tech accountable for its actions, and transparency is critical to that accountability. In the past several Congresses, this committee has heard from senior executives of other social media platforms about troubling and repeated instances where they put profits over people. Now, today we intend to bring more transparency to TikTok, which is controlled by its Beijing communist-based parent company, ByteDance, 
And while TikTok videos provide a new fun way for people to express their creativity and enjoy the videos of others, the platform also threatens the health, privacy, and security of the American people. And I'm not convinced that the benefits outweigh the risks that it poses to Americans in its present form. More than 130 million people in the United States use TikTok every month, including two-thirds of American teenagers. TikTok collects and compiles vast troves of valuable personal information to create an addictive algorithm that is able to predict with uncanny accuracy which videos will keep users scrolling, even if the content is harmful, inaccurate, or feeds destructive behavior or extremist beliefs. Now, the combination of TikTok's Beijing communist-based China ownership and its popularity exacerbates its danger to our country and to our privacy. The Chinese Communist government can compel companies based in Beijing, like TikTok, to share data with the Communist government through existing Beijing law or coercion. National security experts are sounding the alarm, warning that the Chinese uh, Communist government could require TikTok to compromise device security, maliciously access American user data, promote pro-communist propaganda, and undermine American interests. Disinformation campaigns could be launched by the, by the Chinese Communist government through TikTok, which has already become rife with misinformation and disinformation, illegal activities, and hate speech. A recent report found that 20% of TikTok search results on prominent news topics contain misinformation. Social media's profitability depends on growth and engagement. More eyes on their content for longer time leads to more advertising dollars and revenue generation. Addictive algorithms are fine-tuned to optimize growth and engagement without necessarily taking into account potential harms to users. Children and teens are particularly vulnerable. Frequent online use of interactive media on digital devices is associated with increased levels of depression among middle and high school students. Research has found that TikTok's addictive algorithms recommend videos to teens that create and exacerbate feelings of emotional distress, including videos promoting suicide, self-harm, and eating disorders. Public outrage and hollow apologies alone are not going to rein in big tech. Congress has to enact laws protecting the American public from such online harms. And we simply cannot wait any longer to pass the comprehensive privacy legislation that I authored with then ranking member, now Chair Rogers, last Congress, that overwhelmingly advanced out of the committee. It ensures that companies, wherever they live, it ensures, I should say, that consumers, wherever they live in this country, will have meaningful control over their personal information. Our legislation establishes baseline data minimization requirements, ensuring that companies only collect, process, and transfer data necessary to provide a service and it provides heightened privacy protections for children and teenagers. So I think it's time to make this legislation the law of the land. And we also have to examine the reforms needed to Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. The liability shield for social media platforms has for too long been abused and led to a lack of accountability for social media platforms. So I hope we can find a bipartisan path forward on that issue too and I think you're having a hearing next week on it, so we can stop the very real harms to our country and democracy under the current law. I'd, I'd look forward to the discussion today as we continue to bring accountability to big tech. And let me say to Mr. Chu, I know this is about TikTok, but I am focusing all my attention, not only on TikTok, but on these concerns, wide concerns about social media and uh, the protection of privacy. And with that, I yield back. Thank you again. Uh, Madam Chair, for having this very important hearing. Our witness, to, our witness today is Mr. Sho Chu, Chief Executive Off Officer of TikTok. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Chair Rogers, Ranking Member Pallone, members of the committee, thank you for your time. I am Sho Chu, and I'm from Singapore. That's where I was born, as were my parents. And after serving in Singapore's military, I moved to the UK to attend college, and then here to the US to attend business school. I actually met my wife here. By the way, she was just born a few miles away from here in Virginia. Two years ago, I became the CEO of TikTok. Today, we have more than a billion monthly active users around the world, including over 150 million in the United States. Our app is a place where people can be creative and curious and where close to 5 million American businesses, mostly small businesses, go to find new customers 
and to fuel their growth. Now, as TikTok has grown, we've tried to learn the lessons of companies that have come before us, especially when it comes to the safety of teenagers. While the vast majority of people on TikTok are over 18, one of, and one of our fastest growing demographics are people over 35. We spent a lot of time adopting measures to protect teenagers. Many of those measures are firsts for the social media industry. We, for, we forbid direct messaging for people under 16, and we have a 16-minute watch time by default for those under 18. We have a suite of family pairing tools so that parents can participate in their teen's experience and make the choices that are right for their family. We want TikTok to be a place where teenagers can come to learn, which is why we recently launched a feed that exclusively features educational videos about STEM. STEM videos already have over 116 billion views on TikTok. And I think TikTok is inspiring a new generation to discover a passion for math and science. Now, I would also like to talk about national security concerns that you have raised that we take very, very seriously. Let me start by addressing a few misconceptions about ByteDance, of which we are a subsidiary. ByteDance is not owned or controlled by the Chinese government. It's a private company. 60% of the company is owned by global institutional investors. 20% is owned by the founder, and 20% owned by employees around the world. ByteDance has five board members. Three of them are American. Now, TikTok itself is not available in mainland China. We're headquartered in Los Angeles and in Singapore, and we have 7,000 employees in the US today. Still, we have heard important concerns about the potential for unwanted foreign access to US data and potential manipulation of the TikTok US ecosystem. Our approach has never been to dismiss or trivialize any of these concerns. We have addressed them with real action. Now, that's what we've been doing for the last two years, building what amounts to a firewall that seals off protected US user data from unauthorized foreign access. The bottom line is this. American data stored on American soil by an American company overseen by American personnel. We call this initiative Project Texas. That's where Oracle is headquartered. Today, US TikTok data is stored by default in Oracle servers. Only vetted personnel operating in a new company called TikTok US Data Security can control access to this data. Now, additionally, we have plans for this company to report to an independent American board with strong security credentials. Now, there's still some work to do. We have legacy US data sitting in our servers in Virginia and in Singapore. We're deleting those, and we expect that to be complete this year. When that is done, all protected US data will be under the protection of US law and under the control of the US-led security team. This eliminates the concern that some of you have shared with me that TikTok user data can be subject to Chinese law. This goes further, by the way, than what any other company in our industry have done. We will also provide unprecedented transparency and security for the source code for the TikTok app and recommendation engine. Third-party validators like Oracle and others will review and validate our source code and algorithms. This will help ensure the integrity of the code that powers what Americans see on our app. We will further provide access to researchers, which helps them study and monitor our content ecosystem. Now, we believe we are the only, the only company that offers this level of transparency. Now, trust is about actions we take. We have to earn that trust with decisions we make for our company and our products. The potential security, privacy, content manipulation concerns raised about TikTok are really not unique to us. The same issues apply to other companies. We believe what's needed are clear, transparent rules that apply broadly to all tech companies. Ownership is not at the core of addressing these concerns. Now, as I conclude, there are more than 150 million Americans who love our platform, and we know we have a responsibility to protect them which is why I'm, I'm making the following commitments to you and to all our users. Number one, we will keep safety, particularly for teenagers, as a top priority for us. Number two, we will firewall protected US data from unwanted foreign access. 
Number three, TikTok will remain a place for free expression and will not be manipulated by any government. And fourth, we will be transparent and we will give access to third-party independent monitors to remain accountable for our commitments. I'll be grateful for any feedback that you have and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. As you know, the testimony that you're about to give is subject to Title 18, Section 1001 of the United States Code. As you state in your testimony, ByteDance is TikTok's parent company. Is it accurate to say that you are in regular communication with the CEO of ByteDance, Leon Robo? Chair Rogers, yes, uh, I am in Thank you. communication with him. Okay. Kelly Zhang is the CEO of ByteDance China, overseeing Doyen, the Chinese version of TikTok. Are you in regular communication with Kelly? I'm not in regular communication with her. The ByteDance editor-in-chief is Zhang Fu, Fu Ping, correct? I believe so. And Wu Xu Gang is Beijing ByteDance technology board member and also an official of the Cyberspace Administration in China. Is this correct? Uh, I believe so. I, they are not in the right... Thank you. All of these individuals work or affiliated with the Chinese Communist Party are at the highest levels of leadership at ByteDance, a company where you previously served as the chief financial officer and where you regularly communicate with their CEO. TikTok has told us that you weren't sharing data with the CCP, but leaked audio from within TikTok has proven otherwise. TikTok told us that you weren't tracking the geolocation of American citizens. You were. TikTok told us you weren't spying on journalists. You were. In your testimony, you state that ByteDance is not beholden to the CCP. Again, each of the individuals I listed are affiliated with the Chinese Communist Party, including Zhang Fuping, who is reported to be the, the Communist Party Secretary of ByteDance, and who has called for the party committee to, quote, take the lead across all party lines to ensure the algorithm is enforced by, quote, correct political direction. Just this morning, the Wall Street Journal reported that the CCP is opposed to a forced sale of TikTok by ByteDance, quoting a CCP spokesman as saying the Chinese government would make a decision regarding any sale of TikTok. So the CCP believes they have the final say over your company. I have zero confidence in your assertion that ByteDance and TikTok are not beholden to the CCP. Next question. Heating content is a way of promoting and moderating content. In your current or previous positions within Chinese companies, have employees engaged in heating content for users outside of China? Very quickly, yes or no. Our heating process is uh, approved by our local teams so in the various the, countries. The answer is yes, thank you. Have any moderation tools been used to remove content on TikTok associated with the Uyghur genocide? Yes or no? We do not remove uh, that kind of content. TikTok is a place for freedom of expression. And Chero, just like I said, if you use our app, you can Thank go you. on it and you will see a lot of users around the world Thank expressing you. content in, on that topic and many others. Thank you. What about the massacre in Tiananmen Square, yes or no? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Uh, the massacre in Tiananmen Square. That kind of content is available on our platform. You can go and search it. I will remind you that making false or misleading statements to Congress is a federal crime. I understand. Uh, again, okay. if you go on our thank platform, you, you will find question. that content. Okay, thank you. Reclaiming my time, can you say with 100% certainty that ByteDance or the CCP cannot use your company or its divisions to heat content to promote pro-CCP messages for an act of aggression against Taiwan? We do not promote or remove content at the request yeah, of the, the question, Chinese government. The question, and is, we will replain the question is, are you 100% certain that they cannot use your company to promote such messages. It is our commitment to this committee and all our users that we will keep this free from any manipulation by any okay. government. If you can't say 100% certain, I take that as a no. As I previously referenced, TikTok spied on American journalists. Can you say with 100% certainty that neither ByteDance nor TikTok employees can target other Americans with similar surveillance techniques? Chair Rogers, I first of all disagree with the characterization that is spying. Um, it was an internal investigation. Yes on or no, can you do surveillance? of other Americans? We, we will protect the U.S. user data and fire it all from all unwanted foreign access. It's a commitment that we've given to the committee. So, so I guess my question is, are, can, I want you to, I wanted to hear you say 
with 100% certainty that neither ByteNest nor TikTok employees can target other Americans with similar surveillance techniques as you did with the journalists. Again, I, I don't disagree with the characterization, characterization is surveillance, and we have given our commitments, Chair Rogers. The four commitments, I think it's our commitment that we will not be influenced by any government on these issues. DO, DOJ is investigating this, this surveillance right now. To the American people watching today, hear this, TikTok is a weapon by the Chinese Communist Party to spy on you, manipulate what you see, and exploit for future generations. A ban is only a short, term way to address TikTok, and a data privacy bill is the only way to stop TikTok from ever happening again in the United States. I yield back. I now yield to the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let, let me just start out by saying, Mr. Chu, that I don't find uh, what you suggested with Project Texas and this firewall uh, that's being suggested um, to whoever. Uh, will be will be acceptable to, to me. In other words, um, you know, the, I still believe that the Beijing Communist government will still control and have the ability to influence what you do. And so, this idea, this Project Texas, is, is simply not acceptable. According to a recent report, TikTok is on target to make between 15 and 18 billion dollars in revenue this year. Is that an accurate forecast? Congressman, um, as a private company, we are not sharing our I thought numbers that's what you publicly. Would say. How much money will TikTok make by delivering personalized advertisements just to your users in the United States? Will you give me that information? Again, uh, Congressman, respectfully, thought, as a private company, we're not disclosing that. Look, um, my cons the impression you're giving, and I, I know, you know, I can understand why you're trying to give that impression, is that. Um, you know, that you're just performing some kind of public service here, right? I mean, this is a benign company that's just performing a public service. I, maybe you're not, maybe that's not what you're saying, but it, I don't buy it, right? My, my concern here is primarily about the privacy issue, the fact that TikTok is um, making all kinds of money by collect, gathering uh, private information about Americans that, um, they don't need for their business purposes, and then they sell it. And I mentioned this legislation that the ranking, that the uh, chair and I have, uh, that would minimize data collection and make it much more difficult for TikTok and other companies to do that. So, uh, what, what, if you, you want to make some commitments today, why don't I, I'll ask you to make some commitments with regard to this legislation? And you know, you're going to tell me, well, the bill isn't passed, and so therefore I don't have to do it, but. You know, you say you're benign, you want to do good things for the public, so let me ask you, uh, why not, uh, what about a commitment that says that uh, you won't sell the data that you collect? Would you commit to that, not selling the data you collect? Uh, Congressman, I believe we don't sell data at, uh, to any data brokers. You don't sell to anyone? We don't sell data to data brokers. I didn't ask you data brokers, you sell it to anyone. In other words, I, uh, under our bill, you can only use the data for your own purposes, not to sell it to anyone. Would you commit to not selling your data to anyone? Uh, Congressman, uh, I actually am in support of some rules. I didn't ask you whether the rules, yeah. I asked you whether the company, TikTok, would commit to not selling its data to anyone and just using it for its own purposes internally. I can get back to you on the details okay, of that. Okay, get back to me, all right. Another thing that's in our bill says that uh, we would prohibit targeting marketing to uh, to people under the age of 17. Would you be willing to agree to prohibit targeted marketing to people, Americans under the age of 17? Congressman, we have actually stricter rules for advertisers in terms of what they can show to our so users do you under prohibit the age of 18. Would you be willing to prohibit targeted marketing to those under 17? That's what's in our bill. I understand that there's uh, some talk and some legislation around this, around the country. Well, again, I'm not interested, I wanted you to make that commitment without the legislation. Since you say you're a good company, you want to do good things, why not? It's something we can, we can look into and get back okay, to Okay, I appreciate that. Okay, we also have in our bill a requirement of heightened protection for sensitive data, uh, particularly location and health data. Would you commit uh, to not uh, gathering or dealing with location or health data unless you get affirmative consent uh, from the uh, consumer. In other words, under our bill, 
those are categorized as sensitive, and unless the person specifically says, I want you to collect that data, you wouldn't be able to, location and health data. Would you commit to that? Congressman, in principle, I support that. Which, by the way, we do not collect um, precise G GPS data at this point. Okay. And I do not believe we collect any health data. All right, so yeah. would you be willing to make that commitment that from now on you won't collect location health data without what you're saying at all? Is that Congressman, a commitment? We, this is data that's frequently collected by many other companies in our industry. I know other companies do it. I don't think they should without affirmative consent. You said you want to be a good actor. So why not make that commitment to me today? We, we're committed to be very transparent with our users about what we collect. I don't think what we collect, I don't believe what we collect is more than most you see, players in the see, my problem here is you're trying to give the impression that you're going to move away from Beijing and the Communist Party. You're trying to give the impression that you're a good actor. But the commitments that we would seek uh, to achieve those goals are not being made today. They're just not being made. You're going to continue to gather data. You're going to continue to sell data. You're going to continue to do all these things. Uh, and continue to be under the aegis of, of the Communist Party through, the, through your uh, you know, uh, organization that owns you. So in any case, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess, for five minutes. I thank the chair. Thank you, Mr. Chu, for, for joining us today. Uh, I think we've heard you say multiple times that TikTok is not a Chinese company, that ByteDance is not a Chinese company. But according to an article in today's Wall Street Journal, quoting here, China's Commerce Ministry said Thursday that a sale or divestiture of TikTok will involve exporting technology that has to be approved by the Chinese government. Continuing to quote, the reported efforts by the Biden administration would severely undermine global investors' confidence in the U.S., said Xu Tuting, a ministry spokeswoman. Continuing to quote, if that is true, China will firmly oppose it, she said, referring to the forced sale. So despite your assertions to the contrary, China certainly thinks it is in control of TikTok and its software. Is that not correct? Congressman, uh, TikTok is not available in mainland China. And today we are headquartered in Los Angeles and Singapore. But I'm not saying that you know, the founders of ByteDance are not Chinese, nor am I saying that we don't make use of Chinese employees uh, just like many other companies around the world. We, we do you know, use their expertise on some engineering projects. But according now, to their ministry spokeswoman, it would be a divestiture of exporting technology from China. So they, again, China thinks they own it, even though you do not. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd just like to ask unanimous consent to put today's Wall Street Journal Without objection, so ordered. Into the record. Um, and Mr. Chu, I, I wouldn't ask you to discuss any privileged attorney-client materials, but uh, did anyone aside from your lawyers assist you in preparation for today's hearing? I prepared for this hearing with my team here in D.C. Did anyone at ByteDance directly provide input, help, or instruction for your testimony today? Congressman, this is a very high-profile hearing. My phone is full of well wishes. It, that's, you know, but I prepared for this hearing with my team here in DC. Are you, are, are you willing to share uh, who, who helped prepare you for this hearing with the committee? And you can do I that can follow up with you okay. if you like. Can you guarantee that no one at ByteDance had a role in preparing you for today's hearing? Like I said, Congressman, this is a high profile hearing. A lot of people around the world were sending me wishes and unsolicited advice, but I prepared for this hearing with my team here in DC. Are the attorneys representing TikTok also representing ByteDance? Yes, I believe so. What percentage of TikTok revenue does ByteDance retain? Just give me a ballpark estimate if you don't precisely know. Uh, Congressman, like, like I said, uh, as a private company, we are not prepared to disclose our financials in public today. But can we ask you to get back to us with a, a ballpark? We're not asking for the precise figures, but to get so the committee can have some understanding of the percentage of TikTok revenue that ByteDance retains. I understand the question. Uh, respectfully, I, as a um, private company, we are not disclosing our financials today. Prior to today's hearing, did anyone affiliated with the Chinese Communist Party discuss this hearing with you or anyone else on TikTok senior management? 
Uh, Congressman, since I've been CEO of this company, I've not had any discussions with Chinese government officials. So what, but, but what about the Chinese Communist Party itself? Have any of those officials discussed this with you? Uh, like I said, I have not had any discussion with Chinese government officials. I don't know the political affiliation of everybody I speak to, so I can't verify the statement. Let me ask you a question in a different direction. Uh, a few weeks ago, this committee had a field hearing down in McAllen, Texas, and it was on the issue of uh, fentanyl and, and illegal immigration. And one of our witnesses, uh, Brandon Judd, a 25-year veteran Border Patrol agent, said that all social media platforms play a role in illegal immigration. That's one of the ways cartels advertise their services throughout the world and convince people to put themselves in their hands and come to the United States. The cartels all use social media platforms. Are you aware of this phenomenon? Uh, any content that, um, that promotes human abuse is a violative of our community guidelines, which dictates what is allowed and not allowed on our platform. We proactively identify and remove them from our platform. Well, it would be very helpful if you would share with the committee examples of how you have removed people, because what we heard at the hearing was that TikTok was one of the platforms that recruits adolescents in the United States to help with transporting people who are in the country, who've, who've have been trafficked into the country, as well as contraband substances. Would you help us with that, understanding who you have removed from your platform? Uh, Congressman, I'll be delighted to check with my team and get back to yours okay. and be collaborative. Thank you. I'll yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Chairs recognizes the lady from California, Ms. Eshu, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Mr. Chu, thank you for being here today. Um, as members of Congress, our very first and top responsibility is to protect and defend. Protect and defend our Constitution and the national security of our country. So uh, I view this entire issue, uh, now there are many parts of it that are not part of our national security in my view, uh, but first and foremost for our national security. So uh, in examining uh, TikTok breaking away from ByteDance, uh, I'd like to ask you some questions about that and how um, uh, a, um, uh, a, a severance uh, in terms of the uh, uh, relationship with ByteDance, how um, user data, American user data, would be protected. Now, under Beijing's um, security laws, uh, Article 7 uh, compels companies to provide data. Uh, Article 10 uh, makes the reach of the law uh, extra, uh, uh, extraterritorial. Now, this is very clear. I don't need to read all of it uh, into the record, uh, but that, those are the laws of, uh, of the PRC. How does uh, ByteDance, how does TikTok, rather, how do you convince uh, the Congress of the United States that there can be a clean break? Uh, why would the Chinese government sidestep uh, their uh, national law, including Article 7, Article 10, um, uh, in terms of user data. Congressman, th thank you for the question. I'm glad you asked this. As I said in the opening statement, our plan is to move American data to be stored on American soil I by the American that. company. I understand that, but, uh, uh, but you're sidestepping, or I haven't read anything uh, in terms of uh, TikTok, how you can actually say, and you spoke in your opening statement about a firewall relative to the data. But the Chinese government has that data. What, how, how can you promise that, uh, that that will move into 
uh, into the United States of America and be protected here. Uh, Congressman, I have seen no evidence that the Chinese government has access to that data. They have never asked us. We have not provided. Well, you know what? I have I asked that, that I find that actually preposterous. I have uh, looked in, I have seen no evidence of this happening. Mm. And in order to assure everybody here and all our users, our commitment is to move the data in, into the United States to be stored on American soil by an American company, overseen by American personnel. So the risk will be similar to any government going to an American company asking for data. If that... Well, I, I'm one that um, uh, doesn't believe that there is really a private sector in China. Uh, and when you look at their national law and what specifically these two articles, Article 7 and Article 10, are very clear. So I, I, I think that there is a real problem, a real problem relative to our national security about uh, uh, the uh, uh, protection of uh, the user data. I don't believe that TikTok has, uh, that you have said or done anything to convince us that uh, that, that um, information, the personal information of 150 million Americans, uh, that the Chinese government is not going to give that up. So, uh, can, you tell me, can you tell me? Can you tell me who writes the uh, algorithms for TikTok? Today, the algorithm that powers the U.S. user experience um, is running in the Oracle Cloud infrastructure. Um, yes, you know, in the, initially there were parts of the source code, especially in the infrastructure layer, that doesn't touch um, the user experience. Now, that's a collaborative global effort, including built by engineers in China, just like many other companies, by the way. The phone you use, the car you drive, is a, is a global collaborative effort. Now, but today, the business um, sites and the main parts of the code for TikTok is written by TikTok employees. And, uh, um, Congresswoman, what we are offering is third-party monitoring of our source code. I am not aware of any company, American companies or otherwise, that has actually done that. We're, because we are saying we want to give you transparency and rely on third parties to make sure that we get all the comfort that we need about the experience. Well, I, uh, my time is up and I yield back. Thank you. Lady yields back. Please to yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Unlike the Chinese Communist Party, the United States is, believes in individual freedom, innovation, and entrepreneurship. That is in part why Congress enacted Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Our goal is to promote growth of the e online ecosystem in the United States and to protect companies from being held liable for good faith efforts to moderate their platforms. Last year, a federal judge in Pennsylvania found that Section 230 protected TikTok from being held responsible for the death of a 10-year-old girl who participated in a blackout challenge, also known as the choking challenge. TikTok actively pushes video on her feed. Unfortunately, this is one of the many devastating examples of children losing their lives because of content promoted by TikTok. Section 230 was never intended to shield companies like yours from amplifying dangerous and life-threatening content to children. Do you consider this to be a good faith moderation? <clears throat> Congressman, as a father myself, when I hear about the tragic deaths of my young people, is, do you, it's do you heartbreaking. Do you find that good faith moderation? Well, Congressman, uh, Section 230 is a very complex okay, I'm, issue. I'm, you know, yes or no? I, we are very focused on safety, and okay, all these I'm, dangerous I'm, I'm challenges are that as move no. when we find them. Do you believe TikTok deserves this liability protection? I'm sorry, Congressman. Do you believe that TikTok deserves this li liability protection under Section 230? Congressman, as you pointed out, uh, uh, 230 has been very important for freedom of expression on the internet. It's one of the commitments we have given to this committee and our users, and I do, I do think it's important to preserve that. But companies should be raising the bar on safety. Let me, let me I, follow I really up. agree let with that. Let me just follow up real quickly from your own testimony. When you told us and you repeated it, We'll keep safety, particularly for teenagers, a top priority for us. When you're saying you're making that following commitment, why did you have to wait till now to make that following commitment now and not having done it before when this 10-year-old lost her life? Uh, Congressman, I'm, I'm reiterating the commitment. Okay. Internally, in all, my, in all my priorities, which is public to my employees, okay, this, this safety is the, has always uh, been a priority. Is, this company is a picture-perfect example of why this committee in Congress needs to take action immediately to amend Section 230. 
When we recently met, I asked you if the Chinese Communist Party can currently access user data, and you did not have a clear answer. So today I want to follow up. You heard it a little bit, but I want to be absolutely sure of this answer. Are employees of ByteDance subject to Chinese law, including the 2017 National Intelligence Law, which requires any organization or citizen to support, assist, and cooperate with state intelligence work in accordance with the law? Like many companies, including many American companies, we rely on the global workforce, including engineers in China. Okay, but so no, yes the, no. Uh, yes. So in the past, yes. I'm in sorry? the past, yes. Yes, but we are building Project Texas, and we're committing okay. the firewall of all I'm, protected I'm, I'm, data. I'm, I'm, taking, that a, I'm next. taking that as a yes, because uh, again, on your Article 7, the Article 7 of the 2017 National Intelligence Law, which I just said, because it says, in addition, as was asked a little bit earlier, the 2014 counter-espionage law states that when the state security organ investigates and understands the situation of espionage and collect relevant evidence, the relevant organizations and individuals, it does not say may, it says shall provide it truthfully and may not refuse. Yes or no? Do any ByteDance employees in China, including engineers, currently have access to user, U.S. user data? Today, all um, U.S. user data is stored by default in the Oracle Cloud question, infrastructure, and access to that is controlled is, do any by American ByteDance personnel. ByteDance employees in China, including engineers, currently have access to U.S. data? Uh, Congressman, uh, I would appreciate this. This is a complex uh, topic. Today, all data yes, is stored yes by no. default. No, it's not that complex. Yes or no, do they have access to user data? We have, after Project Texas is done, the answer is no. Today, there's yeah, still some so data saying, that we need yes, to delete. Yes, but, but we've heard already from the scene. ranking member that he, hasn't, and, uh, that he doesn't really see that uh, Project Texas is going to be useful. So I think I'm taking that as a no because, again, the question is what came to come up earlier are that on December the 22nd of last year, when ByteDance confirmed some of its Chinese employees had access TikTok data to monitor and track, monitor and track the physical location of journals. So I, I took that as a yes from an earlier answer. You know, earlier this week, you posted a TikTok video asking American users to mobilize in support of your app and oppose the potential U.S. government action to ban TikTok in the United States. Based on the established relationship between your company and the Chinese Communist Party, it's impossible for me to conclude that the video is anything different than the type of propaganda the CCP requires Chinese companies to push on its citizens. Now you'll back. Chairman yields back. Chair recognizes the lady from Colorado, Ms. DeGette, for five minutes. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Mr. Chu, um, like my colleagues, I'm concerned about the influence of China on TikTok and what that does for U.S. users. But I'm also concerned about how the content in TikTok is being distributed, particularly to young people. This is not a problem unique to TikTok, but TikTok has 150 million users in the United States. And so I think you'll agree that TikTok has a particular responsibility to monitor content to make sure that it's safe and accurate. Would that be fair to say? Yes, I agree with that. So, um, you know, I know you said in your opening statement there's a ban on, for or limited for kids under 13 and under 18 and so on. But I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I know it won't be news for you that, that uh, computer savvy kids actually can bypass some of those restrictions quite frequently, and they can do it even if they have parental oversight. And so what I want to ask you is, is, rather than putting the burden on young people and parents to accurately put in the birth date and so on when registering for TikTok, I want to ask you what TikTok can do to make sure to monitor this, this content. And I want to give you some examples of some of the extreme content. Mr. Latta talked about the uh, blackout challenge and the some of the dangers to young people's safety, but there's also extreme content around healthcare information. Um, in one study, 13 out of 20 results um, for the question, does mugwort induce abortion? It's, it, it talked about herbal so-called abortifacients like papaya seeds, which don't work. 
And so if people searching for information on safe abortions went on TikTok, they could get devastatingly incorrect information. Another, um, an, another study showed that TikTok was, uh, had a, a hydro hydroxychloroquine tutorial on how to fabricate this from grapefruit. Now, there's two problems with that. Number one, hydroxychloroquine is not effective in treating COVID, so that's one issue. The second issue is you can't even make hydroxychloroquine from grapefruit. So again, this is a really serious miscommunication about healthcare information that people looking at, at, um, at TikTok are able to get, and in fact, it's being pushed out to them. So I want to know from you, and I will give you time to answer this. You have current, current controls, but the current controls are not working to keep this information mainly from young people, but from Americans in general. What more is, is TikTok doing to try to strengthen its review to keep this information from coming across to people? Th thank you for the question, um, Congresswoman. The dangerous misinformation that you mentioned is not allowed on our platform. It violates them. I'm sorry to report it is on your platform, no. Uh, uh, Congresswoman, I, I don't think I can sit here and say that we are perfect in doing this. We do work very hard. So how can you make yourself more perfect? I don't want you to say it's not there or you apologize. What can you do to limit it as much as possible, more than what you're doing now? We invest... Uh, significant amount in our content moderation work. I shared that number in, our, uh, in my written that I know you're investing, yes. but, but what steps are you taking to improve the AI or whatever else you're doing to limit this content? For example, if you search for certain search terms, we do direct you on TikTok to resource, safety resources. That's one of the things we have done. We will continue to invest in this. I recognize and, and fully align with you that this is a problem that faces our industry that we need to really invest and address. This, I'm very in, in alignment. The vast majority of our users come to our platform for entertaining, safe content. But there are people who do have some, who do spout some dangerous misinformation and we need to take that very seriously, invest in it, proactively identify it and, and remove it from our platform. Okay, I'm gonna stop you right now. I asked you specifically how you were increasing, how you're trying to increase your review of this, and you gave me only generalized statements that you're investing, that you're concerned, that you're doing more. That's not enough for me. That's not enough for the parents of America. I'm gonna ask you to supplement your testimony and have your, um, have your experts tell me what you're doing to make this a higher level of scrutiny, not just pablum at a hearing. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Lady yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Hudson, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Morris Rogers, for holding this important hearing. I appreciate the witness, Mr. Shoji Chu, for uh, making yourself available here today. While many consider TikTok to be just another video sharing app, in reality, TikTok has been functioning as a massive surveillance program collecting vast swaths of personal data from more than a billion people worldwide. This includes data from the personal devices of federal employees, contractors, and most concerning U.S. military service members and their families at places like Fort Bragg in North Carolina. As Fort Bragg's congressman, I have serious concerns about the opportunities TikTok gives the Chinese Communist Party to access the non-public sensitive data of our men and women in uniform. This personal data and location information can be harvested and could be used for blackmail to conduct espionage and to possibly even reveal troop movements. While the Department of Defense and most agencies have banned TikTok on government-issued devices, I believe more needs to be done at the command level to urge troops and their dependents to erase the app from the personal devices and keep them off home Wi-Fi. Having an app banned on a device in one pocket but downloaded on your device in the other doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I believe Congress and DOD should address the continued use of TikTok on military installations as well as any use that depicts U.S. military operations. Mr. Chu, does TikTok access the home Wi-Fi network? Only if the user turns on the Wi-Fi. I'm sorry, I may not understand the So if I have a TikTok app on my phone and my phone is on my home Wi-Fi network, does TikTok access that network? It will have to, to access the network to get connections to the internet, if, if that's the question. Is it possible then that it could access other devices on that home Wi-Fi network? 
Congressman, that we do not do anything that is beyond any industry norms. Um, I believe the answer to your question is no. It could be technical. Let me get back to you. Okay, I'd appreciate it if you could answer yep. that. I'd like to change directions real quick. Um, do you receive personal employment, salary, compensation, or benefits from ByteDance? Yes, I do. What is your salary from ByteDance? Uh, Congressman, if you don't mind, I would prefer to keep my compensation private. Okay. Do you personally have any company shares or stock in ByteDance or Doyen? Um, Congressman, if you don't mind, I would like to keep my personal assets private. Is TikTok the company your only source of employment compensation? Um, where's your other source of income outside of TikTok? It's my only source of compensation. Do you have any financial debts or obligations to ByteDance, Doyen, or any other ByteDance affiliated entity? Personally? No, yes, I do not. Does your management team receive separate salary, compensation, or benefits from ByteDance? Uh, we receive um, salaries from the, the entities that we are employed in, uh, but Does we do share in a, um, the employee stock option plan that is available from, from the ByteDance uh, top company. So, you're, so your primary salary comes from TikTok, but you have other compensation that comes directly from ByteDance? You can characterize it as that, yes. Does your management team have company shares or stock in ByteDance or Doyen? Um, yes, uh, we, some of our employees are compensated in shares in ByteDance. Does TikTok share technological resources with Doyen? Are the two technology systems or IT systems interconnected in any way? There are, as with many companies, some shared resources on some services, but it doesn't include anything that involves US user data, Congressman, is in Project Texas, as we talked about, stored uh, by default in American well, soil by an American be, company. But currently, there is shared technology or interconnected IT systems. Congressman, with respect, I have to get back to you. This could be a very broad question. Like, for example, we could all be using Microsoft Windows. Yeah, if you could get back with details on that, I'd appreciate yes. it. Um, can Doyen personnel or employees access TikTok user data? Not uh, after Project Texas. This is not allowed. Are there employees who are employed by both Doyen and TikTok? I do not believe so. Okay, and so I don't believe so. Is that? A, I mean, if again, I'll, I'll allow you to come back in the written response if you could give me a definitive I, I, answer. I will go back and check to be very sure. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm also concerned about an issue that our chairwoman brought up um, about an apparent pattern of misinformation or misrepresentation from your company in regards to the amount and extent of data that you're collecting, as well as how much has been accessed from inside China. There are dozens of public reports that conclude individuals in the People's Republic of China have been accessing data on US users directly contradicting several public statements by TikTok employees. And I'm, I'm referencing Project Raven which was first reported on by Forbes last October. Um, their investigation revealed, I'm sorry, I'm about out of time. Do you want to respond to that? Yes, Congressman. Um, we do not condone the effort by certain former employees to access US uh, TikTok user data in an attempt to identify the source of leaked confidential information. We condemn these actions. After learning about them, we found a highly reputable law firm to thoroughly investigate the, the incident. We took swift disciplinary action against employees who were found to be involved and are implementing measures to make sure this doesn't happen again. We have made this team um, available to you. They, I think they have briefed many of you in this committee very extensively, and I will continue to make them very available to you as part of our transparent commitment. Thank you, my time's expired, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the lady from Illinois, Ms. Cherkowski, for five minutes. Thank you. Um, so today um, in the Wall Street Journal, um, they said uh, today uh, China, uh, um, uh, China's uh, commerce minister um, said that uh, China opposes the sale of TikTok because it would involve um, export, exporting China's technology and would, uh, and this is the important part, and would need to be approved by the Chinese government. Would need to be approved by the Chinese government. 
So um, all of what you've been saying about the distance between TikTok and China um, has been said to be not true um, in, the, uh, in, in the paper today. And I, I would like to see what you have to say in response. Congresswoman, I uh, do disagree with that characterization. I think we have designed Project Texas to protect US user interests and to move forward here in the US. Again, it's the protections of storing American data on American soil by an American company looked after by American personnel. And I do not think that uh, you know, uh, our commitments to this committee and all our users is impacted by, by any event that uh, you mentioned. Now, um, the, the whole you know, discussion on this, um, the resolution of this is, is an ongoing and developing event. So we will continue to pay attention to this and we'll get back to you when we have more specifics. So but my commitment a, stand. Yeah. Okay, so if it's an ongoing um, debate, apparently with, with, with China, so it's hard to say um, with any certainty that China would not have any influence. But let me ask another question. Um, so um, last fall, uh, along with Gus Bilirakis, who were chair and co-chair of, uh, of the subcommittee together, um, uh, were, were, were told that um, TikTok had surveilled, uh, w was involved in, in surveillance of uh, users, very personal information. Um, and you might say, well, not more than other companies, and I agree with, uh, um, Ranking Member Pallone, that I, I really don't want to go by that standard particularly, but that TikTok's in-app browser surveilled everything um, from Americans, including passwords and um, credit card numbers, et cetera. So I just want to ask you um, if, uh, if TikTok did track and collect this sensitive data, that Americans um, don't want to have disclosed. Congressman, th thank you. I'm glad you asked this question because like you pointed out, we actually do not believe we collect more data than any other social media company out there. A lot of these reports, and I, we can talk about which specific one, specific one you're talking about, a lot of them are not that accurate. Some of them we have contacted, the, we have actually gotten in touch with the authors to help them understand the data that we're collecting. A lot of it is speculation. You know, this is something they could do, they could do. But if you look at the subtext, this is something that so every I, company I, could I, do. I, I'm running out of time. Let, let me just say that if TikTok chose not to take this, sensitive, this uh, sensitive information that you don't need for a transaction and support our comprehensive privacy bill, that would be, that would be very helpful. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask, so um, really, this is, this is a, a yes or no, um, that uh, TikTok, uh, does TikTok share user inf uh, information from um, uh, companies, uh, from parent companies, um, from affiliated, or, um, uh, or send uh, user information to uh, overseas? In the past, yes, for interoperability, interoperability purposes. Now, after Project Texas, all protected U.S. data will be stored here uh, with the access controlled by a special team of US, U.S. personnel. Again, Congresswoman, this is something that, as far as I understand, no other company, including American companies, are willing to go. So maybe this is uh, something that we can ask the industry to provide, not just us. To protect in, in the US case of sharing information, I do want to quote from employees that you had um, that, and here's the quote, um, everything is seen in China, is really what they said. People who were in touch with the sensitive data um, were saying that. How do you respond to that? I, I disagree with that statement. Well, I know you disagree with that statement, but my point is, how does that happen that employees of the, uh, of the company um, are saying that, in fact, that's not true. I cannot speak to, I don't know who this person is, so I cannot speak to what the person have, has or has not said. What I can say is, you know, based on my position in this company and the responsibility that I have, that statement is just not true. Okay, unfortunately, and I, I'll, I'll close, uh, oh, I guess I'm over my time. We need to look into the facts of this, and so do you. And I yield back.
Gentlelady yields back. Chair recognizes the lady from Florida, Ms. Kamek, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Mr. Sho, are you aware of Chinese Communist Party leader Chairman Xi Jinping's comments in May 2021 during a Communist Politburo study session where he instructed colleagues to target different countries, different audiences with short form video? Are you aware of these comments? Yes or no? Congressman, I'm not aware of these comments. Okay. Well, and as was pointed out by Chairwoman Rogers, you have regular contact with Chinese Communist Party Secretary, Mr. Zhang Fuping, who is your boss at ByteDance, correct? No. No? No. He's neither my boss, nor do we have frequent contact. But you have regular contact with ByteDance? Uh, with uh, the CEO of ByteDance. Who is... Mr. Zhang Fuping is the editor-in-chief. He's not My colleague, leader. Representative Burgess, uh, a few minutes ago exposed that TikTok and ByteDance share legal teams. You confirmed this, correct? Our general counsel is yes. uh, an American yes no? uh, lawyer, yes. veteran of Microsoft. Also, my colleague, years. Representative Lada, confirmed that your parent company, ByteDance, currently can access user data. Yes? Let's, uh, we have to be yes. more specific. Um, yes. After you Project Texas, no. I'm not asking after Project Texas, I'm asking now. Yes. Some user data is public data, Congresswoman, which so means you everybody can, that. can search What's interesting for to me is that you have used the word transparency over a half a dozen times in your opening testimony and subsequently again in your answers to my colleagues. Yet the interesting thing to me is that ByteDance, your parent company, has gone out of their way to hide an airbrush corporate structure ties to the CCP, the company's founder, and their activities. You can look no further than the fact that ByteDance website has been scrubbed. In fact, we found web pages from the Beijing Internet Association, the industry association charged with Communist Party building uh, work of internet companies in Beijing. They have been archived, but since deleted. Makes you kind of wonder why. Yes or no, ByteDance is required to have a member of the Chinese government on its board with veto power. Is that correct? No, that is not correct. Uh, ByteDance owns some Chinese businesses, and you're talking about this very special subsidiary that is Mr. for Show, Chinese business licensing. Mr. Show, I'm going to have to move on. You've said repeatedly that there is no threat, that this is an inner, a platform for entertainment and for fun. I have to ask you then, if there is no threat to Americans, if there is no threat to our data, privacy, security, why did an internal memo from TikTok corporate headquarters explicitly coach senior management to, quote, downplay the parent company ByteDance. Why would they say downplay the China Association and downplay AI? This is from an internal memo from your company. Why, if you had nothing to hide, would you need to downplay the association with ByteDance in China? Congresswoman, I have not seen this you memo. You can't answer can that question. Mr. Sho, I'd like to direct your attention to the screen for a short video, if you don't mind. Mr. Show, that video was posted 41 days ago. As you can see, it is captioned me as F at the House Energy and Commerce Committee on March 23rd of this year. This video was posted before this hearing was publicly noticed. I think that's a very interesting point to raise. But more concerning is the fact that it names this chairwoman by name. Your own community guidelines state that you have a firm stance against enabling violence on or off TikTok. We do not allow people to use our platform to threaten or incite violence or to promote violent extremist organizations, individuals, or acts. When there is a threat to public safety or an account is used to promote or glorify off-platform violence, we ban the account. This video has been up for 41 days. It is a direct threat to the chairwoman of this committee, the people in this room, and yet it still remains on the platform. And you expect us to believe that you are capable of maintaining the data security, privacy, and security of 150 million Americans where you can't even protect the people in this room? I think that is a blatant display of how vulnerable people who use TikTok are. 
You couldn't take action after 41 days when a clear threat, a very violent threat to the chairwoman of this committee and the members of this committee was posted on your platform. You damn well know that you cannot protect the data and security of this committee or the 150 million users of your app because it is an extension of the CCP. And with that, I yield back. Can I respond, Chair? No, we're gonna move on. Gentlelady yields back. Chairman recognizes the lady from California, Ms. Matsui, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I'm really glad that we're having this very important hearing here today. And let me just say, make no mistake, the Chinese government represents a real and immediate threat. Look no further than even the vulnerable gear still in our telecom networks that needs to be ripped and replaced. But we can't lose sight of the important internet governance issues TikTok and other social media companies represent. I'm especially committed to demanding transparency from large platforms about the algorithms that shape our online interactions, especially for teenagers and young users. And that's why I introduced the Algorithmic Justice and Online Platform Transparency Act to bring greater visibility into this ecosystem. My bill would require, would prohibit algorithms that discriminate on the basis of race, age, gender, ability, and other protected characteristics. It also would establish a safety and effectiveness standard for algorithms while requiring new forms of oversight. Now, this bill would require online platforms to publish annual public reports detailing their content moderation practices, which I believe should be a baseline requirement to enable meaningful oversight and consumer choice. Mr. Chu, just yes or no, do you believe a requirement for annual content moderation practices for social media platforms would be beneficial? Yes or no? Yes. This transparency bill would also require online platforms to maintain detailed records describing their algorithmic process for review by the Federal Trade Commission in compliance with key privacy and data identification standards. Mr. Chu, does TikTok currently maintain records describing their algorithmic processes? Yes or no? Congressman, I will need to check and get back to you on what kind of uh, specific records you are talking okay. about. I wait for that. Over the past few years, alarming information brought to light by whistleblowers have shown that social media companies are intimately aware of the effect their products have on young women, political extremism, and more. Despite this, they withheld those studies or declined to investigate further. In either case, it shows a pattern evasive or negligent behavior that I find concerning and extreme. Mr. Chu, does TikTok conduct its own studies on the effect of its algorithms and content distribution models on mental health or safety? And if so, how and when are those findings made public and if not, do you believe they are necessary? Congresswoman, we rely on external third parties and fund their research to help us understand some of these issues. For example, we worked with the Digital Wellness Lab at the Boston Children's Hospital to understand the 60-minute time limit that we put for all our under-18 users. And we are supportive of legislation that provides more funding for research, like, for example, for the NIH. Okay. Yeah. Um, TikTok tailors its recommended content based on user activity to encourage people to spend more time on the app. While this practice is by no means unique to TikTok, given the prevalence of young users and the digestible nature of short form video, I'm concerned about the app's tendency to exacerbate existing mental health challenges. Mr. Chu, does TikTok have different policies for amplifying content that would be related to depression or dieting versus content like gardening and sports? If yes, describe these policy differences. If no, why not? Uh, Congresswoman, um, thank you for that. This is a great question. The, the answer is yes. We are trying out some um, policies together with experts to understand certain contents that are not inherently harmful, like extreme fitness, for example, but shouldn't be seen 
too much. And uh, this is, these are models that we're building, and we are trying to understand, you know, together with experts, how to best implement them across our platform, particularly for younger users okay, under so 18. Okay, yeah. so in cases where users have been engaging with potentially harmful content, I believe it's imperative that the app take steps to moderate that behavior rather than continuing to promote it. I mean, in a sense, I, I apologize. I, I, about that. I, I wasn't clear. Um, first, anything that is violative and harmful we remove. What I meant to say were things, content, content that is not inherently, inherently harmful. Like some of the extreme fitness videos are about people running 100 miles. It's not inherently harmful, but if we show them too much, the experts are telling us that we should disperse them more and make sure that they're not seen too regularly, so especially you're by younger users. So you're intentional about that then? It's something that you... We are working on it, moderate. yes. Yeah. You're working on it? Yes. Okay, I yield back. Jenny, gentle lady yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bill Rockus, for five, year, five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it very much. Thanks for holding this hearing. Mr. Chu, your algorithms have prioritized providing harmful content directly to children, like self-harm challenges and even suicide. Just three days ago, Italy opened an investigation into the TikTok over user safety concerns after the so-called French scar challenge went viral on your platform. I know you know about the blackout challenge, which others may know as the choking challenge that encourages children to bring them to the point of unconsciousness or in some cases, tragically, death. If that, uh, if that isn't enough, I want to share the story of Chase Nasca, a 16-year-old boy from New York who tragically ended his life a year ago by stepping in front of a train. I want to thank his parents. Again, they are here. I want to thank his parents for being here today and allowing us to show this. Mr. Chu, your company destroyed their lives. Your company destroyed their lives. I admire their courage to be here and share Chase's story in the hopes that it will prevent this from happening to other families. The content in Chase's For You page was not a window to discovery, as you boldly claimed in your testimony. It wasn't content from a creator that you invited to roam the hill today, or STEM education content that children in China see. Instead, his For You page was sadly a window to discover suicide. It is unacceptable, sir, that even after knowing all these dangers, you still claim TikTok is something grand to behold. I want you to see what Chase would see. And I think if you want, uh, again, would you share this content with your children, with your two children? Would you want them to see this? And again, I, I want to warn everyone watching that you may find this content disturbing, but we need to watch this, please. Larry Tip, you got to kill yourself. A word? <laughs> Like right now? And then I'm gonna put a shotgun in my mouth and blow the brains out of the back of my head. Cool. This is a cute story. My brother, who is addicted to painkillers, blew his head off on the State Street Bridge. Bam! Now hold on, it gets better. No letter. No goodbye. Nothing. Got a question. If I died, would you miss me? Mr. Chu, Mr. Chu, please. Your technology is literally leading to death. Mr. Chu, yes or no? Do you have full responsibility for your algorithms? used by TikTok to prioritize content to its users. Yes or no, please? Uh, Congressman, I would just like to, if respectfully, if you don't mind, I would just like to start by saying 
is devastating to hear about the news of yes, as a yes, father myself this is sir tragic. yes or no i'll repeat the question do you have full responsibility over the algorithms used by tiktok to prioritize content to its users yes or no please uh, congressman we we do take these issues very yeah, seriously yeah, yes or no and we do provide resources for anyone who types in anything that sir is yes or related. no I see you're not willing to answer the question or take any responsibility for your parents' companies, the technology, and the harms it creates. It's just very, very sad. Very sad. It's very sad. This I is why Congress needs to enact a comprehensive privacy and data security law to give Americans more control over their information and to protect our children. We must save our children from big tech companies like yours who continue to abuse and manipulate them for your own gain. And I'll, I'll yield back, uh, Madam Chair. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the, the lady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Colleagues, it is urgent that the Congress pass an, an online data privacy law that protects the personal privacy of Americans online, and particularly our kids. While this hearing shines a light on TikTok, uh, this hearing also should serve as a call to action for the Congress to act now to protect Americans from surveillance, tracking, personal data gathering, and addictive algorithmic operations that, that serve up harmful content and has a corrosive effect on our kids' mental and physical well-being. For many years, I've sounded the alarm in this committee of how big tech platforms like TikTok and Facebook and Instagram incessantly surveil, track, gather personal private information, and use it along with data brokers to target and influence our behavior. This is a much broader issue than TikTok in China. There are other malign actors across the world who gather data to use it as an element of social control uh, and influence peddling uh, and worse. And as I detailed in this committee last year when we passed the, on, our online privacy law, the harms to children are very serious and demand swift action. Big tech platforms profit immensely from keeping children addicted. They do not care about the privacy, safety, and health of our kids. Uh, they are the modern day tobacco and cigarette companies that uh, for so long resisted uh, and misled Congress. And it took the Congress, it took action by the Congress to, to actually protect our kids and to outlaw smoking by, by young people. In early 2020, based upon the growing body of evidence to harm uh, to kids online, I introduced the Kids Privacy Act and the Kids Act. And I want to thank all of the researchers, the young people, the parents, the Surgeon General of the United States who have explained the correlation between social media usage and body dissatisfaction, disordered eating habits, anxiety, depression, self-injury, suicide, ideation, and cyberbullying. Heck, Francis Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower, was right here and testified uh, to us that Facebook and Instagram conducted research on this topic. They knew and understood the harms, but they continued to elevate profits over the well-being of children. And TikTok does the same. Last Congress, when we passed the ADPPA, the committee incorporated many of these important child online privacy and safety provisions from my bills, but we can make the 118th Congress's version of this bill, of this new law, even more protective of children, and I look forward to working with the chair and the ranking member to make that happen. Mr. Chu, TikTok has incredible sway over children in the U.S., uh, but you don't have a very good track record. Uh, in, in 2019, TikTok was hit with the largest civil penalty uh, by the Federal Trade Commission in a children's privacy case. Uh, four years later, TikTok still has not taken sufficient action to fix the problems. 
Uh, I assume because child users are incredibly profitable to your bottom line. Uh, so answer me this. TikTok allows advertisers to specifically target advertising to children age six, 13 to 17, correct? Congresswoman, um, I do want to disagree yes with the no. statement that child yes. abuses are not allowed on yes. our platform. Yes or no. It's deplorable target, conduct and it's target, not allowed on our platform. target advertising to, to young people age 13 to 17. We do serve personalized okay, advertising at this point, and but the policies are very money, safe for how them. How much money does TikTok make of uh, selling ads targeted to minors? Uh, Congressman, can I clarify minors in what age? Uh, from just say age 13 to 17. Uh, for the teenager population, I want to clarify that we do have a 13 under 13 experience and zero advertising on that on that platform. Um, for and those, you, well, that's a whole other. Uh, between uh, 13 and 17, if you don't mind, I'll check into my team and get back to you on those answers. You know, TikTok could be designed to minimize the harm uh, to kids, but a decision was made uh, to aggressively addict kids in the name of profits. And it's our responsibility, members, to act swiftly to address this. This has gone on for too long. We've dilly-dallied too much. This committee, thankfully, we've taken responsibility and enacted, but we have an enormous responsibility to act swiftly and get this bill to the floor of the House uh, and passed into law as soon as possible. Thank you. I yield back my time. The gentlelady yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Chu, I'm, I'm an information technology professional, been doing it for the most of my life. You've been evasive in many of your answers. I'm going to talk to you in some language that maybe you'll better understand, ones and zeros, okay? Let's talk about the Citizen Lab report. This is something your team frequently mentions in hearings as a way to exonerate yourself. For example, in the limitations section, it reads, we could not examine every source code component and test in the apps in every circumstance which means our methods could not find every security issue, privacy violation, and censorship event. So it's an incomplete assessment. The report notes that TikTok's data collection using third-party trackers was in apparent conflict with the GDPR and that multiple themes were censored by TikTok. What is shocking to me is the shared source code between TikTok in the United States and the CCP-centered Doan. The Citizen Labs report says that many of the functions and classes were identical and that the differences in behavior between TikTok in the United States and Doan in China are slight changes in hard-coded values. Incredibly, specific censorship parameters from Doan are present in TikTok, but just turned off. The authors say that for unknown reasons, the parameter var variable the, uh, itself is preserved. So while Citizen Lab may have been afraid to say the obvious conclusion, Mr. Chu, I am not, TikTok's source code is riddled with backdoors and CCP censorship devices. Here's the truth. In a million lines of code, the smallest shift from a zero to a one on just one of thousands of versions of TikTok on the market will unlock explicit CCP censorship and access to American data. Mr. Chu, as CEO of TikTok, why have you not directed your engineers to change this source code? Uh, Congressman, th thank you for the question. I, have I you directed them to change the source code? Like what we are offering in yes my source no. commitment? Uh, have you directed them to change that source code? Uh, Congressman, um, if you give me a bit of time to just No, I, I don't. I, it's a yes or no question. Have you directed your engineers to change that source code? I, I'm not sure I understand Why it. are you allowing TikTok to continue to have the capacity for censorship, and yet you claim here that you don't? Let me it remind doesn't. you of something. Do you realize that making false and misleading statements to Congress is a federal crime? Yes, I do. Okay. So have you directed your engineers to change that source code? I am giving third-party access monitoring okay. by experts. And, and uh, Congressman, you, you are an expert on this. You could agree with me that no other company does What percentage of TikTok source this. code is the same as Doan? 
What percentage? I, I can get back to you on the specifics. Okay, because, I'd appreciate yeah. that. Where was the source code for TikTok developed? Was it developed in China or in the United States? It's a global collaborative effort. Like a and lot was of it code developed for a lot in, of companies. Was it developed in China? Some of it? Some of it is. Okay, at ByteDance. Can, can the, when it's compiled in the compilation process, can byte code be manipulated? We've talked a lot about source code. What about the byte code, the ones and zeros that actually execute on the device? That, can it give be you manipulated? Comfort, yes. uh, Congressman, to give you comfort, that's why we're giving third party monitors. Yes, As it, an expert, I think you can agree okay. that very few companies I've got the to report do this. here by uh, Citizen Lab. I want to read you uh, something from Ron Deber. Specifically, in your written testimony to Congress, you stated on page nine, Citizen Lab found that there was no overt data transmission by TikTok to the Chinese government and that TikTok did not contact any servers within China. You implied that Citizen Lab exonerated TikTok from any information sharing with China. Well, the director of Citizen Lab saw this and issued a statement correcting the record yesterday. And I'm quoting Ron Debert, the director of the lab. I am disappointed that TikTok executives continue citing the Citizen Lab's research in their statements to government as somehow exculpatory. I've called them out on this in the past, and it's unfortunate that I have to do it again, unquote. He goes on to say, and I quote, we even speculated about possible mechanisms through which the Chinese government might use unconventional techniques to obtain TikTok user data via pressure on ByteDance, end of quote. Mr. Chu, you sent Congress written testimony citing this lab as a support of your claim that China cannot access user data, U.S. user data. And now this lab has come out to say, we never said that. That's misleading, Mr. Chu. I hope you understand what that is. That's misleading. Mr. Chu, this is yet another instance of TikTok attempting to mislead Americans about what their technology is capable of and who has access to their information. Madam Chair, I'd like to- Madam Chair, I would like to respond to that very Ron quickly, Ron and the uh, uh, Citizens Lab into the record. Without objections- With so that, ordered. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair, Chair yields to the gentleman from Maryland. Mr. Sarbanes, five minutes. Uh, thanks very much, Madam Chair. Mr. Chu, I'm gonna pick up on a theme we've already covered here, which is the effect that your platform, along with many other social media platforms, by the way, has in terms of uh, mental and behavioral health in this country. I won't speak to what's happening elsewhere in the world, but we've talked about the impact that it's having on children, on teens. We took some action last year in this committee to try to improve access to resources, reauthorize critical programs to address uh, mental health needs, but we need to do even more than that. Um, and we got to address what the big tech companies like uh, TikTok are doing because those are platforms that expose children, teens to, to additional uh, risks. The more time that middle and high schoolers spend on social media, the evidence is the more likely they are to experience depression and anxiety. And this is particularly troubling since apparently 16% of American teenagers report that they use TikTok, quote, almost constantly. That's I think about five million teenagers in this country that are on TikTok um, all the time. And we know that big tech, including TikTok, uses design features that can manipulate users, including children's and teens, to keep them engaged, designed to feed them a never-ending stream of content, keep their attention for hours on end, which includes capitalizing on the desire for others' approval through like features, preying on the fear of missing out through push notifications and so forth. Um, again, you're part of an industry that's set up to do this. You, in some sense, don't appear to be able to help yourselves in reaching out and finding that new user and then holding on to them. Um, TikTok itself has acknowledged that these features and others, like the endless scroll feature, can have an outsized effect on teens. Um, and we've been discussing today how your app only intensifies that harm by amplifying dangerous content and misinformation. Um, I don't want to be too paternalistic here because we have young people in the audience. We've got TikTok users that are watching this hearing, and I'm sure they have their own ideas about how this technology is being managed by TikTok and other 
uh, social media platforms. Um, they like to access the platforms and they should be able to do that safely. So it's certainly in their interest and they can drive this conversation, I think, uh, perfectly well. But it's not a fair fight, is it? I mean, the algorithms are on one side of the screen. The human brain is on the other side of the screen, drowning in these algorithms. In many instances, at an age where, where the brain's not even fully developed yet. So those addictive impulses are being sort of perfected by the technology, and again, it leaves the users sort of helpless in the face of that. Are you looking at ways to redesign core features like the ones I mentioned to be less manipulat manipulative, excuse me, and addictive for users, and can you commit to making some of those modifications here today? Uh, Congressman, um, th thank you. We do want to be leading in terms of uh, safety of our users, particularly for teenagers. We were the first to launch a 60-minute watch limit. Yeah, let's I'm, talk about the 60-minute launch. And I'm very uh, glad to see it. people, uh, others in our industry follow. For many of your recommendations, we'll study them very seriously. Yeah. We actually have a series of features. Like, for example, if you're under 16, you cannot use a direct messaging feature mm -hmm. because you know, uh, we want to protect those younger users. If you're under 16, you cannot go viral by default. If you're under 18, you cannot go live. And um, Let me go back to the 60-minute limit. Um, because my understanding is that teens can pretty easily bypass the notification to continue using the app if they want to. I mean, let's face it, our, our teens are smarter than we are by half, and they know how to use the technology and they can get around these limits if they want to. Are you measuring how many teens continue to exceed the 60 minutes of time on that app? We understand how that's working. We, we understand those concerns. What we, our intention is to have the teens and their parents have these conversations about what is the appropriate amount of time for social media. That's why we give the parents what we call family Let pairing. me ask you this question before I run out of time. If you concluded that putting um, some reasonable limits in place and trying to find a way to enforce them would lead some percentage of your users to leave TikTok and go somewhere else. Is that something that you're prepared to accept? Yes. Really? Well, I'd love to get the research on how these limits are being implemented, how they're being bypassed, and the things that you're taking, uh, the measures you're taking to address those issues going forward. Please bring that information back to our committee as we move forward. I'll be happy to. I yield back. Gentleman yields. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Guthrie, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for, for yielding. I appreciate the time. Uh, Mr. Chu, your terms of service specifically state that TikTok does, and I quote, not allow the depiction, promotion, or trade of drugs or other controlled substances. Despite this content being against your terms of service, and I brought this up with other service providers, but despite this content being against your terms of service, content on your platform related to illicit drugs like fentanyl, Drug trafficking and other illicit activity is pervasive and racks up hundreds of thousands of views. For example, in 2020, the Benadryl challenge resulted in the death of an American teenager. And we heard of another one challenge earlier today that brought a death of a teenager. While you were at ByteDance, if you were the CFO for ByteDance, did doing allow related illicit drug trafficking or challenges resulting in death or injury to kids? Congressman, I represent TikTok here today. I can tell you that TikTok does not allow illegal but drugs do on it, our just platform. Do it, just do in it, do it, did in China? I believe they don't allow this, but I will need to check. I don't run their business. I, I can tell you TikTok is, does not allow this. Because what we're concerned about, and, and my guess, and, and uh, it would, would do in allow for, for 41 days a threat against uh, a, me a member of the Chinese Communist Party to stand on their, web, on their site for 41 days? Again, I cannot speak for Douyin, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the second part of what you said. Well, the, we had a threat against the chairman of our committee that was on your site for 41 days. My guess is that would not be allowed in China. Uh, that, that content is, if it's violative, I would look into the specifics, and I, I would, it would, if it violates our guidelines, it would be taken down on TikTok. Yeah, it surely yes. appears that it does, but the problem is that, that I'm, what I'm trying to get at is you seem to be able to prevent this content in China, but you, so not even taking it down, just prevent it from being posted, and yet it, it's, it's, all, it's on your website. So I have a couple of questions about, uh, you, you said earlier, as soon as you find this information, you take it down. So how quickly does your algorithm detect keywords or content that involve illicit drug trafficking before these posts are self-reported or used by others? 
Uh, we have about 40,000 um, people working on this now, together with the machines that we train. I don't think any company in our industry can be perfect at this. This is a real big challenge for our industry, but our goal is to get this, any violative content, including illegal drugs, down to a very, very small number. That's and the problem. When we have these hearings, we have CEOs of, of different companies and, and of your, your colleagues and competitors, and we always hear apologies, and we always hear we want to do better at this, but it, it just doesn't seem to keep improving, and we see are hearing stories of our, are of our children, and, and, and obviously this has been talked about today. So how many posts and accounts have been identified and removed from TikTok due to content posts, posted related to illicit drugs or other controlled substances? Uh, Congressman, we do publish that in a transparency report. I can get my team to get um, the information to yours. Thank you, I appreciate that. Also, we, we understand that, that the way that people use TikTok or other platforms similar to yours is that uh, they, they ensure flagged user content isn't permitted to jump from, so my question, so what we've heard is that the instances the users see a drug advertisement and then give a, a code to go to another site. So my question is, do you work with other platforms to ensure flagged user content is it permitted to jump from one platform to others? I will check with my team. I would love to work with our industry to make sure that we stamp out these problems. You know, violative content should not be allowed on any platforms, in my opinion. Well, so what's you know kind of frustrating to all of us here is that we look at what's happening on, on your sites and others, and particularly that, that we know, because we've done a research, that you can't have access to illicit drug information or other zone do in, which is a sister company, as you say, in China. And so it, it, it absolutely, if you can prevent it on one and not the other, you obviously have the ability to stop it from moving forward, and yet you don't. Would you like to expand how, how one of your sister companies can prevent that and you not, I know you don't represent Duyen, but they don't allow it, but it happens on your platform. What's the difference? Uh, first of all, the majority of the content on TikTok is fun, entertaining, uh, informative, and very positive for our users. Like other companies that operate in this country, we have to deal with some bad actors who come and publish some content on illegal, illegal uh, drugs. You know, other the bad actors don't seem to be able to access Doyen. Uh, the TikTok US experience should be compared to other US companies mm -hmm. because this is a common. But your parent exists. company has the technology to prevent it because you prevent it in China, but you can't prevent it here. Why, why there, is the difference? That's why I'm asking. Oh, Congressman, there is no technology that is perfect in doing this. Um, we have to deal with the reality of the country that you were operating in. Mm -hmm. And here in the United States, as with other companies, we, we share this challenge. Uh, we are investing a lot to address the challenge, but we are, you know, we, it's a shared challenge. But you invest a lot to seem to be able to address it in China, but not here. Uh, again, you know, I think the comparison has been with, within the, the single country. You know, we face the same set of challenges here in what's the U.S. What's the difference? With, I'm sorry, I'm out of time, but what's the difference in China and here? Uh, let me give you an example, Congressman. In my home country, Singapore, there is literally almost no illegal drug content because Singapore has very strict drug laws. Thank you. Uh, my time's expired. Now yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm concerned that TikTok's algorithm prize, preys on vulnerable people, including those struggling with addiction, eating orders, disorders, and other mental health conditions. The platform is designed to push content to users that will watch more frequently and for longer periods of time. Unfortunately for many people suffering from certain mental health disorders, videos that reinforce their fears or negative self-image are more engaging. On top of that, TikTok has received sensitive patient health information and records of browsing activity from multiple telehealth companies like BetterHelp, Help and Cerebral. People's personal struggles should not be fuel for TikTok's profits. People should be able to seek help to address serious medical concerns without being afraid that their information will be shared with social media companies trying to push more products, services, or content at them. So Mr. Chu, will TikTok continue to get information from third parties on its users' health, including their mental health, yes or no? We'll continue to work with experts, yes, if that's the question, will, to identify these issues. Will you continue to get information from these third parties, um, including their mental health, yes or no? Congressman, I'm sorry, I may not understand your question. If your question is if I'm working with them on these issues, the answer is yes. It's not the question, it's will you continue to get information from these third parties on its users' health? Get information. Um, we do not get any user health information from third parties, Congressman. You have talked a lot about user privacy and safety. 
will you commit here today to no longer using data about users' health, particularly their mental health, to push them content or sell ads? Yes or no? We take our users' uh, mental health uh, very seriously. We well, yes or no? As far as I'm aware, we don't do that, Congressman. It's not, not what the... Uh, so the, the answer the is no, you will no longer use uh, data about users' health. Uh, TikTok systematically exploits users' anxieties by pushing alarming and distressing content onto their For You page. For example, in May of 2022, the LA Times found that some pregnant users searching for information about their pregnancies on TikTok were then shown information about miscarriages, stillbirths, and delivery room traumas. Your company knows that distressing content can have the perverse effect of feeding user engagement. And for TikTok, Engagement means money. In the course of a week, what percentage of content that a user sees is considered potentially harmful or distressing content? Congressman, we work with a lot of experts on this. Um, even before we set the 60-minute time limit for under-18s, if you spend too much time on our platform, you, you can try it. If you spend too much time, we will actually send you videos to tell you to go out and get some air and get off the platform. What percentage of content that a user sees is considered potentially harmful? I would need to follow up with my team and get back to you on that, if that's well, okay. Ballpark. I would need to follow up with my team. So are teenagers in particular shown more distressing content? Uh, the opposite is true. We actually put in more restrictions to make sure that our teenagers get a better experience. You know? are, are expectant or new parents shown more distressing content? I know of many parents, uh, including one I met uh, recently, who actually use our platform to find communities to connect with other parents and learn a lot more. I've, I've heard amazing stories of creators who have uh, difficulties, you know, and, and Reclaiming my time. Case. Are individuals with eating disorders shown more distressing content? We do not, re we remove all content that glorifies eating disorders, and we have worked with experts to look at certain inherently, um, the certain content that may not inherently be harmful, like diet trends, and, and make sure that we disperse them more throughout our algorithm. What about those with mental health issues? Are they this given is a more issue distressing we take content? If, if a user searches, you know, words that expresses mental health issues, we actually redirect them to a safety page. Like, for example, uh, if you, I don't know if I should say this in public, if you search, I want to die, we will redirect you to a safety page, for example. So what about those suffering from addiction? Are they given more distressing content? I'm sorry, Congressman, I missed that question. Those suffering from addiction, are they given more distressing content? I missed the first few words, I apologize. Those, what about those suffering from addiction? Are they given more distressing oh, content? Those suffering from uh, addiction. Mental, uh, addiction. Uh, do you mean drug addiction or? Yes, or any, any order of addiction. If, if people search for content and you can try on a variety of subjects, we will actually direct you to a safety page to give you more resources. And a lot of um, recovering addicts have actually found their communities on TikTok and it's really helped them you know, find their voices and the community and the courage to, to really overcome their addiction. I, I personally have heard stories of that. Well, I appreciate your answers, but I was looking for yes or no, and uh, we did not get those. And again, I think the more that they watch this distressing content, the more profit TikTok makes, and that's distressing. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And we're glad that you're here, Mr. Chu. Uh, as Chair Rogers and uh, Representative Burgess mentioned this morning, the Wall Street Journal reported that China will firmly oppose any forced sale or divestiture of TikTok. And this is based uh, not on conjecture, but it's based on comments provided by the official spokesperson at the Ministry of Commerce, who said that any TikTok sale or spinoff would amount to a technology export and would have to adhere to Chinese law and approval. This spokesperson was quoted as saying the Chinese, and I quote, the Chinese government will make decisions according to the law, the Chinese government. Mr. Chu, do you agree with this official? Yes or no? Congressman, I cannot speak on behalf of uh, a Chinese government official. Do you agree with that official? We will need to look at this because Project Texas is, is designed to move forward here in the United States, and we are not discussing this, so I, um, I don't have specifics. You know, uh, your company is valued at upwards of $50 billion. 
and has been on the verge of for sale or banned for three years at least, correct? Do you expect this committee to believe you haven't already discussed this scenario with your team and you should have an answer to this, yes or no, I agree with the Communist Party or I don't agree with the Communist Party? So, I guess I would say at that point, you disagree with the Congress Communist Party. Explain your discrepancy. Congressman, for two years, uh, we spent a billion and a half US dollars to build Project Texas. This is after very extensive discussions with Project relevant Texas, folks. Project Texas is just something expanded for the future. We're talking about now. We're it's, talking about what you're doing now, what your expectations are now, what your relationship is with the Communist Party, which is our major concern of what the impact that will be with a country uh, let, me, let me rephrase that, with a Communist Party that doesn't care about America and sees us as standing in their way for, for superpower. That's our concern, and for you to have direct relationship, uh, direct ownership with ByteDance and to not have a characteriz characterization or an agreement or disagreement that you say explicitly with this party policy it's hard for us to, to believe what you're saying. Let me move on. Uh, following up on what Mr. Latta asked about data access by Chinese engineers. In responding to Mr. Latta, you talked about where American user data would be stored in the future. But the question was about access today. Storage in the future versus access today. This is total redirection. Uh, this blows up any trust we could desire to develop. So to be clear, Mr. Chu, today, do ByteDance employees in Beijing have access to American data? Uh, Congressman, we have been very open about this. We have relied on global interoperability. You yeah, have access to American data. Congressman, I'm, I'm answering your question. If you give me just a bit of time. We, we rely on global interoperability, and we have employees in China. So yes, the Chinese engineers do have access to global data. You have access to global data. Uh, we have heard. Not concerns. storage. No, storage has always been in Virginia and Singapore. The, the physical service. You have no access to storage, to American data today. That's not what I said. I said. So you do have access to American data, and you have storage of American data. The, American data has always been stored in Virginia and Singapore in the past. And access of this is on an as-required basis as by our engineers globally, who? by engineers for business purposes. By engineers, this is a private com by company. dance, by dance uh, the Communist out, Party? No, no. Why, uh, how can you say that? This is a, if this they is have a private access. business. This is a private business, and is uh, like many other businesses, many other American companies, we rely on the global workforce. So the global workforce that includes Byte dance which is connected directly to the Chinese Communist Party. That is a access. characterization that we d disagree with. Now, in the that's future- not, That's not what we can disagree with. That's a fact. It's not, unfortunately. To the CEO of ByteDance uh, and your relationship to them. Uh, Congressman, respectfully, in my opening statement, I said this is a private company. It's owned 60% by global investors. Three out of the five board members on ByteDance are Americans. This is a private business. And you report directly to ByteDance with a CEO who is a member of the Communist Party. Let me he's, move on. We're, he's I not. We, I think we got the answer, uh, sadly, um, at this point. I believe my time has expired, so I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes Ms. Clark for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Rogers. Thank the ranking member, Pallone, for holding today's hearing. Uh, throughout this hearing, uh, I also want to thank our witness uh, for being here to testify on what are very important issues uh, before us today. Throughout this hearing, my colleagues have outlined the potential threat posed by the security of Americans' data by TikTok being affiliated and some would say owned by a Chinese company foreign adversaries having direct access to Americans' data, as well as the ability to influence this content Americans see on a prolific social media platform, represents an unprecedented threat to American security and to our democracy. 
However, the problems of social media platforms, content moderation, algorithmic discrimination, and safety are neither new nor unique to TikTok. Mr. Chu, I share the concerns raised by my colleague, Congresswoman Matsui, related to algorithms. I believe that without mitigation against bias, platforms will continue to replicate, exacerbate discrimination that is illegal under civil rights law, as well as exclude important dialogue about sensitive topics like race from occurring on the platform. For example, I was disturbed by reports that TikTok content moderation algorithm flagged words like black or Black Lives Matter as inappropriate content. So my first question, Mr. Chu, is do you agree that platforms like TikTok should be subject to regular audits or transparency requirements to identify whether policies have a disparate impact on communities that are protected classes, like race, religion, national origin, or gender? I think, um uh, Congresswoman, I think platforms should be very transparent on what they do there and disclose a lot of information. We can get back on the specifics of what we mean by an audit, but I do agree very strongly that uh, platforms should be very transparent, and it's a commitment that we're giving to this committee and all our users that our platform will be a place for freedom of expression. We embrace all diverse points of view, all ethnic minorities. You can come and say whatever you want, as long as you don't violate the rules of safety that we've put in place. And we, will, we also commit to be free of all and any government manipulation. So I think I'm in strong agreement with a lot of what you said. Well, thank you. My bill, the Algorithmic Accountability Act, would require platforms to be transparent about their algorithms, measure disparate impact, and require risk mitigation. It is vital that the diverse culture of the United States is reflected online, but I'm concerned the algorithms and content moderation practices employed by TikTok are ignorant to the fundamental diversity while also failing to remove content that is harmful, like child sexual abuse material, hate speech, or domestic terrorism content. My next question to you is, it's my understanding that users must be in good standing to be eligible for compensation from TikTok's creator fund. For example, they can't have violated community guidelines. Is this correct? Uh, there are some details there, but directionally, yes. If TikTok's algorithm is flagging content incorrectly, resulting in creators violating community guidelines when in fact they have not, those creators would not be eligible to receive compensation under the creator fund, correct? We do have an appeals process. You have an appeals process, okay. Yes, yes. In my view, if TikTok employs algorithms that disproportionately misremove content from black creators, it disproportionately silences and excludes black creators from compensation opportunities. And this problem happens in parallel to the lack of adequate recognition, attribution, and compensation to black creatives for their content. The exploitation, cultural misappropriations, the erasure of black creatives' ownership of their fashion, art, and media is nothing new. We need transparency, accountability, and bold action to mitigate against misinformation, bias, and exclusion of certain communities from the opportunities present on platforms like TikTok. So let me, let me just say this. I'm concerned about transparency. I am concerned about uh, algorithmic accountability. And I'm not clear that your organization holds those values. So I want to ask that you uh, take a look at this, uh, because this is all part and parcel of what we're concerned about with respect to uh, social media platforms and the misappropriation, uh, the uh, the ways in which those algorithms can discriminate uh, within the context of the social media platform. With that, Madam Chair, I, I yield back. Congresswoman, uh, is uh, it okay if I just very quickly um, respond? This is a very important well, topic. Uh, unfortunately, we only have four and a half hours with you, and I'm going to try to get to every member, <coughs> so we're going to keep going. It is very important. I would love uh, to follow you, up. Well, there will be other opportunities. 
The lady yields back. Gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Buddy Carter is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Crew, welcome to the most bipartisan committee in Congress. We may not always agree on how to get there, but we care about our, our national security. We care about our economy, and we sure as heck care about our children. We sure do. And that's why you're here today, because two-thirds of all the youth in our country are on your, on your app. They spend an average of 95 minutes on your app. And you know, research has shown that TikTok is the most addictive platform out there. And, and the reason for that, as we've been told, is because it has the most advanced algorithm. And the Chinese Communist Party knows this, and I don't speak for everyone, but there are those on this committee, including myself, who believe that the Chinese Communist Party is engaged in psychological warfare through TikTok to deliberately influence U.S. children. You know, you see behind me, if you, if you look behind me, Mr. Crew, you see some of the challenges that we've seen on TikTok. You know about them. You know about the milk crate. You know about the, uh, about the blackout challenge. You know about the uh, NyQuil chicken challenge, the Benadryl challenge, the dragon's breath liquid nitrogen trend are the challenge that promotes car theft. I want to ask you, as I understand it, there's a sister app in China, Doikin, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm butchering the, the pronunciation. Do they have these same things over there? Do they have these kind of challenges uh, in Congress, China? Co Congressman, I'm really glad you asked this question. Uh, yeah. Do they, yes or no? I'm not sure because- yeah, whoa, 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 come on now, you're not sure? I really am not sure. Re remember, you took. The, the chair lady, she said, you got to tell the truth, okay? Do you know whether they have these kind of challenges like this over in China? Because it's my understanding they don't. I, I'm not sure because I spend my energies running TikTok. And, and you don't look at any of your other competitors or look at anything similar to yours. So you don't know whether they have. They don't have this over in China. I did. We have it here, but they don't have it here. And that's, that's why I'm, I'm asking you this. Why is it that TikTok consistently fails to identify and moderate these kinds of, of harmful videos. Did Why is it? Why is it that you allow this to go on? We've already heard, God bless you, from parents who, who are here with us, who have lost children. I, I submit to you, everybody up here cares about the children of this country. Tell me, tell me why. This is a real industry challenge and we're working very hard. No, 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 it's not hard. industry, this is TikTok. It's We're talking challenge. about TikTok. We're talking about why is it that you can't control this? And although I believe in giving credit where credit's due, I want to thank you. It's my understanding that the video that threatened the life of the chairwoman has been, has been removed. Thank you for doing that. Sorry we had to bring it to your attention here, but it's been removed. Tell me why this goes on. This is an industry challenge for all of us here operating in this okay, country. Okay, so much for industry challenge. I want to shift gears real quick. I want to talk about biometric um, uh, matrix, and, and I want to talk specifically, can you tell me right now, can you say with 100% certainty that TikTok does not use the phone's camera to determine whether the content that elicits a pupil dilation should be amplified by the algorithm? Can you tell me that? We do not collect body, face, or voice data to identify our users. We do not. The, the, the How, only well, you, you don't? The, no. The only face data that you get that we collect is when you use the filters to have, say, sunglasses on your face. We need to know where your eyes are. And Why that, do you need it, to know what the eyes are and, if you're not seeing if they're dilated? And, and that data is stored on your local device and deleted after use if you use it for facial. Again, we do not collect body, face, or voice data to identify our users. I find that hard to believe. It's our understanding that they're looking at the eyes. How do you determine what age they are then? Um, we rely on age gating as our key age assurance. Age gating, which is when you ask the user what age they are. We have also developed some tools where we look at their public profile um, to go through the videos that they post to see whether... Well, that's creepy. Tell me more about that. It's public. So if you post a video, that's, you choose that video to go public, that's how you get people to see your video. We look at those to see if you, it matches up the age that you talked about. Now, this is a real challenge for our industry because privacy versus age assurance is a really big problem. Look, look, 
you keep talking about the industry. We're talking about TikTok here. We're talking about children dying. Do you know how many children have died because of this? Do you have any idea? Can you tell me? Uh, uh, Congressman, again, it's heartbreaking. Can you tell me if how many children in America have died because of challenges like this? The majority of pe people who use our platform use it for positive experiences. I, there I, are, I, that's not what I ask you. I some, ask you, tell me the number of children, of U.S. children who have died because of these challenges. Congressman, uh, again, the... Majority of majority of people who come on our platform get a good I'm experience. I'm not talking about the majority of children. I want to know a number. Dangerous challenges are not allowed on our platform. If we find them, we will remove them. We take this very seriously. Obviously, you found one today and you removed it. We had to bring it to your attention, and I know I'm out of time. Thank you for being here. Welcome again to the most bipartisan committee in Congress. Gentlemen, yields back. We will now take a brief recess and resume in 10 minutes. The committee stands in recess. break now in the testimony from TikTok's CEO, Cho Chu. And this is before the Energy and Commerce Committee, 52 members, so still many questions to come. But so far, a very unified front. Democrats and Republicans all asking pressing questions, sometimes, frankly, not waiting for the answer, hitting issues ranging from China's relationship to TikTok, uh, to the influence of the Chinese Communist Party, to the mental health and privacy of teenagers and children in America. I'm Libby Casey. I'm joined right now by James Homan during this brief break, opinions columnist here at The Washington Post. Uh, James, uh, we heard the last member say this is a bipartisan panel, and so far it certainly is sounding unified in their criticism and concern about TikTok. Yeah, Buddy Carter's comment really rings true there, as we just saw Anna Eshoo, a very liberal Democrat from California, talking to Kathy McMorris-Rogers, the chair of this committee, very conservative Republican from Washington State. And it, it really was striking, not a single defender uh, of TikTok during that first two plus hours of really rough questioning, uh, the, the TikTok CEO getting pounded on not just national security concerns that we heard a lot of earlier uh, in the, the first hour, but a lot of concerns about teen mental health and uh, well-being during the second hour, uh, really uh, kind of almost one-upmanship with every member of Congress trying to score more points uh, to dunk harder on the TikTok CEO. And really, I would say the TikTok CEO going out of his way uh, to be as kind of chill as possible, not really losing his cool, but also uh, not really uh, giving much, mm -hmm. uh, really not a lot of kind of what you would consider hard news during that first two-hour stretch. Let's go to Rhonda Colvin, senior congressional reporter who is there in that hearing room. Uh, Rhonda, tell us about the audience. Who has sh shown up for today's hearing? Well, I can tell you that it is kind of a chaotic scene over here. There are a lot of people. Um, I've stepped out into the hallway during this short recess. Uh, there are a lot of people in the audience who uh, probably fit the TikTok demographic, uh, the largest demographic on TikTok, which is younger people, that demographic 18 to 34. I'm seeing a lot of teenagers in the audience, which is not often what you see in a congressional hearing, certainly not one that's going to last about almost five hours. Uh, but they look engaged, and, you know, the stakes for them are, are pretty high. This is an app, as has been said, during this hearing that uh, a lot of young people use in this country as well as globally. And a lot of the questions that we've seen today do touch on that. The influence on teens, uh, you heard uh, just now that uh, Representative Carter, who is from Georgia, he had a placard behind him that showed uh, the TikTok challenges that have um, uh, hurt teens and some have died. He named some of them, asked if China has this problem. Uh, in their uh, companion app to TikTok, it, it has another name um, and uh, different operation. But um, a lot of the questions are talking about online safety. Uh, I think one thing that I, I've noticed in this hearing that's interesting to me is you are not seeing too much redundancy uh, in questioning. Of course, national security issues, sharing data, um, 
with the Chinese government, which is something that lawmakers say is happening. Uh, you're seeing those questions, but you're also seeing other concerns. Uh, you heard from one of the Democratic lawmakers who said that she thinks the algorithm foster discrimination and bias towards uh, black content creators. You've heard a couple Republican members talk about how TikTok might be influencing issues with fentanyl and uh, immigration at the southern border. So these lawmakers do seem prepared to ask a variety of questions right now. Um, and as the uh, chair of the committee just said, they, they still have a couple hours to go uh, with this CEO. Thanks so much, Rhonda. Jeffrey Fowler, uh, let's talk about some fact-checking here. So I want you to go through some of the most alarming statements that lawmakers have made and give us a sense of perspective. What do we actually know about potential uh, China's access? So Chinese leadership, the Chinese Communist Party having access to user data. Let's start with that one. What do we know? Yeah, I don't think we've learned anything new today on that front. We seem to be going around in the same kind of circle that we've heard before where uh, we know that uh, the law in China says that, the national security law in China says that a Chinese tech company has to provide data uh, when asked, and then the CEO of TikTok says uh, the Chinese government uh, via ByteDance has not asked for that data and that it would, uh, it would resist giving it if asked. Um, and that it wants to set up this sort of complicated system of servers in the U.S. to try to be a firewall in between there. But we don't really have any better sense of how well that would that would actually work. Um, th the other thing in terms of fact checking, I mean, just right from the beginning at this hearing, we heard um, the the chair sort of repeat some things that have been said about TikTok before and its data practices that but frankly just aren't true. Uh, she said that, uh, that the app collects every bit of data that is possible from a phone. That is not. As we said at the beginning of our show today, um, it does not collect your location, which is one of the, your precise location, which is one of the most sensitive pieces of data. We've also seen just right before the break, I was like transfixed in this, um, in this conversation about whether it's watching your eyes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, again, there's all these like, it's, it's kind of like fits in the same realm as like Facebook's listening to you through the app kind of uh, urban myths about about technology. Um, and we saw the the, the, the CEO of, of TikTok say, no, it is not collecting any um, biometric data uh, in an attempt to uh, to identify its users. But if it's going to make a filter that makes your face look really young or whatever is the hot filter of the moment, it does need to know where your eyes are. And there seemed to be a kind of a, a big technical disconnect on why that would happen. You know, I, I do want to point out, Jeff, that so some of the claims that members of Congress have made are, are not backed up by what we know so far. But across the board, and the CEO of TikTok has in fact alluded to this, across the board, the privacy uh, data and information that tech companies can access is, is, is sort of astounding. So there really isn't a need to use hyperbole or go to the, the scariest example in and of itself. What we do know about what all these companies access is, is concerning to many families. Absolutely. To me, the most heartening part of the hearing today for we the users of this technology is that there seems to be a recognition from members of Congress on both, both, in both parties that we have a problem with data in this country uh, with, with the way that this industry works, uh, of which TikTok is right up there with it. They, they profit by collecting information about us to target ads at us and using that information also to get us to spend more time in these apps and get hooked into them. And that's a pretty core problem. So from where I sit, um, thinking about what would be the best outcome here for American users, if the outcome of this is we actually pass some laws that help regulate that, we're going to be in a better place. Um, but those are problems that are go across the industry. And also to remind our viewers, if they're not familiar with your reporting, you are a columnist who is really looking at technology from the perspective of the user. That's right. um, and so, you know, your information is very helpful to learn how we can even take control of what privacy settings we can use on our devices. So that is where you're coming from. James, you know, reporting on this hearing and watching uh, these members, uh, there's been a lot of focus on this Project Texas, which people may have sort of wondered what that is. Um, we can talk more about that in a moment, but this is this these steps that the company is saying they can take to sort of guard off or wall off Americans' data. I want to play a little bit of the TikTok CEO, Sho Chu's opening statement today, where he outlines steps the company is taking to secure Americans' data. Let's watch.
we have legacy US data sitting in our servers in Virginia and in Singapore. We're deleting those, and we expect that to be complete this year. When that is done, all protected US data will be under the protection of US law and under the control of the US-led security team. This eliminates the concern that some of you have shared with me that TikTok user data can be subject to Chinese law. This goes further, by the way, than what any other company in our industry have done. We will also provide unprecedented transparency and security for the source code for the TikTok app and recommendation engine. Third-party validators like Oracle and others will review and validate our source code and algorithms. All right, James. Uh, members of Congress have received that how? They followed up by saying, so currently China still could demand the data, which is the implication of that, that they're trying to get to a place where China won't be able to do it anymore. Uh, and also, they kind of were trying to get him to say that it would still be puncturable by China, that even this Project Texas, even having the server, as Jeff was saying before the hearing, it's the internet. The, the way it works is the data can be physically on a server in Texas, uh, but that doesn't stop ByteDance from still owning TikTok and the Chinese government demanding that ByteDance go collect this data. And in the, while there's not evidence, there's nothing that's been said to show that that couldn't happen. Practical the word, implications of this? Yeah. Well, the word eliminate that he used in his right. statement there is, I think, uh, not something that he's proven, right? right? He said it would eliminate any concern. Mm -hmm. and, all, and again, I think it's important to keep reminding that we, even through this hearing today, we've not gotten any new evidence of, of the Chinese government uh, trying to access that data or to shape the experience American users are having um, uh, through, the, through the app for political purposes. Um, it does not eliminate the possibility. Right. Uh, Rhonda Colvin is in this hearing room right now, a hot ticket to get Rhonda, uh, very much interest in this hearing, uh, both by people who use TikTok. We also saw family members who've been gravely affected by this. I mean, it's just devastating to see um, the parents of one teenager who uh, died by suicide. And they were in the room to talk about or hear about really and have their representative, their congressman talk about what was being served up to him. I'd like to get a sense from you, Rhonda, of what that moment felt like in the room. You know, uh, I think everyone in the room has expected members of Congress to certainly discuss and highlight harms that have been happening to teenagers uh, due to using the app. I think that's probably a very critical argument for members of Congress. We've certainly seen other hearings on that exact subject. Um, it kind of sobers everyone up that, yes, there are concerns if Congress does a full ban, uh, if that's something that is unfair to TikTok, unfair to those who use it and have found it as a sense of community or, or professionally found it beneficial. But there are also downsides. And, uh, oh, hold on a sec, Rhonda. I think, we're, are we, I think we're seeing this rolling uh, already. So let's go back TikTok to the room. And its effect on the American people, especially the American children and the potential effect not potential, but the effects that it has had and may have in the future when it comes to our democracy and misinformation and disinformation uh, that permeates on TikTok. It's unfortunate that uh, I think most Americans or most parents think that TikTok is this innocent little thing where kids get on there and they do a little dance or something like that. But TikTok is much, much more as some of my colleagues, and I thank them for bringing up some of these serious issues, literally life and death issues that TikTok is right in the middle of. Um, and also, um, what I'd like uh, the witness to acknowledge is that it appears that uh, Ms. Kamek, my colleague, uh, brought up those two posters. And since then, uh, TikTok has taken them down since then, not before then. Uh, are you aware of that, uh, Mr. Chu? I was brief during the break that they are taken down. OK. okay. Um, how do you feel about the fact that they were? it was up for apparently 40-some days? 41 days, and yet in the middle of this hearing, it was brought directly to your attention, and as a result, it has been taken down so quickly. It goes to show the enormous challenge that we have to make sure that although the vast majority of our users come for a good experience, we, we need to make sure that bad actors don't post violated yes. content. Yes, and the way, Mr. Chu, that you can make sure is that you can make sure that you choose to invest more resources, more money into more ability to pull down damaging and deadly information from your platform. Are you investing more and more and more every day into bringing down that kind of content? 
That's my question. Are you? Uh, uh, yes, uh, and I've commit to investing more uh, in this in this regard to stay on top of the growth. Right here in the United States, many, many languages are used and spoken. For example, TikTok in the United States is being used in many languages. Specifically, when it comes to Spanish language, are you dedicating more resources today than you did months ago, years ago, on making sure that you are combing through that content to make sure that if content is dangerous or damaging or deadly, that you are bringing it down as quickly as possible? Uh, yes, we are investing in more Spanish language uh, content moderation, and yes, we will, once we identify okay. uh, violative content, we'll take it down as soon and as possible. Thank you, and your testimony today isn't the only opportunity for you to uh, commit to answering questions to this committee, so I'd like you to forward to this committee. Again, I'm not asking for trade secrets, but I would like to get some semblance of understanding as to how much you are investing with the number of bodies, the number of people, the number of resources in making sure that you are investing more in pulling down content that is either deadly or dangerous on your platform. Can you forward that to the committee? In I will check with my team and future. get back to you on this. Conference. Thank you very much. Appreciate that opportunity. Um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, it might sound a little funny, but you have, in fact, been one of the few people to unite this committee, uh, members, Republicans, and Democrats, uh, to be in agreement that we are frustrated with TikTok. We're upset with TikTok. And yes, you keep mentioning that there are industry issues that not only TikTok faces, but others. You remind me a lot of Mike Zuckerberg. Uh, he, when he came here, I said to my staff, he reminds me of Fred Astaire, good dancer with words. And you are doing the same today. A lot of your answers are a bit nebulous. They're not yes or no. So I'd like to ask you a question, yes or no? Is your revenue going up at TikTok month over month or year over year? Uh, yes, our revenue is going up okay. year over year. And with that, some of the answers I'd like you to forward this committee is, are you investing more and more money into making sure that content that is dangerous and or deadly, you're investing more and more resources in that aspect of your expenditures and your commitment to your users and to your, your organization? Yes, I commit to that. And we, will, we are investing more, and we will continue to do that. Okay. My last question is this. Um, are you a Chinese company? TikTok is a company that's now headquartered in Singapore and Los Angeles. Okay. Our, we are not available in mainland China. Our users are in other countries around the world. Okay. Is there a corporation that has any authority above TikTok? TikTok is a subsidiary of ByteDance, which is founded by a Chinese founder. Uh -huh. yes. And ByteDance is a Chinese company? Well, Chi ByteDance owns many businesses that operate in China. Is it or is it not a Chinese company? Uh, Congressman, the way we look at it, it was founded no, by no, Chinese no, no. I'm not asking you how you look at it. Fact, is it a Chinese company or not? For example, Dell is a company, it's an American company. They have ac activities all over the world. Is it a Chinese company? I frequently have these discussions with others on what is a company that is now global. That, that's okay. I prefer you answer the question and stop dancing verbally on it. Madam Chair, my time has expired. Thank you very much. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Obanolte. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chu. It's nice to see you again. Uh, if I could just bring us back up to 30,000 feet for a second. Uh, I just want to talk about what we're afraid of here, You know, what, what we fear might happen. Uh, Social media companies, and TikTok is unique in this, is not unique in this, gather a tremendous amount of user data and then use powerful AI tools to use that data to make eerily accurate predictions of human behavior and then uh, seek to manipulate that behavior. And that's something that it's not just TikTok, it's all our social media companies that are doing this. Ultimately, the solution is to enact comprehensive federal data privacy legislation that will prevent that kind of behavior or at least allow users to consent to it. And that is, I know, something that the chair is working on, the ranking member. I hope that this committee will act on that this year. The specific concern here, though, as regards TikTok, is that this type of capability falling into the hands of foreign countries uh, is something that has national security implications. And that's why Congress is getting involved on this issue. So I know that you have proposed Project Texas in an effort to alleviate these fears. So I wanted to ask some specific technical questions about Project Texas and the way that you believe 
that it will solve this problem. So uh, one of the things that you've said in your testimony is that part of Project Texas uh, will have engineers at Oracle going through the source code for TikTok. Uh, how large is that code base? Um, well, it's, it's not small, but um, it's not just Oracle, Congressman. We are also inviting other third party monitors. We're in the process of figuring out who the best um, sure. So are we talking, uh, are we talking millions, tens of millions of lines of code? How big is the base? It, it is significant, um, but it's something that we believe can be done. And again, I want to say that I don't, I have not heard of another, co another company, American or not, no, 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 has no, allowed for this to happen. But I mean, you're kind of at a unique position having to, to answer these concerns of Congress. So are they going through the code for just the app or the app and the server code? I can get back to you on the, okay. the technical details, well, but it's, it's, it's comprehensive, including the software that powers the, a lot of the software that powers the experience. And how long will that review take? Uh, I need to get back to you on the timeline, but we are uh, progressing quite well on Project Texas, and whenever we hit a milestone, I commit to be very transparent about it. Okay. So uh, I'm wondering, because I'm also concerned uh, as a software engineer about the process in which new code is introduced into the code base. Do you use a software configuration management system at TikTok? The, the, the way we uh, plan for new code to be done is that even before the code becomes live, it has to be reviewed. Um, the changes have to be reviewed okay, by sure. the so you're, third you're party monitor. So you're talking about a, a code review. That was, that was good. That was another question I had for you. So the code review, is it done with a team of engineers or just with a single engineer? Oh, it's going to be a team effort. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's going to be done at Oracle or elsewhere? Uh, it's, it's going to be done in one of our transpar transparency centers so that we, you know, uh, we still need to make sure that the code itself is secure. And, okay. You know, uh, so, so yeah. what I'm hearing you say is that even though the code might be written by someone not in the United States, before the code is integrated, it'll be reviewed in a code review by a team of engineers within the United States? Th that's the plan. Okay. And this, uh, back to the question about the software configuration management system, how do, you, how do you manage the integration of that code change into the rest of the TikTok code base? The long and short of it is we have built a team of American personnel um, with security credentials. The, the person who leads the team used to work for the Secret uh, no, Service, no, I for understand, example. but I mean, there's, there's a software solution for integrating those code changes into the code base. What's, what solution is that? I would need to check and get back to you on the details. Okay. Well, yeah. specifically, what I'd like to know is to make sure that this isn't something that TikTok has, has created uh, custom, which many companies do, because that would mean that you'd have to review the code, source code for that as well yeah. for security. Uh, how do you protect against threats like uh, the, uh, a malicious actor being hired not by TikTok, but by, uh, by uh, Oracle, for example, or by, uh, uh, by USDS? The, um, the approach that most companies take for these things is to have several layers of monitoring to make sure that everything, everything that somebody has reviewed is a secondary review so that one malicious actor is not able to create the damage that the malicious actor can do. But you rightly pointed out these kind of problems are industry-wide problems. Right. Every company has to deal with them. Okay, well, it, let me ask a specific question about that. I mean, I, I uh, in thinking about if I, if I were a malicious actor, a software engineer on one of your projects, how I would go about writing a, a malicious code, I wouldn't put it right there and say, hey, I'm malicious. Uh, I would put unrelated lines of code in different sections of the code that work together to do something malicious. How do you think that that could get caught? Uh, again, you know, we have to rely on third-party experts to, to help us with that. Uh, I think there are enough experts who can catch a lot of these things. The work on security globally, on all data security, is never perfect. Yeah, I understand. Uh, but we can, we can have a lot of oversight oh. to keep it safer than any other experience. I, I, I appreciate uh, the effort. Uh, my concern, Mr. Chu, is I don't believe that it is technically possible to accomplish what TikTok says it will accomplish through Project Texas. I just think that there are too, too many... Uh, back doors through that process to allow that to be possible. And I think a malicious actor would succeed in inserting malicious code in there if they wanted to. I, but I hope we, I see we're out of time. I hope we get an opportunity to, to talk some more about this. I yield back, Madam Chair. The gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan, Mrs. Dingle. For five Thank minutes. you, Chairman Rogers and Ranking Member Pallone for holding this hearing and to Mr. Chu for testifying here today. Your good news, you're halfway through with me. As screen time increases, so do inherent risks. And with the proliferation and popularity of new social media platforms, so does the potential to reach of dangerous, provocative, and often harmful content. And my fear, the abuse of collected data. 
As a representative from the state of Michigan, I can speak from experience on how social media has been used to target members of the Michigan delegation, including a plot to kidnap our governor, and how it can be weaponized to perpetuate harms towards individuals and communities. And you saw firsthand how it targeted the chair of this committee. Today, many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle have raised legitimate concerns about protecting children online, misinformation, and securing our data. Concerns that I share and has been said by many of my colleagues are bipartisanly shared. I think of many ways these myriad of issues highlight the need for comprehensive data privacy legislation that would ensure the safety and integrity of every American's data on every social media platform and mit mitigate potential harms. One important area of concern I have regarding data collection is geolocation data and how it can be abused. I've seen it abused. I have seen women die because it has been abused. This subject has dangerous implications for survivors of domestic violence, people seeking medical care, and protecting children from potential predators. Mr. Chu, in your testimony, you wrote that current versions of the app do not collect precise or approximate GPS information from US users. Yes or no answers, please. Mr. Chu, have any prior versions of TikTok's app collected precise GPS information from US users? Yes or no? Yes, from back in 2020, about three years ago. Are there currently TikTok users who still hold old versions of the app that collect precise GPS information from US users? Yes or no? That could be, but that's a small percentage. Today. Still dangerous. Has TikTok at any time fed precise GPS information collected from US users into algorithms to serve user ads? Yes or no? I will need to check on the details because we do not currently col collect that. So uh, I, I need to check on the details. Yeah, I'm sure there's a yes there. But has TikTok at any time fed precise GPS information collected from US users into algorithms? I don't know I'm having talk today to make inferences about users, yes or no? I'm not sure of the specific. So I'd like answers, yeah. yes or no, after this. Has TikTok at any time sold precise GPS information collected from US users, yes or no? We do not sell data to data brokers, if that's the question. That, and you've never done that? I do not believe so. Has TikTok at any time sold or shared with third parties it, it, or a lot of inferences that were made using, in part or in whole, precise GPS information collected from US users, yes or no? Uh, Congressman, I need to check on these specifics. What I can tell you is right now, we do not collect uh, precise GPS location data in the United States. All right. Does TikTok still use inferences that were made using, in part or in whole, precise GPS information collected from US users? I'm, I'm sorry, would you repeat that? Does TikTok still use inferences that you've gained that were made using, in part in or whole, precise GPS information collected from US users in your algorithms? That will be a very technical question. I will have to check and get back to you. Has TikTok at any time provided the Chinese government with either precise GSP information collected from US users or inferences made from that data? That I can give you a straight answer. no. Mr. Chu, even in Congress, even if Congress were to ban TikTok, I'm concerned that China or others would still have access to US consumer data by purchasing it, purchasing it through data brokers. Will you commit not to sell any of TikTok's data to data, data brokers now or in the future? We do not do that. We do not sell data to data brokers now. Uh, Will you commit to not do it in the future? This is a, there are certain mem members of our industry who do this. You know, I think this has to be broad legislation to help us, the whole industry, address this problem. I think I'm out of time. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Chair yields five minutes to the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer. Thank you. Uh, when 
The Chinese Communist government uh, bought a share of ByteDance. Uh, it's been described as, as the Chinese Communist government's way of quieter form of control, and that companies have little choice uh, in selling a stake to the gov government uh, if they want to stay in business. And what I'd like to know is when the Chinese Communist government moved to buy shares of, of ByteDance, were you informed beforehand, yes or no? Uh, no. Okay. Um, Congressman Biden uh, were, were you or anyone with TikTok asked for your opinion about the sale of shares of ByteDance to the Chinese Communist government? It, yes or no? It just this hasn't happened. Uh, did you or anyone employed by or affiliated with TikTok state any objections or concerns about the possibility of the Chinese co Communist government, once they had shares in ByteDance exercising control over content, using your platform for conducting misinformation campaigns or restrictions ensuring nothing is posted reflects badly on the Chinese Communist government or for surveillance and data collection for use against anyone. Did any of your, you or anyone affiliated with TikTok raise any concerns about that? Congressman, we do not collect, uh, we do not promote. I didn't ask you that. We, we do yes not promote. No. Did you raise any concerns about it? Because that's why we're here. But we do not promote or remove I any content at the behalf that. of did, the Chinese did government. Did you communicate in any form or fashion with the directors of ByteDance that there might be concerns about government control over content? Did Yes or no? Did You either did or you didn't. C C Congressman, I, didn't. I, I just want to make this clear. We do not remove this. or promote content at the request of the Chinese TikTok government. TikTok insiders have already said that the company is tightly controlled by ByteDance. It even gets down to the hours they work. So obviously, you didn't say anything. There's a serious concern by Chinese companies, privately held companies, about uh, doing anything against what the Chinese Communist government wants. I want to ask you this. Does TikTok screen against manipulative content from child predators, yes or no? Do we screen? Do you against? screen against them? Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, this how about, drug, child predator, how about drug cartels? Do drug you, cartels, child predatory content. You, this is you all had violated. a drug cartel that was engaged in a police chase with Spanish authorities, and they posted it on TikTok and got over a million views. Why wasn't that taken down? And are you doing it with human traffickers or terrorists? I mean, do you withhold content um, from nations that might be committing crimes against humanity? Yes or no? Congressman, our platform is yes a place no. of freedom of expression yes no. and uses I know come you, here you and talk about that, but yes or no, do you screen against content from nations that commit crimes against humanity? Congressman, our users come and yes or no? Our yes or users no? come and pre present no, you, any points of views you that don't. you want. And it's a commitment to keep this well, free from Let me ask you this. Michael Beckerman, who is your vice president and head of public policy for, for the Americas, right? Um, is he part of the team that helped you prepare for this meeting, yes or no? Um, can I clarify who you mean? Michael Beckerman. Yes, he is. Okay, where is he at this moment? I'm sorry? Where is Mr. Beckerman at this moment? He's probably here. No, you know he's here. He's sitting right behind you. I want to know why... When Mr. Beckerman was on with Jake Tapper on CNN and asked repeatedly to condemn uh, Chinese, treat Chinese Communist tr government's treatment of the Uyghurs, uh, when that treatment has been classified by the United States as a genocide, when a UN report classifies it as a crime against humanity, why, after multiple questions, Mr. Beckerman refused to address that? Are you afraid? of the Chinese Communist government? No, because you, you can find that content that on our platform. Any content that our users want well, why to express their views on this issue is freely policy, available on our the platform. The guy who's head of public policy for the Americas and, and, and an American, on an American television news channel, why couldn't he say, why couldn't he condemn that? I think it's very important to look at our platform and if you use our, and open our app I'm not and search for platform. any I'm content. I'm asking about your personnel now. Because personnel is policy. Everybody in this room understands that, except maybe you. C C personnel is profit. Let me, let me just conclude with this. Uh, and I hate to bring this up, because I, this is part of the stuff that I've studied, but deception is fundamental to the Chinese Communist Party's political intelligence and military strategy. And you have repeatedly used the word transparency throughout this hearing. And every time you've said it, what I've heard is deception. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes 
Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Vesey, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I got to tell you, Mr. Chu, um, as a uh, father of a 16-year-old that uh, likes social media, uh, uh, the, a lot of your evasiveness today in answering many of these questions really disturbs me. Uh, because I can tell you that uh, the teenagers of today, they really don't want to be on Facebook. They, 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 want, they want your platform. And you were asked to come before this committee uh, to testify about many things, and, and a lot of us are worried about our kids' uh, personal data. Um, as the co-chair of the Congressional Voting Rights Caucus, I also worry that uh, TikTok uh, is the world's most powerful and, and extensive propaganda machine, uh, allowing the Chinese Communist Party to use TikTok's platform to influence public opinion and undermine the integrity of our democratic elections. And I have a report uh, called TikTok and Facebook Failed to Detect election disinformation in the US while YouTube succeeds. And this report was published by the nonprofit Global Witness and the Cybersecurity for Democracy team at uh, NYU. And the purpose of the study was to test platforms like TikTok uh, and whether or not they can detect and take down <laughs> false political ads targeted at US voters, young voters, uh, ahead of last year's midterm elections. And according to this report, 90% of election disinformation ads tested were approved by your platform. Again, uh, that is 90% of ads containing false and misleading election misinformation uh, went undetected on TikTok. Uh, and just to add some color to the type of misleading ads that were approved by TikTok, uh, this included ads that were live on TikTok that said the wrong election day uh, and actually encouraged people uh, to vote twice. You do know that voting twice is a felony. Mr. Chu, you do know that it's legal to vote twice. Congressman, um, any misinformation that comes around pol um, a political okay. election is uh, something we take very seriously. Let me, um, I I'm particularly troubled about this type of information uh, uh, because it can run rampant on TikTok. And given that TikTok, again, uh, y'all are appealing to a very young and diverse user base that is exactly uh, the people that we've seen targeted time and time again with uh, voter suppression campaigns run by malicious actors. Uh, Mr. Chu, do you agree with me that, is, that it is completely unacceptable that 90% of these ads were undetected on your platform? Uh, and can you detail for us right now TikTok's policy regarding election misinformation and paid political ads and how the company monitors such information and how you plan to get that number down to zero? While TikTok is a place for our users to come and express their points of views freely, uh, we do take misinformation, dangerous misinformation, particularly around an election, very seriously. And we will work with third party experts to identify mis, um, uh, misinformation. You, you, you and call allowing 90% of false content, political content uh, on your platform to be taken, call, you call that, you define that as being taken seriously? I, I, um, I need to look into the specifics. I, I'm, I'm you know, not sure where the number came from, but I can tell you, Congressman, that we are the only platform that I know of that doesn't actually take political ads. Uh, we don't, we don't accept money. I don't think other platforms can say that. Mr. Chu, can you detail how you responded to that report? Did you respond to that report that I just mentioned? I, I need to look at the specifics of the okay. report, Congressman, and I'll, I can get back to you on that. All right. Mr. Chu, I, I want to shift to uh, Project Texas. Uh, I know that we've discussed this initiative throughout today's hearing, but I want to dive deeper into your notion that promises about Project Texas uh, should give us any confidence in TikTok's ability to localize U.S. data uh, and discontinue access uh, to that data uh, to ByteDance employees in China. Uh, why? Because we've already had a TikTok executive appear, appear before Congress and give sworn testimony about the comfort that we should take in TikTok's uh, U.S.-based resources. Well, TikTok uh, uh, data security practices were being scrutinized by the U.S. government, and unfortunately, uh, we've since found out uh, from a uh, uh, from journalists and recorded conversations uh, that those assurances were uh, were worthless. Uh, in your testimony, you also mentioned that Oracle has already begun inspecting TikTok's source code and has access to the platform's recommendation algorithm. Uh, why should this give the American public uh, any great assurances, particularly uh, given uh, that Oracle now owns a stake in TikTok and stands to gain monetarily? Uh, the more revenue that TikTok and its algorithm generates. Congressman, not only is Project Texas unprecedented in our industry in protecting U.S. user data and interests, 
we are inviting third parties to come in and monitor this, and we will you know, be transparent in that process. And this is more beyond most com all companies that I know of in my industry. Thank you, Madam so Chair. I'm out of time. Gentlemen, yield back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida for five minutes, Mr. Dunn. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Mr. Chu, I'm aware that on arriving in uh, D.C. this week, you appeared on TikTok and posted you had 150 million U.S. users, 5 million U.S. businesses. That, that represents a lot of data. You also referenced your appearance before this committee as a chance to share all that TikTok is doing to protect Americans using the app. Mr. Chu, has ByteDance spied on Americans at the direction of the Chinese Communist Party? No. Uh, I, Madam Chair, I'd like to enter into the record uh, this October 20th, 22, Forbes article entitled, TikTok Parent Bite Dance Plan to Use TikTok to Monitor the Physical Location of Specific U.S. Citizens. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Uh, it, the project assigned the, this to a Beijing leaded team, and they were going to follow individual American citizens. I ask you again, Mr. Chu, has Bike dance spied on American citizens. I don't think the spying is the right way to describe it. Right. This is ultimately we can differ uh, on this that. Is, this is ultimately an internal Any investigation. Any TikTok or bite dance data that is viewed, stored, or passes through China is subject to the laws of China. One party authoritarian state hostile to all American standards of privacy. China's court system reports to and falls under the Chinese Communist Party. And like fentanyl analogs, which we all know are also manufactured in China, although they are illegal there, I fear TikTok will, TikTok will grow into a much bigger problem, a cancer, if you will. And I'm deeply worried that it may be too late to stop the spread of this cancer. Like fentanyl, another China export, which causes addiction and death, dangerous algorithms and Chinese Communist Party are not good for Americans, not good for our families and definitely not good for the United States. Mr. Chu, prior to serving as the CFO of ByteDance, you served as a CFO and Director of Global Operations for Show Me from 2015 to 21. Is that correct? Are you asking me in 2015? Very good. Would you mind repeating that, please? Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, uh, enter another article into evidence. Uh, uh, this is from uh, the National Cybersecurity Center in Lithuania. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. This report outlines numerous data security risks, including how the privacy of European users was violated in clear cases of unauthorized collection of user data by ShowMe. This sounds exactly what many of my colleagues have been talking about today. Worse yet, the ShowMe phones sold to Europeans had a list of 449 words and phrases which would be automatically censored on the device Censored phrases included the voice of America and democratic movement, among others. This analysis was conducted on devices which were manufactured and sold to Europeans while you were the head of operations for Show Me. It does not follow that you expect us to believe that you would not censor on behalf of the Chinese Communist Party, since you've already done so. I want to be unequivocal on this. We do not remove or promote time. content on behalf While of TikTok, the Chinese government. TikTok, in your words, strives to deliver on their mission to inspire creativity and bring joy to American users, I assure you that is not the mission or goal of the Chinese Communist Party, which runs the People's Republic of China, that TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, is domiciled in. Mr. Congressman, Chief, you can so check with our users things, to see the, the experience that they're getting. Answer. You have not given straightforward answers. We don't find you credible on these things. Uh, and uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'd like to yield the balance. Congressman, you have given me no Mr. time Obernolte to answer your questions. California. I reject the characterizations. I yield it to Mr. Obernolte. To? Dr. Dunn? Mr. Obernolte? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Chu, I'd like to continue our discussion of Project Texas, if we could. Part of Project Texas is that engineers at Oracle will review the algorithms used by TikTok to confirm that they're free of foreign influence. Uh, I have a question about that because we're talking about uh, AI, that's a very generic term. Do you use machine learning to influence the uh, algorithms at, at TikTok? 
In, uh, this gets very technical, and we have published uh, several blogs about this, which I can forward to your team. Okay. Um, but yes, it's mainly based on interest signals. Right, okay, like, so, yeah. so here's my question. How could looking at the algorithm confirm that it's for, free from foreign influence? Because the algorithm is just a neural net architecture with inputs and outputs and weights, <laughs> and how to train that. I mean, the, the influence is an external factor. So uh, I'd appreciate it if you could, if you could give us, uh, I see we're out of time again, uh, a written answer to that. But uh, again, I am concerned that what you're proposing with Project Texas just doesn't have the technical capability of providing us the assurances that we need. I yield back, Madam Chair. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes Ms. Custer. Ms. Custer is not here. Ms. Barragon for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Chu, TikTok warns users when content is graphic or disturbing and labels state-affiliated media accounts to ensure the viewers aren't seeing propaganda. Does TikTok provide similar information to Spanish speakers, users, as well as English speakers? I believe so, Congresswoman. I, I will get back to you on that. Okay, and do you know if TikTok has a specific strategy for tackling Spanish language content that violates its trust and safety guidelines? Uh, we do. I will get back to you on the specifics uh, on that. Okay. Uh, when offensive English language search terms or hashtags are blocked for violating community guidelines in English, is the Spanish translation of the term or the hashtag automa automatically blocked as well? Uh, I, I believe so, but let me check the specifics and get back to you. Do you have any idea how many people that you might have working at TikTok that addresses Spanish misinformation? I know ballpark, it's um, quite a significant team, but I can get back to you on the, on the details. You said significant, so are you saying it's, do you have a ballpark at all you can give us? Would you say it's like 10% of your force or more it's than? It's an important number, so I want to be precise and I'll get back to you. Do you happen to know how TikTok, how if a TikTok can effectively ensure that Spanish speaking users between the ages of 13 and 17 are not being targeted by ads promoting harmful content? We have very strict policies for our users who are in the teenage age group, and um, regardless of what language they speak. So we want to make sure that they are given a very safe experience on our platform, regardless of the language they Well, I know, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm trying to, to ascertain resources you may be putting into um, Spanish speaking and Spanish language. Last year, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus met with TikTok. This was one of the conversations and the source of um, the discussion was addressing Spanish language disinformation and misinformation. It remains an urgent priority for the Congressional Hispanic Caucus as Hispanics across the country increasingly turn to social media for vital information. We heard earlier in this hearing that there was you know, video, um, there was a, a TikTok post threatening uh, the chair of the committee, and it took some 40 days uh, to take it down. So I guess I'm a little concerned. Um, if you, if your team doesn't have the resources and the capability to flag that, what kind of capability is it going to have to bring down misinformation, disinformation to Spanish speakers, which I'm assuming is a, a smaller a fraction of the workers that you have at TikTok? Uh, TikTok is a place for you know, all our users to come and express their very diverse views. And you know, we, we are open to all ethnicities, you know, and we are open to all, uh, everyone to come here and express their, freely express their views. So it is our commitment to make sure that the safety of those users, regardless of the language, you know, and of course, you know, the Spanish language uh, user base is super important to us. Okay, we so need to make sure that we continue to okay, invest Okay, so you, in don't, you don't have an answer then. Okay, I, I will look forward in, in your coming, your coming back. Um, we've heard a lot about the, the concerns um, about children um, who may be on TikTok. Um, Mr. Chu, at what age do you think it would be appropriate for um, a young person to um, get on TikTok? We have three different experiences here in the United States. Uh, there is an experience for under 13s, which is I'm highly, highly restricted. You, I'm asking what you think would be the appropriate age to have a child get on TikTok? Our approach is to give differentiated experiences for different age groups and let the parents have these conversations with their children to decide what's best for their family. So you think that there is a sufficient um, safety mechanism for an eight-year-old
to be able to access TikTok. An ADO's experience on TikTok will be so highly restricted that every single piece of content he or she will see will be vetted by Common Sense, our third party child safety expert, and um, the, the ADO will not be able to post and the ADO will not be able to see any personalized feed and zero advertising in that experience. So I believe, yes, it is the appropriate experience for an ADO. Well, then why don't you let your eight-year-old child on TikTok? I have seen these news articles. I would like to address that. My kids live in Singapore, and in Singapore, we do not have the under-13 uh, experience. If they lived here in the United States, I will let them use the under-13 experience. Okay, so you're saying it's because of the country you live in it doesn't have the same mechanisms. Is there a reason you don't have those same mechanisms everywhere? Uh, in, in principle, we want to provide you know, a good experience for our users in general. We don't, we don't want to monetize from people who are under 13. In the US, we are COPA compliant. And as part of that, we will deem as a, I, I want to get this specifics right. I want, we will deem as a particular uh, type of audience, mixed audience app. I want to make sure that that's right. And um, as a result of that, we have to provide an experience to our under 13 users in this country as well. My time has expired. Thank you. I yield back. He yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Curtis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Chu, my children are getting ready to run a marathon, and I noted during this hearing that they'll be running for about the same amount of time that you'll be sitting uh, in that chair today. Unfortunately, I only get you for five minutes, so instead of a marathon, I'd like to do a sprint uh, with you. And I want to... I want to go back up to that 30,000 feet level. W would you agree with me that Section 230 was created to protect platforms like yours from lawsuits when you distribute information? I, I Don't overcomplicate it, just like 30,000 feet, yeah. yeah. So then would you agree that there's a line drawn between publishers of, of information and distributors of information? In, I, in specifically in the Section 230 language. I think 230 is a very complex yes. topic. I understand, yeah. but remember we're at 30,000 feet. So in short, your platform distributes content that other people's publish. One of the early challengers to Section 230 was when AOL refused to take down a post of somebody that had inappropriately put a phone number, associated a phone number with the Oklahoma City bombings. The courts ruled that AOL was not liable uh, for that post because of Section 230. Now, I want you to do a hypothetical with me because I'm, I'm gonna use the absurd to try to make a point here. Let's suppose hypothetically that um, AOL, instead of just posting that, actually um, in magnif wanted to magnify that voice and so they took out an ad in the Wall Street Journal linking that phone number with the Oklahoma City bombing. And, and let's suppose they didn't stop there but they went further and they took out a Super Bowl ad linking that phone number with the Oklahoma City bombing. And let's suppose, hypothetically, they didn't stop there. They sent a flyer to every home in America linking that phone number to the, the bombing. And I guess the question is, would AOL have moved from a distributor to a publisher in this made-up example? Uh, Congressman, I, I, I think, respectfully, I, I, I... I think everybody yeah, can see that they would. To, this is not a hard question. Moving that far away from the intent would have moved them to a publisher. So my question is, is platforms are protected because they post content, but, but I want this room to see, not just you, the protection has limits. And if ALL moves to a distributor instead of a publisher, they, they go outside of those limits. Now let's talk algorithms just super quickly. Uh, we've thrown that word around uh, a lot today. Let me, let me here again go 30,000 feet and we'll use another platform uh, so it's so it's not sensitive, but Pinterest. I like to go on Pinterest. My home and I, wife and I are building a home, working on the yard right now. If you went on a, my Pinterest page, you would see swing sets and things made for my grandkids. Now, another hypothetical. Let's suppose that there's some devious intent inside Pinterest, and they decide they want to influence John Curtis with these algorithms, and they want me to believe it's the end of the world. And all of a sudden, now I'm buying bomb shelters instead of swing sets for my kids. Have they become a publisher? and I should not be protected from Section 230. And if you don't feel, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure the room understands that they have crossed this line, and you, you can tell me if you think they have or not. Uh, Congressman, I, I will have to study that specific example and, and get back it's to It's a hypothetical, but you yeah. can see the, at some point they've crossed the line and they have become a publisher and a distributor. So we've touched on this today, but I wanna be super specific. Is it possible that TikTok had enough data, could get enough data on me 
that you could use artificial intelligence and your algorithms and, and machine learning to write an algorithm that could persuade me to change how I view a policy issue. Does I, that possibility exist? The, the way we look at it- 30,000 feet, yeah, I, the, uh, we're on a sprint. I will stay very high level. Um, okay, the way yes. we look at it is our users come in and express whatever views okay, they but want. But that's not the point. The point yeah. is you could write an algorithm that would change. And we've actually seen the Washington Post reported the Stop the Willow campaign shows how TikTokers are tackling climate change. I think that's all fine, right, and all good, unless somebody has interjected into that and magnified or diminished voices in that. And, and what I'm proposing to you today is that that pushes them across, across the line from a distributor to a publisher if they make those decisions. Now, serious allegations have been made against your platform and others, many of them here today, and you're not new to these, right, to these allegations. This isn't your platform, but uh, some time ago, there, were, there was an allegation that a platform uh, recommended ISIS-related videos. We've talked about the weight loss uh, videos. We talked about we didn't talk about it, but they're still in the elections. Whatever the motivation, I'm trying to point out that as you move from a publisher, by as you manipulate this data with algorithms, that you step out from the protections of text, Section 230. Do you see that logic? Uh, this, this is a very complex uh, I understand it's very argument. complex, but yeah. you see the logic. In your mind, has TikTok ever stepped across the line from a distributor to a publisher? Congressman, again, this is a very complex topic. I, I will need to get back to you I on this. I understand that. Okay, and finally, you very quickly, you produced a, a, a video that now is well known about your visit here and today in Washington, D.C. Can you tell me 100% that no TikTok employees manually manipulated that to get more views? I, I, I checked, and as far as I know, there was no boosting and heating. I went viral <laughs> organically. Okay, Madam Chair, I'm sorry I'm out of time. I yield my time. Gentleman yields back. <coughs> Chair recognizes Ms. Blunt Rochester, five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Chu, as I'm sure you know, this hearing is part of an ongoing effort by our committee to examine data security and other concerns with social media companies broadly. And I have to tell you, I came to this hearing interested to hear the actions that TikTok is taking to combat misinformation, protect our young people, and ensure our national security. But I, I've not been reassured by anything you've said so far. And I think, quite frankly, um, your testimony has raised more questions for me uh, than answers. As some of my colleagues already noted, platforms like TikTok can easily manipulate and undermine user autonomy with addictive features, invasive data collection practices, and disseminating misinformation and disinformation. That's why I will be reintroducing the Detour Act to mitigate this harm. Mr. Chu, yes or no, would you oppose legislation that banned the use of intentionally manip manipulative design techniques that trick users into giving up their personal information? In principle, uh, it's just a yes or no. In principle, I agree that that kind of practices is not. And can TikTok not users opt out of targeted ads? Yes or no? At this moment in time, we believe that this is a very important part of the experience. Yes or no? Time is ticking. It is an important part of the experience. If, even if someone wants targeted ads, um, do you give a user a clear opportunity to prevent TikTok from using tools like Pixels to collect their data and track them off of the TikTok platform? We give our users a lot of tools to control their privacy settings on our app. And by the way, if you're below 16, it's private by default. So you cannot even go viral. In no, August of 2022, response um, to a letter I wrote to your company on abortion misinformation, TikTok asserted several actions to address abortion misinformation. In light of recent attacks on safe and effective medication abortion, I am remained worried uh, by this misinformation. And following on Ms. DeGette's questioning, how many posts did you actually take down that contained abortion misinformation? Um, Contents on views on both sides of the um, on abortion is allowed on our platform is just freedom of expression. If it's dangerous misinformation, we rely on third party experts to help us identify and remove them. I can get back to you on specifics. Yes, on, please on get back members. with us yeah. on the specifics. Um, Mr. Chu, in your testimony, you indicated TikTok has taken several steps to implement Project Texas. 
You've said you've spent, uh, in your testimony, $1.5 billion. You've hired 1,500 full-time employees. Can I ask for some specifics about the implementation? Um, this $1.5 billion, what was it used for? The employees, were they people that you already had that you just transferred over? And what types of roles will they have? Oh, okay. Um, this uh, billion and a half US dollars is spread across many things, including the infrastructure we have to build, the migration of the data to a new cloud infrastructure, you know, and all the third party security partners that we're hiring, and of course the new uh, employees. Now this team will now be run by a gentleman who used to be this, um, who, who has spent his career uh, uh, as a chief security officer in other companies, uh, and another gentleman who used to work, I believe in um, if you could just follow national, up yeah. with us, that would be very helpful. I, I will. I because will. we would really like to understand the details. Where's the money going? How many people are, and what will they be doing? Okay. You know, as I put just kind of a finer point on this, one of my concerns is that we came here hoping to hear some actions that would alleviate some of our concerns and our fears. We got family members. We have a lot of folks here that are constituents, that are content creators. And for us, we were looking for action. We wanted to see, make us feel like we really can trust as you use the word. What I leave here with is thinking about the fact that your company is, I, I learned that you're, you have personalized data uh, advertising for kids as young as 13. And we've heard until Project Texas is supposedly stood up, engineers in China still have access to personal data. And that that means engineers in China have access to personal data of 13 year olds in the United States. And I think that really summarizes why you see so much bipartisan consensus and concern about your company. And I imagine that it's not going away anytime soon. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. General Lady yields back. Yield to the lady from Arizona, Ms. Lesko, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Chu, do you agree that the Chinese government has persecuted the Uyghur population? Congresswoman, you, if you use our app and you open it, you will find our users who that's give not, all sorts of content. That's not my question. My question is, do you agree that the Chinese government has persecuted the Uyghur population? Well. It's deeply concerning to hear about all accounts of human rights abuse. My role here is to explain what our platform does evasive. on this. It's a pretty easy question. Do you agree that the Chinese government has persecuted the Uyghur population? Congresswoman, I'm here to describe TikTok and what we do as a platform. And as all a right. platform, we allow our users to freely express all their right. views on this issue Earlier and any today, other issue that matters to them. Well, you didn't answer the question. Earlier today, Chairman Rogers asked you, and I quote, have any moderation tools been used to remove content associated with the Uyghur genocide, yes or no? Your answer, we do not remove that kind of content. Yet, in 2019, TikTok suspended the account of Feroza Aziz, an American 17-year-old, after she put out a video about the Uyghur genocide. So, your answer, sir, does not align with history. That particular I, case was a mismoderation. I believe I, that video had a picture of Osama bin Laden. So no, we thought it was content no, that was inappropriate. I, yeah, I looked it up. That was a different post that they banned. TikTok I can get back banned. on the specifics, yes. Uh, my next question. India banned the use of TikTok in their country in 2020. New Zealand has banned the installation of TikTok on devices connected to the country's parliamentary network. Canada banned the installation of TikTok on government devices. The United Kingdom has banned the TikTok app from government-owned devices. Belgium banned the TikTok from government phones. The European Union banned the installation of TikTok on government devices. All cited security risks with the company's data collection and connection to the Chinese Communist Party. Recently, our US FBI Director Christopher Wray said about TikTok, quote, this is a tool that is ultimately within the control of the Chinese government, and it, to me, it screams out with national security concerns. Mr. Chu, how can all of these countries and our own FBI director have been wrong? I think a lot of risks that are pointed out are hypothetical and theoretical risks. Um, I have not seen any evidence 
I'm you know, eagerly wait, awaiting discussions where we can talk about evidence and we then can address the concerns that are being raised. Yes, my next question revolves around an article, India banned TikTok in 2020. In March 21st, Forbes article revealed how troves of personal data of Indian citizens who once used TikTok remain widely accessible to employees at the company and its Beijing-based parent ByteDance. A current TikTok employee told Forbes that nearly anyone with basic access to company tools, including employees in China, can easily look up the closest contacts and other sensitive information about any user. This tic current TikTok employee also said, quote, if you want to start a movement, if you want to divide people, if you want to do any of the operation to influence the public on the app, you can just use that information to target those groups. Why would a, Mr. Chu, why would a current TikTok employee say this if it wasn't true? This is a recent article. I have asked my team to look into it. As far as I know, there is, we have rigorous uh, data access protocols. There's really no such thing where anybody can uh, get access to tools. All right. So I disagree with a lot of the conclusions Ma of that. Madam Chair, I request unanimous consent that the Forbes March 21st, 2023 article be added to the record. Without objection. And I have, um, would like to turn over the rest of my time to Mr. Abernolte. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Chu, I'd like to continue asking the, the question that uh, we were uh, ran out of time last time. So as part of Project Texas, you're going to have engineers at Oracle review the algorithms, the machine learning algorithms that TikTok uses to ensure that they're free from foreign influence. But as you and I were discussing, uh, reviewing the algorithms doesn't do anything. The algorithms were simple. That's not where the secret sauce is. The secret sauce is in the data used to train them and the outcomes that you're asking them to predict. Would you agree with that? No, I actually believe that with third-party monitoring, you can identify a lot of uh, the motivation of the code. And with enough uh, third-party expert, you can identify a lot of what the code is designed to do. But how would, so you, I, how, would you, uh, how would you verify that you couldn't ask the algorithm for a different outcome than the one that uh, the, the rest of the source code is asking for? The, the algorithm will be trained with this, again, it's very technical, but it will be trained based on weights, for example. And, and those are things that we can verify. You know, okay. what ways are well, you putting on likes? If you could give us a written response to that, I'd appreciate it because I'm interested. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Uh, lady yields back. Gentleman, general lady yields back. Chair recognizes for five minutes. Gentleman from Florida, Mr. Soto. Thank you, Madam Chair. The genie's really out of the bottle on this now, so to speak. 150 million Americans are now on TikTok. That's almost half of America. They're expressing themselves in art and music, poetry, short film, comedy, among other creative expressions, and many of them are inspiring, talented young people. Uh, but we also on the committee recognize there's a darker side to it, right? Violence, adult themes, drug and alcohol, sexualization, suicide, all major issues on TikTok, but also Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and other social media uh, platforms. Uh, so the solution, as I see it, is to regulate TikTok and other social media platforms. And that job, uh, Mr. Chu, as you know, really falls to us. Uh, there are real concerns, bipartisan common ground we've already had. We had a, a federal device ban that was voted on bipartisan in the omnibus. And uh, I co-introduced a bill with my dear friend, uh, Representative Kamek, about notices of that federal ban. Um, Madam Chair, I think the first key is privacy. We have to pass the comprehensive legislation that got out of this community but eluded us in the last Congress. I'm really hoping we can get that done, and I'm really uh, excited about hearing that from folks. The other thing is that TikTok needs to be an American company with American values and, and its ties to the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, this is something that'll be critical as we look and go forward. And then three, we all agree we have to protect our kids. The committee should consider banning the use for children under 13 of not just TikTok, but all social media platforms, or at least empower parents. Uh, in addition, have rules of the road for teens that are 13 to 17 so that families can do what's right for their Family. So for privacy, that's on us. Internet privacy is on us. 
As far as uh, being an American company, M Mr. Chu, you, as you know, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States at the Department of Treasury uh, reviews foreign investment that affects national security. Right now, they've negotiated with your company about this Oracle setup that you've talked about, servers in an American company in, in America and Texas, and then Oracle would monitor the algorithms. But pressure's mounting. So, Mr. Chu, would TikTok be prepared to divest from ByteDance and uh, Chinese Communist Party ties if the Department of Treasury instructed you all to do so? Uh, Congressman, I said in my opening statement, I think we are need to address the problem of privacy. I agree with you. I don't think ownership is the issue here. With a lot of respect, American social companies don't have a good track record with data privacy and user security. I mean, look at Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. Just one example. So, so uh, I, I do think that you know it is not about the ownership. It is a lot about making sure we have Project Texas, making sure that we're protecting and firewalling U.S. user data from unwanted foreign access, giving third parties to come in to have a look at this, and making sure that everybody is comfortable. We're giving transparency and third-party monitoring, and that's what we're doing for Project Texas. Well, I would at least encourage you all to start having the dialogue. Should that be? where uh, the president and the Congress ends up going. The, the, the third thing is on, on parents. I, I had a, a constituent of mine, Brandy of Lake Nona, say I'm a parent of two teenagers, 14 and 18 years old, both of whom have been harmed by social media. TikTok's algorithms supply my 14-year-old son with a continuous stream of inappropriate content and has negatively influenced his perception of all females. I noticed the attention span of both of my teens has changed or decreased dramatically. And social media has made my daughter insecure, leading to an eating disorder and ultimately depression. What safeguards do you have and what should we tell uh, Brandy of Lake Nona uh, about how we can help her protect her children? Uh, we have a differentiated experience. Uh, I mentioned just now about the experience if you're below 13, very, very restricted. If you're below 13 to 17, Congressman, we actually have a whole series of things. First, the content that you see, um, you know, we make sure that we remove things that could be mature themes from your, from your feed. We also, by default, do not allow under 16s to use direct messaging. We do not allow under 16s to, we, we set their accounts to private by default. They can go viral. If you're below 18, we shut off some features for you. Like, for example, you're not allowed to post live streams. Neither are you allowed to uh, send virtual gifts. So we take this very seriously, and we want to continue to build to ensure that we're giving our under 18 teenagers on our platform. Although they, today they are only a minority of our, of our user base today, but we still take it very seriously. Mr. Chu, I'd encourage you to continue thinking about how to get the word out to parents across the nation on some of these tools as well, as we here craft a privacy law that will help provide well-needed regulation to social media companies across the nation. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Pence, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Rogers and Ranking Member Pallone for holding this hearing. I love both of your opening remarks. Like my colleagues have discussed today, our increasingly digital world leaves Hoosiers and all Americans in the dark about who has access to their information. For TikTok users, that could be third-party data brokers, advertisers, or the Chinese Communist Party. TikTok aggressively feeds addictive content to users to glean massive amounts of personal data that's worth a fortune. For Hoosiers watching at home, this isn't just data about your favorite sports team. You know, if there really are 150 million users in the U.S., this suggests to me that the CCP has a finger on the pulse of almost half our nation's population. I find that hard to believe. But this week, I decided I would ask my constituents in southern Indiana to share their stories with me. Went out Monday night, and we got 800 responses in less than 12 hours, okay? Let me share a couple of those with you. One of my constituents shared, I quote, I'm a mental health counselor. Most of my teenage clients are on TikTok. They spend hours online being negatively influenced by others. I have seen kids experience self-harm, gender dysphoria, and many mental illnesses they have picked up from TikTok. I will not allow my children to have TikTok. The, the creators know the algorithms are addicting our children. They know that children are suffering more anxiety and depression from scream time, but they do not care. They will not change their algorithms because it's financially lucrative 
for them to keep their kids addicted. Another parent said, we let our child, our daughter try it out. The feed was continuously suggesting sexually explicit, stupid, and vulgar videos. We discontinued it within a week. And there's been many more, many more. Like I said, 800, okay? In your testimony, Mr. Chu, you walk through a number of supposed actions taken by your company to create a safe environment, empower parents to oversee content shown to their children. But virtually everything we've heard reflects the opposite, and some of your, some of your answers are a little confusing. You know, all of those sitting here and maybe watching on C-SPAN, this is the 32nd hearing we have held about privacy and big tech. Each hearing I've been part of, we've heard the same stories about our constituents' experience and the same promises for big tech to do better. The truth of the matter is this disgusting and dangerous content littered across your platform is not justifiable and it's uncontrollable. Americans' data is not safe, and big tech is doing nothing to protect it. Putting aside the dangers of the CCP involvement, and after these 32 hearings, I believe it's actually time to change the narrative, change the focus, and change the outcome by talking about the money you're making at TikTok. Mr. Chu, I have a question. How much revenue is generated per user? Congressman, we... Um, we'll private company and yeah, you're not going to tell yes. me. Does each user receive a comparable benefit for the amount of profit their data brings to your company? Uh, we do sh share some revenue with some creators who produce, um, say, one minute plus informative Thanks. content. When am I going to get paid for the data that you are selling or you're, have, you're getting revenue from advertisers? When am I going get to get paid for the data you're getting from my children, my grandchildren, my neighbors? I think that's the only way to get your attention, is talk about the money you're making, and maybe that'll get you all to do what you're supposed to do. I, I respect and understand your opinion. Um, the vast majority of our users have a great experience. I sent a video recently as well. I got hundreds of thousands of comments. But what am I getting? A, it's yeah. a great experience. What about these 800 bad experiences that people in the Indiana 6th District have been getting? We will look into them, and a lot You're of. You're going to look into it, but this is my thirty. This is a thirty-second big tech hearing, and you're always going to look at it. Frankly, I think you're all stalling. Is what you're doing. You're just trying to buy time while you're making the eighteen billion, perhaps whatever you're making. I um, the majority of our users have a great experience on our platform. It is our duty to keep it safe. I. I agree with you. That's why our commitment is to make sure that safety I, I think is a priority it's, for I think it's your duty to pay attention to what you're doing, and maybe maybe you you paying people for the information that you're getting from her is a way to get that done. Thank you. You back. The gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Washington, Ms. Schreier, for five minutes. Thank you for being here, Mr. Chu. I, I'm really concerned about everything that we are hearing in this conversation today, and I appreciate your good intentions, but the actions are really falling short. Uh, as a pediatrician and the parent of a teenager, I'm particularly concerned about how social media generally, and TikTok specifically, is affecting our kids and teens. We just heard a lot about this from testimony from a psychologist. Uh, last year, the American Academy of Pediatrics sounded the alarm about our children's mental health crisis. And as a pediatrician, I know this has been going on uh, for more than a decade. In fact, it tracks perfectly with social media engagement. And during the pandemic, teens who were missing out on in-person interactions turned even more to social media to connect with friends. Social media is designed to be addicting. That's the business model. And your platform is the most addictive of all. And this endless, mindless scrolling takes teens away from human relationships. And here's what's important. It keeps teens awake all night, well past their bedtime, at a time in their lives when sleep is critical for brain and physical development. In fact, sleep deprivation alone, ignoring even content alone, can cause depression, anxiety, social withdrawal, inattention, poor coping skills, and academic failure. 
Um, so Mr. Chu, I just want to follow up a little bit on what my colleague Mr. Sarbanes was discussing. Um, it is your business model to keep eyes on the app, to keep it addictive. I know you likely have experts uh, who have advised you on how to design this to keep those eyes on your platform for the longest possible time. So I want to know if you have psychologists or other health experts on staff looking at screen time, hours of use, and sleep. We worked with the Digital Wellness Lab, Congresswoman, and at, at the Boston Children's Hospital, and we came up with a 60-minute um, default limit for any users under 18. We okay, were the first so to do it in a, our industry. That is an opt-out, uh, and I can tell you, they're going to immediately opt out. It is addictive. <laughs> it's we like also give tools. A chain smoker not to take the next cigarette. It is not going to happen. And by the way, um, so f first I have a question, then I'll go, go back to Boston Children's. Um, Mr. Sarbanes asked earlier, what is the percentage of teens? who actually adhere to the 60-minute limit. I would need to check on those numbers and get back to you on specifics. I'd appreciate those numbers. Yes. I'm guessing it is an incredibly low percentage who actually heed that. Now, as far as Boston Children's goes, I know you're referring to them as a source for these ideas about get, you know, go outside, get some air, take some time out. Um, but I can tell you as a pediatrician, I'm guessing their suggestions were a little stronger than that. And so I'm wondering what, the, what is the next step? What are you doing when you find out that almost nobody is really opting out after 60 minutes to take this burden off of the kids and off of the parents and change your algorithms to make them not so hooked? We give our parents, as you pointed out, um, the, family safe, the family pairing tool. And in that tool, if you pair it with your teenager's phone, you can actually set a restriction, how many minutes. And I, we believe it's very important for parents to have these conversations with their teenagers so to decide what's best for their family. I also, Congresswoman, I, a lot of the people come to our platform to have a really informative experience. Like I said, there were 116 billion pieces of content on STEM. And we're, we're creating a feed dedicated to that. Book Talk has we've 115 also, billion. We've also heard today that well over 20% of the information is misinformation. We heard that about uh, medical remedies that are not really remedies. We've heard it about mental health topics. I mean, this becomes very dangerous, especially when people who are not trained to think very critically are being given information and thinking that it's true. And you've said many times that the destructive information isn't available to kids, but it is. Like, we keep seeing examples here. And so I'm just wondering, what are you going to do with the algorithms? I mean, just because you're removing something that says anorexia, bulimia, or eating disorder, that doesn't do it. If you show girls repeatedly skinny bodies and advice on how to cook meals that are less than 300 calories, that's dangerous. We, uh, we have worked with, first of all, uh, all, anything that glorifies eating disorders, we remove that from our platform, it's violative. We're working with experts now. It's a challenging problem for our industry. But we are actually identify some, identifying some of these themes that you're talking about and trying to build models where that kind of content is not chained up for the younger users. So it's something we take very seriously too. We're seeing eating disorders in elementary age kids now, and I need you to expedite that process as much as possible because parents out there are worried, and I'm worried as a pediatrician. Parents can't take themselves off of these platforms. Kids, there's no way they're gonna take themselves off, and we need you to do your part. It may affect your bottom line, but it could save this generation. I, I, I share your concerns and I commit to doing back. more. Gentlelady yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Joyce. Thank you, Chair Rogers and Ranking Member Pallone for holding this hearing. According to an August 2022 article in the New York Times, TikTok's in-app web browser can track every individual keystroke made by a user. We have heard today about the various ways in which the app's code could be used to monitor or track users. And likewise, we've heard concerns that this data may not be fully isolated from access by the Chinese Communist Party. That said, I'd like to know more about the historical non-public US personal data that your company has already amassed. Mr. Chu, you have publicly stated that the non-public information of TikTok users in the United States is being transferred to an Oracle-based cloud infrastructure because of safety concerns. Will that be completed by the end of this week, by the end of this month? What's the outline for uh, dealing with that data that you've already amassed? 
Uh, all new data is already stored by default in this Oracle Cloud infrastructure with the no, I'm talking about the data that you've already amassed. Uh, we, we are in the process of deleting. What timeline will that data be, be able to be stored? We will, we, I believe we'll be able to get it done this year. I'm hiring. This year, thank you. It's not going to occur anytime soon. To be clear, until that data transfer happens, user data remains accessible to the Chinese Communist Party. On March 1st of this year, the committee asked you when you plan to delete non-public historical U.S. user data. Are you aware of this? Congressman, I disagree with this assessment that the Chinese government can get access to the data. It's really for, uh, look, this is a private company. This is what empl Chinese employees. You responded. You responded in writing to this committee. I have the response that we got back from you on March 7, just six days later. Your attorneys wrote, the company, I'm quoting, the company plans to begin the process of deleting non-public historic U.S. user data this month and anticipates that the process will be completed this year. You came up with a supposed plan in the summer of 2022, specifically based on our concerns that the communist Chinese government was spying on U.S. users. But you only just came up with the idea to delete historic non-public U.S. data just two weeks ago? Let me read it again. On March 7th, your attorneys wrote, and I quote, the company plans to begin the process of deleting non-public historical U.S. data this month and anticipates that the process will be completed this year. Mr. Chu, did you just come up with this plan only because we asked about it on March 1st? No, we started deleting this. Well, because that's what it looks like to me. We, we hired a third party to help us with this. Wouldn't you agree that awaiting even minutes for this personal privacy protection is absolutely wrong and it is not in the best interest of your users? Uh, Congressman, respectfully, there are many companies that use a global workforce. We are not the only one. We are just taking action after hearing Given the concerns. delay Many in other deleting companies this have data not. and what we've already established about the ability of the Chinese Communist Party to access personal user data, would you agree that no U.S. government electronic devices should have access to TikTok platform as your lackluster security currently stands? I disagree with that characterization. Like I said, you think the US... that any individual should be utilizing that on any government platform? I think the government devices shouldn't have no social media apps, to be honest. But and, and not targeted to TikTok. us. Mr. Chu, during this hearing, you have mentioned several times that there is a, quote, different experience, your words, for children under the age of 13. Uh, that is correct. Different experience. Mr. Chu, do you allow your children under the age of 13 to participate in TikTok? Yes or no? I, I did just explain this in detail. Um, this experience doesn't exist in Singapore where my children li live. If my children lived here, then yes. Based on what we've heard today, it's clear to me that TikTok as a company cannot be trusted and that Americans remain significantly at risk because of the TikTok app. I still contend that TikTok is the spy in Americans' pockets. I want to acknowledge that TikTok does have the ability to make those changes, but unfortunately, we have not heard that from you today. We have not heard a commitment to be able to protect the personal privacy that Americans expect and that Americans deserve. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield the remainder of my time. Gentleman yields back, Chair recognizes Ms. Tran for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Chu, many big tech CEOs have sat where you're seated, uh, seated today and tried to run out the clock during a hearing like this one. They were trained not to answer questions and just wait for the news cycle to pass so that they could get on with business as usual. Those same executives want this moment, TikTok's moment under the microscope to distract Congress and the American people from the very real issues that exist on their platforms. You have an opportunity to turn the tables on them. While US-based social media giants have regressed on protections for children and teens, on protecting our data, privacy, and on embracing transparency, you can lead, and you should lead. Last month, you announced that TikTok would expand access to its researcher API, but I'm concerned that your new policy could be more bark than bite that it won't actually lead to the rigorous research that we as lawmakers and that parents and everyday TikTok users need. 
In fact, your terms of service demand that researchers delete their data at TikTok's unilateral direction. It puts onerous restrictions on how researchers' findings can be published, and it only allows access to public data, which researchers already have access to within the app. In order to actually address the content moderation and algorithmic amplification concerns that my colleagues have raised here today, and that I've heard about directly from parents in my home state of Massachusetts, independent researchers, not just other tech companies like Oracle, need to be able to evaluate how TikTok's algorithm is making decisions to promote content. Mr. Chu, will you commit to expanding your API to include data that would let researchers investigate how your algorithm is pushing content to users, whether it's showing up on your For You page, the hashtag page, or somewhere else? We are, um, one of the commitments I gave in the opening statement is a commitment to transparency and third party uh, monitoring. So uh, Congresswoman, I will look into the details of that and get back to you. And as well as the algorithm, uh, including data on what types of users were targeted by the algorithm so that researchers can fully understand what content is being prioritized mm -hmm. and who it's being pushed to. Uh, again, uh, we have a commitment to transparency. Uh, these are very important questions and I will get back to you on the specifics. Under this same proposal, you require that researchers give TikTok, quote, worldwide free, non-exclusive, and perpetual, end quote, rights to their papers. This threatens to clash directly with well-established practices of exclusive publication rights in research journals. Mr. Chu, why does TikTok need those rights? I would need to get back to you on that specifics, uh, if that's okay. okay. Yes, I, I don't see how we can expect researchers to do their work under these terms and then tout transparency. Uh, I'm gonna shift gears with the time that I have remaining, Mr. Chu. I'd like to talk about TikTok's efforts to protect children and young users. In 2021, the UK's age-appropriate design code went into effect, mandating 15 standards that companies like you need to follow to protect children on your platform. You still operate in the United Kingdom, which means you should be in compliance with this code. So my question is simple. Will you commit to extending the protections currently afforded children in the UK to the millions of kids and teens who use your app here in the United States? We take the safety of the younger users on our platform very seriously. Um, every this is a good way to prove it. Every country is a little bit different in context and in um, so, uh, let, me, let me look at the specifics and bring some of the best practices across the world, but... Well, those best practices are in... They're being executed around the world. We just want the same for our kids here in the United States. I mean, Mr. Chu, when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, you indicated interest in taking steps to earn trust, our trust. And to me, it hasn't happened today so far. Uh, but rather you've ducked behind industry standards and comparables to your competitors, which we know are wo woefully insufficient. Um, I strongly urge you to consider these terms, these commitments, uh, make the case for why you're different uh, from your American competitors and do better on, than them on transparency, which you've mentioned countless times today, but which we don't really have anything tangible to point to. Uh, yes, I, I don't want to make excuses for our industry of ourselves. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, we take this very seriously. Nothing is uh, it's not perfect. We need to keep investing to stay ahead of our growth. So I, I agree that you know we need to prioritize safety and continue to do that as part of our company. And well, I'll look forward to getting back your comments and your commitments and those uh, those updated terms of service when you write back to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. You. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, we've heard a lot today about the procedural safeguards, independent code review, server locations, and the corporate independence between ByteDance and the CCP. But I think there's something else a little more telling. You know, when you were asked about Chinese censorship, you pivoted immediately to drug use in Singapore. You have absolutely tied yourself in knots to avoid criticizing the CP CCP's treatment of the Uyghur population. And I think it begs, the un it begs the first question, before we ever get to Project Texas, which I'll get to in a section. If the CCP demanded that ByteDance hand over all of the data that they had on, user, on US users in their possession, and ByteDance refused, I wonder what would happen. 
I wonder if Jack Ma might have an opinion on that, and I wonder if he'd be allowed to give it. But let's talk about Project Texas for a second. Project Texas envisions a new US-based TikTok subsidiary. You have stated that this arrangement is unprecedented. I'd argue the reason it's unprecedented is because it requires continual oversight and monitoring by the US of a private business because it poses a national security threat. The new subsidiary's board would report to and be approved by CFIUS. CFIUS will also specify hiring requirements as well as interact with Oracle as it performs its data role. That is an extraordinary corporate governance structure. I have questions whether it complies with corporate law and fiduciary, fiduciary duty to shareholders. Yet the core concern is that the, the pro, proposes unparalleled integration with the US government with a private company, which will require significant government resources. All of that to allow a continued operation of a social media platform that has serious national security implications. And CFIUS's workloads already dramatically increased in recent years with a 30% increase in declarations and a 45% increase in joint voluntary notices. And there's bipartisan consensus that CFIUS needs to be expanded as we speak. The only, Mr. Chu, can you identify any a similar corporate arrangement that requires federal government to expand such resources to monitor an alleged data privacy and national security risk? Congressman, I'm not an expert on this matter. I believe that there are certain similar arrangements, but I, I'm not an expert on this matter. Well, the only one I could find was the UK created the Huawei Cybersecurity Evaluation Center in 2010 to assess Huawei's tech and to detect malicious activity and guard UK's networks. That's worked so well that the United Kingdom is now planning on kicking Huawei out of Great Britain. You stated that TikTok has invested $1.5 billion in Project Texas. Are you aware of any discussions or proposals that entail TikTok, that entail TikTok funding or offsetting the costs of CFIUS role? Those discussions are, uh, I need to get back on you on the specifics, but I can tell you, yes, we did spend appro approximately one and a half billion US dollars on our side. You spent one this. and a half billion dollars on Project Texas, but do you have any, I mean, you agree that if CFIUS takes on this role, they're gonna need a massive influx of dollars in human resources, right? I cannot speak on behalf of CFIUS, Congressman. Should the US government expend such resources to create this extraordinary arrangement for TikTok, especially considering alleged data privacy and national security risk? Congressman, I cannot speak on behalf of the United well, States. Well, but Project Texas doesn't work without CFIUS, right? Project, Tex Project, Cif Project Texas, as you guys have proposed it, does not work without CFIUS involvement. The idea behind Project Texas is the firewall of US user data Make sure it's stored by an American company overseen by American personnel, and we will invite third-party monitors to, to monitor this. So that, in essence, in, at least as far as I know, is the majority of the cost because it will rely on not just us building the infrastructure, but us you know, finding and hiring these third-party monitors who are vetted to come in and monitor this structure. You talked earlier about the uh, shareholders' uh, ownership of TikTok, and you said 60% is global investors, 20% is employees, and 20% is original founders. Are all those voting shares the same? Uh, no, the founder has uh, weighted voting rights as is common in our industry. So do you, as far as a voting block of share of zoned in ByteDance, do you know if the Chinese Communist Party, not Chinese government, Communist Party officials, the Chinese Communist Party, do you know what their percentage of the actual voting block share of, of ByteDance is? Uh, so Chinese the Chinese Communist Party doesn't have voting rights in Biden. Chinese Communist Party members is a different question. I, I, do the I, founders control the voting block of ByteDance's shares? I, I do know that the founder himself is not a member of the, the Communist Party, but we don't know the political affiliation of our employees because that's not something we ask. Does the Chinese government know the political affiliation of their Chinese citizens? I cannot answer that question on their behalf. I yield back. Gentleman yields back, yield to the lady from, general lady from New Hampshire, Ms. Custer, five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Chu, I just wanna say I agree with all of the comments of many of my colleagues today that we need to take a close look at whether TikTok poses a national security risk. <clears throat> For today, I'm gonna focus my limited time on how TikTok can better protect its youngest users. 
And I think a number of us have identified as parents today and have serious concerns as we relay to you. Just this week, I heard from a parent in my district in Nashua, New Hampshire, whose child was served harmful content on TikTok and has needed counseling as a result. This experience is not unique to this family and it underscores the need for better child protections on your app. I'd like to dig further into TikTok's current safety and privacy controls for children. I understand that TikTok restricts certain app capabilities for users under age 18 and has additional restrictions for users under age 16 or 13, such as limiting who can interact with them on the platform. However, these protections are worthless if any savvy child can easily bypass these age restrictions by deleting their own account and creating a new one with a different age. And by easily, I mean you can literally go in and open another account using the same uh, email address. So I've been made aware by child safety groups, including Fair Play for Kids and Common Sense, that it is that simple for young users to bypass the age restrictions on TikTok. Yes or no, are you aware of this issue? I apologize. I think that's a great uh, issue question that you raised. Um, if a user inputs an age and is blocked, my understanding is that if the user tries to do it again within a short period of time, um, and I won't disclose We publicly. did it in our office yesterday. You can go right back in, use the exact same email address, and open a new account. So can I get your commitment that you will at least fix that bug? I, I will go and have a look at it, yes. Thank you. Um, it, it, we're here today to talk TikTok and not other platforms, but I'm happy to look at legislative solutions. In the interim, TikTok has a responsibility to do more to protect its young users, and I will accept your commitment to take a look at fixing that issue. Will you, um, let's see, sorry, I recognize that TikTok has made efforts to provide parents and guardian increased options to monitor and limit their child's activity on the app, including family pairing, and time limit features, but I still have concerns. In order to access family pairing, parents then must download the app onto their phone. And this sounds like a design to lure more users onto the app rather than a practical safety feature. Furthermore, downloading the app may not be a viable option for many patients, uh, parents. Mr. Chu, will TikTok commit to developing other methods for parents to monitor their child's use of the app without having to download the TikTok app on their phone? I, I can look into that specifically and get back to you. But the okay. family pairing that you mentioned is, is a very good tool that we developed. I encourage parents with teenagers but to use it. But it's not a perfect tool. And let me just say, one of my concerns is that um, the minimum time limit TikTok lets parents set for their children is 40 minutes, which for a young child is a very long period of time. Actually giving parents control would mean providing them the freedom to set the screen time that makes sense for their family. Now, I've got a copy of the uh, app page that shows just the four options would you commit to adding an other option so that the parent can easily set their own screen time limit? I can take a look at that. Um, I think it's important. I think parents are looking for control. They're looking to uh, allow their family to use these apps without TikTok taking over um, their child's uh, media use. Um, I've heard use reports, I've heard reports of users struggling to access the feature. And so I will look forward to um, hearing back from you on adding an other so that a parent can add a custom limit. So finally, I ask that you commit to report back to this committee and the American public on how TikTok addresses these safety issues and the steps that you are taking to default children's accounts to the most protective possible settings. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back.
I yield to, Chair yields to the gentleman from Ohio. Five minutes, Mr. Balderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chen, for being here today. Um, I would like to start by uh, inserting into the record a report entitled TikTok Bite Dance and Their Ties to the Chinese Communist Party, which was published by the Australian Parliament just over a week ago. If I could add that to the record, Without please. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Madam okay. Chair. Mr. Chu, we know that your company's algorithm has been exposed for delivering videos to China that encourages them to develop eating disorders, promotes challenges that have caused children to accidentally commit suicide, glorifies the use of drugs and pornography. Despite the constant media coverage of this issue, your company continues to feed our children this dangerous and harmful content. Can you explain to parents back in my congressional district why it should be their burden and not TikToks to set up that guarding parental controls for their children so that they do not view content which encourages eating disorders or committing suicide? Congressman, I, I take these uh, issues very seriously. Um, if the user is between, is a teenage user on our platform, we actually have a differentiated experience, including certain uh, models that we are building with experts to help identify uh, uh, certain content that's not inherently harmful, but could, could uh, lead people to eating disorders. Anything that glorifies eating disorders is, is violative of our platform, and we remove that. And I, I want to assure you that I take this very, very seriously, this commitment. Mr. Curtis, my colleague, mentioned the use of heating tool on your platform to make specific videos go viral or get more views. Does TikTok use a cooling tool where employees can manually limit the amplification of content that TikTok should hide, like content that promotes eating disorders, drug use, or suicide among children? Uh, the, the only promotion tool that we have is um, approved by the local teams, so in the U.S. by the U.S. team, and it's for commercial purposes like like Taylor Swift, you know, I think when she onboarded, we, you know, so heated that'd be a little a yes bit. Yes or no? <laughs> uh, my, uh, I just want to make sure that I'm answering your question with specifics. Um, if this tool exists, why isn't it being used to cool then uh, the spread of dangerous content? I mean, why is it still happening? A dangerous content has uh, um, that violates. We we remove them when we see them. We actually remove them from the platform. Okay. Uh, the fact of the matter here is that despite whatever action you take that TikTok is taking to protect teens, your algorithm continues to promote harmful content. Wouldn't you agree that indicates there is something inherently wrong with the algorithm your platform employs? I, I do respectfully disagree with that. Um, the algorithm drives a great user experience for many, many users. Um, well, I talked about STEM content. That has 116 billion views on our platform. I, I want one more example. Book talk is a trend that happened on our platform is to encourage people to read. And globally, it has 115 billion views, and it's fantastic. I've heard people telling me that they are reading more because of book talk. So there is a lot of good and joy and positive that can be derived from the TikTok experience. Yes, there are some bad actors who come in and post violative content, and it's our job to remove them. But the overwhelming experience is a very positive one for our community. But if it's your job to remove them, it's been said many times here today about the 41 days that that video stood up with addressing Mrs. the Chairwoman. After this, I'm going to go and look into the specifics um, of, um, of that. All right, thank yeah. you. Madam Chair, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the lady from Texas, Ms. Fletcher, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman McMorris Rogers, and thanks to Ranking Member Pallone for holding today's hearing, and thank you, Mr. Chu, for appearing today. Um, it's been a long day, but we're here to learn about a complex set of issues that relate to TikTok and how to address them. And I think that's what we're hearing from colleagues on both sides of the aisle today, is a real effort to grapple with the challenges that we see for national security and for the safety and protection of American citizens, especially our children and young adults. And we've already covered today a lot of um, the, the information about the extensive use of the app, the number of users who are children and young adults, um, but I think it bears repeating, as Mr. Vesey mentioned, um, that TikTok is the preferred platform of young Americans. And they use it for all kinds of creative and important things, and we have seen that. But there are also some dangerous things that we know it has and continues to be used for, and that also that the data that's collected is 
posing additional dangers. And that's, that's what we're here for. Most people using TikTok do not realize that TikTok is collecting data about their keystrokes or about their browsing history on other sites and so much more. Um, and I agree with my colleagues that we need a comprehensive set of data privacy laws here in the country, and we've heard some very good ideas today. And Mr. Chu, you've mentioned several times today that these are industry-wide issues. And I agree with you that there are industry-wide challenges here. But there are also some specific things relating to TikTok that I want to focus my questions on and really want to understand where there's a difference and how we can craft legislation that addresses the very real challenges that we've been hearing about today. Um, as you know, states across the country have joined an ongoing investigation into possible violations of consumer protection laws by TikTok as they pertain to TikTok's effect on the mental health of American children and teenagers. As part of this investigation, states have requested to review internal TikTok communications that takes place on LARC. Right? That's TikTok's primary instant messaging system. Is that right? Yes. OK. And does every TikTok employee have a LARC account? It is very similar to companies that use Slack or any other instant messaging tool. But LARC is a proprietary instant messaging tool. It's not Slack. It is something that was developed, yes, by, by ByteDance. It was developed by TikTok? No, it's developed by ByteDance. It's developed by ByteDance. Okay. And so a um, couple of questions stemming from that. Um, is it true that LARC video conferencing has a translation feature in which Chinese is translated to English text and vice versa? That is correct. It helps with global inter cooperation. Okay. And, um, and those translated conversations are somehow saved into the LARC system? I would need to get back to you on the specifics. Okay. Um, uh, there is... Um, you know, I'll get back to you on the specifics. Okay, that would be great to know, and I, I neglected to ask, but does every TikTok employee have a LARC account? Yes, I believe so, yes. Including you, do you have one? Yes, I believe so. Yes. Um, and, um, and then do you have a, it, there's some kind of profile for your instant messaging system, so every employee identifies their manager and, and their department, who they work for, what they do, is that all included in their LARC profile, do you know? It's very common for companies to have uh, enterprise messaging tools that sure. companies use. It does, and I guess I'm asking specifically about LARC since it's specific to TikTok, whether um, it includes information like identifying who, for example, your manager is. Um, do you know whether that's something that's identified in LARC? Uh, yes, uh, again, some of these HR uh, features are built into a lot of enterprise tools that we use, and yeah. So like for your own profile, does it identify who your manager is? Yes, it does. And who does it identify as your manager? I report to the CEO of ByteDance. Okay, and so that is um, uh, Zhang Yiming. Is that identified as your manager? That's the former CEO. He has um, stepped down from the okay. board and so, as the CEO. Yes. Okay, so Mr. Rubo is identified now as your manager on on um, on yes the system. Okay. Um, and as you mentioned, it was developed by ByteDance, so it's not just used by TikTok. Um, employees, it's also used by ByteDance employees, is that right? Also by other companies now. I think Lark is selling it, and it's, um, it's a good tool for instant messaging. So Lark is available to third parties outside of the ByteDance system as well, like yes. Slack? Um, and do you personally ever use Lark to communicate with ByteDance? With uh, uh, employees at ByteDance? Yes, yes, I do. You do, okay. Um, well, I'm running out of time, and I'm sorry to say, because this is really interesting. Um, I do think it underscores some of the concerns that have been raised in this hearing. Um, so I think it's clear we have work we need to continue to do here in the Congress to address data protection and privacy. And um, with that, Madam Chairwoman, I thank you, and I will yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The committee stands in recess and will reconvene immediately following the third vote being called. A break now in this hearing, the Energy and Commerce Committee grilling TikTok's CEO on the safety of TikTok. 150 million regular users in the United States are on this app. It is a vital part of many young people's lives, and we're hearing a lot of concerns from members of Congress today about teen mental health, kids' mental health, but also national security risks and the potential connection 
with China. I'm joined by James Homan and Jeffrey Fowler. Uh, Jeff, let's talk about the direction these questions are going, and then we'll get to whether or not we're hearing answers from TikTok's CEO. Yeah, I have been um, impressed, actually, with the number of Democrats and Republicans who are bringing up what I think are some of the real concerns of Americans who use TikTok or have kids who use TikTok. Concerns about uh, the mental health of teen users, screen time. We heard from a member of Congress who's a pediatrician. Um, uh, I did not expect that to come up so much today, and it feels like TikTok CEO um, wasn't really prepared to answer some of those questions, or at the very least in his responses, doesn't seem to be willing to break any new ground, give any, give any territory in that, make any new promises. Um, and to me, that uh, I think American parents aren't coming away from this hearing today feeling any better about TikTok. Mm. So on that front, um, I, I, I think that, that they've got a lot of work to do. James? Yeah, I agree. I, I think that a heavy emphasis has been on the real human harms. Perhaps they also don't feel great about their children using any of the other platforms. I actually have been surprised, frankly, at how willing he has been to criticize his competitors, to criticize mm. the industry. Mm. At one point, he criticized Facebook by name. He mentioned and invoked the Cambridge Analytica scandal of a few years ago uh, about them sharing user data. Uh, and, and so, you know, really basically trying to throw everyone else under the bus to say, if you think we're bad, everyone else is bad too. Uh, and, you know, the, the obviously a little complicated, but the he acknowledged reporting that his own children are not on TikTok, his eight-year-old isn't. He said it's because in Singapore, where he lives, they don't have the format for people under 13. But you heard members on both sides of the aisle saying, well, if it's not good enough for for your kids, why is it good enough for my kids? He did try to throw Facebook and others under the bus, and yet he's also, in his sometimes evasive answers, hiding behind, well, this is what the industry does, right? For example, when he was pressed about uh, whether TikTok sells data mm -hmm. to data brokers, um, he said, no, we don't currently do it. But he, when pressed, he could have said, and we won't ever do that, but mm -hmm. he wouldn't. And so, look, I mean, I get it. You're the CEO of a really, really big company. Why agree in front of Congress to do something that your competitors won't agree to do? Uh, uh, he's not required to do that. Um, if, if, if these members of Congress want those changes, they should pass laws. That is their job, mm. <laughs> to pass laws. You, you did hear sort of a plaintive cry from some members saying, you know, we need you to do better. We are trusting a lot in our families and our mental health and our well-being with you. We need you to do better. And he couldn't commit to that, but of course, where is the where is the incentive to do so? I do want to play a little bit of what we heard him say uh, in some of this back and forth about the company's ownership uh, by a Chinese-based company, ByteDance, of course. And let's hear this bit focusing on user privacy and this connection or contradiction, this pushback he's giving about American and social media companies. Let's watch. So, Mr. Chu, would TikTok be prepared to divest from ByteDance and uh, Chinese Communist Party ties if the Department of Treasury instructed you all to do so? Uh, Congressman, uh, I said in my opening statement, I think we are need to address the problem of privacy. I agree with you. I don't think ownership is the issue here. With a lot of respect, American social companies don't have a good track record with data privacy and user security. I mean, look at Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. Just one example. So, so uh, I, I do think that, you know, it is not about the ownership. It is a lot about making sure we have Project Texas, making sure that we're protecting and firewalling U.S. user data from unwanted foreign access, giving third parties to come in to have a look at this and making sure that everybody is comfortable. We're giving transparency and third party monitoring. And that's what we're doing for Project Texas. Mm. A Project Texas reference there. Let's talk about Project Texas, Jeff, for those who might be tuning in late or hadn't heard his opening statement where he was really promoting that path. Yeah. I will say, just listening yeah. to his comments again just now, yeah. he's not wrong that conflating ownership with protecting our mm -hmm. privacy and protecting our kids um, is, it, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily line up, right? Mm -hmm. uh, American companies do not have any better track record with that. But the, the, the proposal they have with Project Texas um, relates to um, how to sort of find a middle road mm -hmm. with their parent company being based in China. The promise is uh, they will work with a giant US company called Oracle to store their data in Texas 
um, and allow um, it, allow its access and allow the company's algorithms to be vetted by Americans, to be essentially run by Americans. Are they making any pledges or promises, though, that American data would be more protected than it would be by any other social media companies? They're not. They're, they're, they're definitely not. I mean, there were a couple times where he said, look, we don't do political ads, unlike some of our competitors. We don't sell information to data brokers, unlike some of our competitors. But he's not saying we're going to be any better than the industry standard. And he still leaves open this question of, um, so the presumption in his statement is that if the, the data sits on servers in the US, that it can't be accessed by, by the Chinese government, that, 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 uh, that figures in China can't have influence on the, on the algorithm that runs the For You page on TikTok uh, because, uh, because we would see some sign of it. But I, 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 that argument just isn't convincing yet because that's not the way the internet works. That's not the way algorithms work. And one of the things he said that was striking to me was, you know, he was asked, well, India banned TikTok. All these governments have restricted it. If there's nothing to it, why? And he said it's based, he quote, based entirely on hypotheticals, that there's no evidence. And it, in some ways, that's his strongest defense, which is you hypothetically could do a lot of these terrible things, but show us the proof that we're doing them, show us the proof. It, it, it could happen, but it's not happening. And I'm not sure that really persuades anyone, but that's his argument. Let's talk about the multiple paths that members of Congress are taking, the criticisms that are really running along parallel tracks, Jeff. There is the concern about privacy, the concern about privacy in relation to China and the Chinese government having potential access to Americans' data. And then there's the question of how much time people are spending on TikTok and, frankly, other social media apps. This is not just a TikTok issue. And the concerns that members of Congress are bringing up about their constituents, things they've heard families saying, it's changed my child's personality. I have less interaction with my kid. I have real concern about their level of anxiety and eating disorder and things like that. I almost wish that we could have had separated out these conversations because we could have had better conversations about each of them because we're starting to conflate some things that maybe don't necessarily align. For example, on that second point, the concerns about the impact on young people, is the assumption then that because it has ties to China that the Chinese government is doing those things to make it worse for Americans? I know some members of Congress have essentially implied that, but like that brings in a whole other la layer of like, okay, what's the evidence of that? What's the proof? I think there are definitely important conversations to be had about kids and keeping them safe. It just feels kind of jammed in here next to the China conversations in a way that that that's not helping clarify it. It definitely has been the implication, and some said it quite explicitly, look, you can't get this material in China. In China, uh, TikTok's not available, they have their own equivalent, and they have limitations that the U.S. doesn't have. Uh, and so some members have gone very close to saying China's trying to mess up our kids and our future. Yeah. I want to play one sample of uh, tape here. This is from one of the members of Congress who was bringing up the concerns of families and kids. This is Gus uh, Bilirakis, Republican of Florida. And he was focusing on the content that's specifically curated for young people. He brought up the plight of one family whose 16-year-old son, Chase Nasca, died from suicide. Uh, he talked about how Chase's TikTok feed showed videos essentially promoting suicide, and the boy's parents are attending the hearing in person. Let's watch. I want to thank his parents for being here today and allowing us to show this. Mr. Chu, your company destroyed their lives. Your company destroyed their lives. I admire their courage to be here and share Chase's story in the hopes that it will prevent this from happening to other families. The content in Chase's for you page was not a window to discovery as you boldly claim in your testimony. It wasn't content from a creator that you invited to roam the hill today or STEM education content that children in China see. Instead, his for you page was sadly a window to discover suicide. 
That's a congressman from Florida. They then went on to show video uh, how there was a lot on his feed, on his For You page, that was essentially promoting suicide or glorifying it. To give context to what else he was saying, um, we've heard from TikTok, including from the CEO, that STEM materials, right, science, technology, math, are resources that can be found on there and are promoted in China. And that there are these content creators walking around Capitol Hill today and this week saying, look, I have this great job, I'm developing this wholesome, rich content, I have a community. And so this is a counterpoint to that, Jeff. Yeah, it's just heartbreaking. Oh, it's so sad. Um, and I see TikTok is essentially trying to use the Facebook playbook. Facebook has faced many of the same concerns uh, about Facebook and Instagram and the impact of its algorithms and its choices. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it is it, saying that, yes, this, this platform, TikTok, is used for, for positive stuff, for learning, for education, for building businesses, does not absolve them of these other questions and problems. And it's great that Congress is talking about that. But again, I wish we could, could deal with it separately from the national security concerns so that so that each gets the attention that it deserves. James. And indeed, there has not been a single congressional defender of TikTok today. There was this uh, press conference yesterday that Jamal Bowman, a former high school principal from New York City, uh, had where he was joined by Mark Pocan and Robert Garcia, uh, three members of the Congressional Progressive Caucus Liberals. Uh, but you haven't heard a single member kind of try to point out any so of they're the, against a ban. They're, so they're, they're, they're against they're a ban. Against a ban but and, it was a small group exactly. and they were joined by content creators, but it wasn't like this en masse group of members of Congress who were saying, slow down. And not a, not a, everyone who's asked questions today necessarily would support a ban just because they've been very critical. Uh, you know, I'm not sure what the vote would be. Uh, I'm not even sure you'd get a majority to say, yes, let's ban this this product that 150 million Americans use every month. But certainly there this this group does reflect the concern of a lot of older Americans. Yeah. There is a generational divide. Uh, you know, we've not heard from a lot of the younger members that this is what's called an A committee on the Hill, which means that it's harder to get onto. So a lot of the younger members don't get seats on it until they've sort of paid their dues. I mean, so we're talking you know, about seeing the younger members now and yeah. they're in their 40s, right, maybe exactly. in their 50s, yeah. right? That's the younger But I thought, right you know, we, you and I were watching and, and mm -hmm. at one point it was, I have a 15-year-old daughter yeah. and we thought maybe he's going to defend it. But no, he was concerned about his 15-year-old yeah. daughter. And in fact, uh, some of our colleagues here at the Post did an analysis, and out of the 52 members on this panel, we could only find one who has a TikTok account that we could verify. Wow, that's pretty that's astounding in comparison to how widely it's used by so many Americans. Let's go to Rhonda Colvin, who's live for us on Capitol Hill and has been reporting from inside this hearing. Rhonda, give us a sense of, of how, as this time is going on, is the frustration increasing from members of Congress? Uh, uh, what are you reading from them this morning and this afternoon? No, you don't see their frustration increasing. They seem to be on this steady drumbeat of being very critical of TikTok. And Mr. Chu, you're hearing them talk about how he has not been very transparent. You're also seeing them question him in ways on complex matters uh, and only want to hear a yes or no for him, which is sort of that courtroom tactic that often you see in congressional hearings. Uh, he may be a little frustrated. There have been times where you see he has wanted uh, to answer questions in length and been told no by the chair. Uh, but this committee seems to be well armed with uh, some of the constituent stories that you uh, discussed and played the tape of. Um, that's something that all Americans can understand. There are so many issues across the Hill that often maybe people aren't really tuned into. But TikTok and, and potential harms to kids, that's something that it is easy to tell the American public about. So you also see that component in this hearing, that they are telling the American people that they want to do something about TikTok. And it's interesting. I was just looking at a poll, a Quinnipiac poll, and it said that about 49 percent of Americans do favor a ban on foreign technologies that are deemed national security risk. So it's about half right now of Americans who do favor some sort of curbs or bans. Um, so these, these lawmakers seem to have some motivation, some uh, wind in their sails to implement some sort of curb or ban. Uh, and, and you're seeing that. I think they feel the momentum. They know the audience that they're trying to come across. Uh, to, and we'll see in the, the next bit when they return, uh, if those questions continue that are critical. You haven't heard uh, any uh, pro-TikTok um, 
messaging or questions from this panel. Uh, and across the Hill, you're not hearing it either. I do know I've heard uh, one lawmaker, a Democratic lawmaker on the Foreign Affairs Committee, who has said that, you know, a ban may be going a little too far right now. Uh, we don't have all the information. Uh, you just can't have some sweeping regulation against an app without all the information. That's about as far as the criticism is going right now. But th this is a very, very unique time for the CEO to be in front of a panel that seems incredibly united. In fact, one of the members uh, said it and captured it pretty well when he told him, welcome to the most bipartisan committee on the Hill. And it seems that way from this line of questioning. Uh, yeah, even as we resume this, we certainly don't expect to hear softballs, although, you know, you can never predict exactly what Congress is going to do. Rhonda talked about one poll. We have our own Washington Post data and a big determiner on how people felt about bans or restrictions on TikTok was whether or not they're users of TikTok. Yeah, it really is a, a remarkable correlation. 41% of Americans overall support a federal ban in the post poll. Only 25% are opposed. Uh, and, and it is overwhelmingly generational. Uh, more than seven in 10 Americans are worried TikTok's parent company is based in China. They worry that TikTok is likely causing harm to teens' mental health. 65% of Americans think that TikTok is likely collecting personal data on Americans for the Chinese government. Uh, but unsurprisingly, it is just vastly more popular with younger Americans. 60% of 18 to 34 year olds use the app compared with 46% of those who are 35 to 49, 29% of 50 to 64 year olds, and 13%, an impressively high number actually, among those who are 65 and older using TikTok. And uh, I, these, I, I don't think TikTok's done itself any favors today. I don't think that they've won over anyone. I'm not sure that uh, if you were on the fence, this has pushed you away. But uh, I've been struck uh, seeing emails from Republican senators who are much more aggressive about this, uh, attacking Democratic members of their own home state delegations for being on TikTok. Tom Tillis, the Republican from North Carolina, sent a statement out a few minutes ago saying it's, a, it's abominable after watching this hearing that uh, Democratic House members from North Carolina are still on this app and they need to delete their accounts. So there is an effort to use this as a political wedge underneath sort of this patina of bipartisanship that we're seeing in the hearing. Mm -hmm. Politically, is there any danger in making TikTok a culture war issue? I mean, can this turn into... <laughs> That's what Secretary Raimondo brought yeah. up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gina Raimondo told Bloomberg uh, News, she's the Commerce Secretary, uh, just a few weeks ago. She said, quote, the politician in me thinks you're going to literally lose every voter under 35 forever. Uh, it's, it's certainly problematic. I mean, right now, the the zeitgeist on Capitol Hill, and this happens every Congress, there's something that people get worked up about. The zeitgeist is who can be tougher on China. And so right now, the, the frame is all just who can be tougher on China. And I don't think that they're necessarily thinking through the, the political backlash that would ensue, which is why, frankly, a, a lot of people who are close to TikTok believe that the US government is bluffing. And this Restrict Act that Rhonda's been talking about today, it would just give the power to Gina Raimondo, of all people, the Commerce Secretary, to potentially be able to ban TikTok. But that really is just perceived to be for leverage and negotiations about getting them to make concessions. Uh, TikTok itself is so big and so expensive that it's hard to imagine anyone being able to acquire it. And as you were talking about earlier, it's really difficult to just think through the logistics of how you would ban an app that more than 150 million Americans use every month. And then what the backlash would be. Yeah. And then on the privacy concerns and the, the health of teenagers concerns, um, Congress could also do something about that, such as passing, let's say, a federal privacy law, which I believe one member today pointed out there had been 32 hearings, and he seems so tired by these 32 hearings on the topic. I, I am, too. I think Americans are, too. But ultimately, isn't this up to Congress to do something? And we, got, we, we saw them get pretty close last year, uh, and it fell apart because, you know, we've, we've heard several members mention Section 230, and, uh, and it, it, everyone sort of seems to agree that that's a problem in some way, but they disagree on why it's a problem and they disagree on how to fix it. Rhonda, tell us more about legislation on Capitol Hill and where this all could go. Yeah, there, and this has been going on for a few years. Actually, since the emergence of TikTok, you've seen legislation trying to address it in some way. That legislation hasn't always been popular or had the momentum that we're now seeing uh, around the last few weeks and months. Uh, there are proposals that would ban it on campus, college campuses. Now, that's already happened on a few college campuses on their own. Uh, even states have banned TikTok uh, on their government devices. They're not waiting for Congress to implement anything. They're doing it on their own. 
own. Uh, there is also a new bill that's sponsored uh, by uh, Senator Rubio that would take federal funds away from any organization or individual who receives federal funds if they have some sort of agreement with TikTok, if it's advertising or something like that. Uh, so there's a range of proposals. The, the one that seems to have the best odds at uh, at least getting to the floor for a vote is that Restrict Act, and that's led uh, by Virginia Senator uh, Mark Warner and also uh, Senator Thune. And what that would do is give, as we've been talking about, that would give power to the Commerce Secretary to look into any national security risk associated with a foreign-based app and then ban it. They think that that's probably the best way to go to avoid any court challenges on a ban of TikTok. Uh, so it seems like Capitol Hill is trying to still figure out what to do and how to do it. Uh, and of course, they also would not be alone. Uh, globally, you've seen other governments ban TikTok on their government devices. Uh, most recently, the UK, countries in the EU, Canada have all done this. Uh, India, of course, has a full ban on TikTok. Uh, and even China, the uh, counterpart to TikTok, their version of TikTok, there are safeguards for kids under 14. So other governments are looking into bans or curbs. All right, let's go back now to the hearing room Being and Chair here, Kathy McMorris Rogers. I'm six Texans over on to this another committee. member of the committee. I'm over here. So when you invoke the name of Texas, you get my attention. Ms. Chu, when you were the CFO of ByteDance, did the Chinese government instruct you on how content was to be moderated on Douyin or, or TikTok, yes or no? Sorry, Congressman, would you mind repeating that question? When you were the CFO of ByteDance, did the Chinese government instruct you on how content to be moderated was to be moderated on Douyin or TikTok? I was not in charge of that. That's you were the not? CFO of okay. ByteDance. We have, a, we have a, a discrepancy there. Reports have shown that TikTok accounts managed by MediaLinks TV, a propaganda arm of the CCP, pushed divisive content before the recent midterm election. Mr. Xu, yes or no, has, to your knowledge, has the CCP coordinated or utilized TikTok to influence users through algorithms, state paid content creation, or in any other capacity? No, they do not do that. We do not promote or remove any content on behalf of the Chinese government. You don't, but did the Chinese government, do you have any knowledge of that? We do not do, uh, Congressman, we have only one process of removing content on our platform. Okay. And the process is, is done by our content moderation team headquartered in Ireland and Dublin, sorry, Ireland and the US. And we will only remove content if it violates our guidelines. And that's something that we audit, you know, or if there's a valid legal order, so. Okay. Uh, several reports, hearings, and leaked internal documents have indicated that TikTok has repeatedly censored or de-amplified content that is critical of Chinese Communist Party's po uh, party policies in the U.S. and abroad. Are you aware of those reports? I don't think that's accurate, Congressman. We are, do you, not... are you aware of those reports? There could be some reports that say that, but that, that action itself is but not your testimony like here today is that you can keep up with stuff and make it as clean as possible, quote unquote. Are you aware of those reports? I, I want to make it very clear that we, we, there is content on TikTok that's great and fun. There is content that's critical of China. That's and not, it's what not, there not what I'm saying. Are you aware of the reports citing that fact? Uh, again, like I said, the fact is, if you go onto our platform, you will find content that is critical of China well, we're going to talk about that. Now, this committee is looking at reforming Section 230, uh, 230 of the Communication Decency Act, which has already been mentioned here today. Do you think that censoring history and historical facts and current events should be protected by Section 230's good faith requirement? Uh, Congressman, that, that is a more complex topic. I will need to speak to my team and get back to you on the specifics. Oh. Is your team behind you? Uh, it's uh, my broader team. I will speak to them. I'll get okay. back to you. It's always good to have folks behind you, isn't it? Not them. Oh, no. oh, okay. I got you. Here are my concerns with TikTok. Your claims are hard to believe. It's no secret to us that TikTok is still under the thumb of CCP influence. And let's be honest. TikTok is indoctrinating our children with divisive, woke, and pro-CCP propaganda, all while threatening our national security with Chinese spyware. In fact, in fact, let me look at my notes here. Uh, you had an exchange with uh, Anna Eshoo. Uh, in your exchange with Congressman Eshoo, you said that, quote, extreme fitness videos shouldn't be viewed too much. You remember that exchange? 
here today? Um, what extremist video? What, with, with what? Anna SU out of California. I, any content that is, um, has extremist content okay. is not allowed on our platform. It will be, we identify them. It will what, be, was that also true about the gun video that you saw today? Was that extreme content that should have been taken down? I would need to look at the specifics of the whole video. There was a bit of lag just now. We couldn't see the whole video. Okay, you know what threatened our, our, our committee chair here? That is unacceptable. Okay. And, you know, I, so you're aware of that extreme video. And why did it take 40 plus days to get it down? Does it take literally an act of Congress? Should we plan to have a committee hearing every time, every day, every time there's something brought up so that we can limit the content on TikTok? Should Congress plan to do that, Mr. Shu? Congressman, um, we work very hard to remove violative content on our platform. Okay, well, let me, let me move on. <clears throat> With Congressman Huston, he asked you about your wages and your stocks, and you said you, pre you, prepare, you uh, prefer to keep that information private. Now you know how we feel about American uh, public's information. We prefer to keep it private as well. We don't think TikTok does that. So, Madam Chair, my time is up. And if this committee gets its way, TikTok's time is up. Are Madam Chair, if I may, Gen in my response gentlemen, to an earlier gentlemen, question. Gentlemen, um, I'm sorry, gen gentlemen's time has expired. Or, yeah, uh, I, Chair recognizes Mr. Ruiz from California for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Rogers. I echo my colleagues' concerns about TikTok's impacts on the health and well-being of the American public. As a doctor and the ranking member of the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic, I am troubled that TikTok is rife with medically inaccurate information, including dangerous misinformation and the intentional disinformation about COVID-19 and vaccines. TikTok's community guidelines state that the com company will re remove content or accounts that involve, quote, misleading information that causes significant harm, unquote. However, since the early stages of the pandemic, TikTok has been used as a platform for people pushing misinformation, disinformation, including by those casting doubt on the safety and efficacy of life-saving vaccines. And despite TikTok's pledge to address harmful misinformation, these videos are being viewed millions of times. For example, the Institute for Strategic Dialogue found that a sample of 124 TikTok videos containing vaccine misinformation were viewed 20 million times. And Media Matters found that a sample of 18 videos with COVID-19 misinformation were viewed over 57 million times. Here's another shocking study. The Journal of American Medical Informatics Association found that when searching hashtag quote coronavirus on TikTok, almost 30% of the videos that came up contained misinformation. Videos in that sample containing a high level of misinformation were viewed a median of 9.4 million times. Mr. Shu, what are these, why are these dangerous videos falling through the cracks of your company's efforts to enforce its own community guidelines and remove harmful misinformation? Uh, before, before I answer that, in my response to an no, earlier no, question you're, from you're, Representative you're in my, Mr. Shu? Ms. you're in my time. Answer my question. I, I understand, but if no, I would like to clarify I'm something. I'm clarified, I have f five minutes okay. in my time. You're in my time now, answer my question. Yes, uh, any dangerous uh, misinformation is, part we partner with third party experts to be able to identify and help us with subject domain expertise. And with the expertise we, that we recognize, we rely on those to develop policies, to recognize and remove content well, that could be. Your efforts are, have failed and they're dangerous. Okay? It's public health risks that you're putting millions of people's lives at risk for not being able to do a better job. And I'm concerned that TikTok's features make it users uniquely vulnerable to the spread of this misinformation. For example, TikTok makes it extremely easy to reuse audio and videos to create content, which allows misinformation to quickly spread through the platform. And TikTok's algorithm to recommend videos means that a user viewing one video containing misinformation can easily result in their quote unquote for you page becoming filled with videos containing similar misinformation. This is a dangerous feedback loop. So is TikTok taking any action to modify these features so that they no longer facilitate the spread of this misinformation or this misinformation feedback loop? Congressman, um, again, like I said, any dangerous mis- or disinformation, um, 
we work with third parties to recognize that, and it's proactively removed from our platform. Okay, so it doesn't so, need to get into those loops so, at all. So, I, so I can I can go back and read you the the data, and the and uh, the Journal of American Medical Informa Informatics. Thirty percent of videos uh, after searching for hashtag coronavirus had misinformation. One like almost one out of three. Your third party and your and your company are missing one almost one out of three misinform videos. So you're telling me what you're doing. I'm telling you the data shows that you are grossly failing at that effort. The other thing, the other question I have for you is that TikTok is also in Spanish, and Spanish-speaking populations have been specifically targeted to uh, to misinformation uh, when it comes to many aspects, especially medical misinformation. And as chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, we reached out to you last Congress on this issue. So what is your intent or how does your, your um, uh, team look like to address Spanish versus English? How many staff do you have focusing on Spanish versus how many staff do you have focusing on English misinformation? Congressman, um, I was, uh, like I explained just now, um, the Spanish speaking population is very important to our platform. Uh, we do have a lot of um, Spanish-speaking moderators, and we will continue to... So how many Spanish-speaking staff versus English-speaking staff for misinformation do you have? I can get back to you on the specifics, but misinf dangerous misinformation is moderated regardless of language. Not to the degree that it needs to be. We, we, are, we can continue and, to work and, hard. And when to... there's misinformation, people base their decisions that oftentimes put them at risk. Uh, in exposures and their families at risk. And with the coronavirus, especially prior to the vaccines, uh, they, they, the risk was their life. Thank you, real bad. Madam Chair, I would like to clarify something. In the follow-up question to Representative Dan's question just now, I misunderstood the follow-up about Biden spying um, on, on behalf of the Chinese government. My answer to that question should be a no, because it came very rapidly. I just want to clarify that. The gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman, or the chair, chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, Idaho, Mr. Fulcher, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Chu, we've been going a long time here by now, and uh, a lot of questions have been answered, and a lot of them have not been answered. And the primary thing I want to do is just share some thoughts of what I've seen, learned today, been exposed to. First of all, I've got to compliment you on having a, a product that's impressive. It is a very influential tool. Uh, it, is, it is addictive, and that's what you want users to be exposed to, is something addictive, and it is a data-gathering masterpiece. So clearly, it's got the potential to sell products connected like-minded people with that artificial intelligence um, capability in a viral, viral fashion, and perhaps spread information quicker, better than anything else that's been developed out there. Now, I'm, I'm just gonna tell you, I'm not a subscriber, at least a willing subscriber, but probably in that database somewhere is my preferences with colors or foods or who I've spoken to or what I've said or my favorite newspapers, I don't know. But that's available to be sold or given to whomever or whatever. And the whatever is what bothers me. And I'll use myself as an example again. If for whatever reason I became a target in this, I became somebody you didn't like, and I know that'd be hard to believe because you gotta like me. But let's say you didn't or your company didn't or for whatever reason I became an app, app target. That artificial intelligence algorithm could be shared or spread selectively to a targeted audience that, uh, with negative information that maybe they, has been paired up with that knowledge and that app to make me look really, really bad. Or to the converse, same thing could be done to make me look really, really good. Here's the problem. It's someone else or some artificial intelligence algorithm that has inordinate power 
to subjectively combine strategic data with strategic audiences to shape whatever thoughts and news they want. And I've equipped it, not even knowing it. And that process could apply to anyone or anything. There's the danger. It could be the President of the United States. It could be their kids. It could be a company. It could be a political party. It could be a news outlet. Anything could be targeted for that selective viral spread of just some information. Mr. Chu, this may be genius, but that doesn't make it fair. It doesn't make it good, and it doesn't make it accountable. I wouldn't want my government to have that ability. I wouldn't want a company or a political party or my friend August here or my mother to have that capability. And I certainly don't want that to be accessible to anyone in China. Now, there's no question it's got immense value. And as proof of that, you're here. Because this hasn't been a fun day. I know that. Hasn't been a fun day for us either. Artificial intelligence is difficult to manage once it's on auto cruise control, and it's, as we've talked about, nearly impossible to wall off data. I know the idea. I know a little bit about databases. I know a little bit about corruption of those databases. It's very difficult to wall things off. And in, unfortunately, there's this thing in called human nature where there's some dark components from time to time. There's always a temptation to monetize things or perhaps use some of these tools for nefarious purposes, and they can have absolutely devastating consequences. So, Mr. Chu, I'm going to wrap up my, my comments and just say that th this is so attractive, TikTok poses as a Mr. Rogers neighborhood, but it acts like Big Brother. And that's got to stop. Madam Chair, you'll Will the gentleman yield? Gentleman yields back. The oh. gentleman yield? Oh, the gentleman yields. Yield, yield to uh, Mr. Morgan Griffith. I thank the gentleman for yielding, uh, Mr. Chu. Earlier, we had submitted into evidence the tick tight Bite Dance and their ties to the Chinese Communist Party report that was filed as an exhibit last week with the Senate in Australia. If you have any comment, I'd like to get it on this paragraph out of their summary. Our research confirms beyond any plausible doubt that TikTok is owned by ByteDance. ByteDance is a PRC company, and ByteDance is subject to all the influence, guidance, and de facto control to which the Chinese Communist Party now subjects all PRC technology companies. We show in this report how the CCP and the PRC state agencies together, the party state, have extended their ties into ByteDance to the point that the company can no longer be accurately described as a private enterprise. You keep calling it a private enterprise, but all the countries in the world are saying it's not a private enterprise, it's part of the Chinese Communist Party. What say you, sir, yes or no? Is it part of the Chinese Communist Party, as everybody thinks, or are you still living in some mystical world? I disagree with many conclusions. So you're living in the mystical world, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes Ms. The Democrat, oh, sorry, right? Yep. Sorry. The lady, gentle lady from Minnesota, Ms. Craig, for five minutes. Well, thank you so much, Madam Chair, for yielding. Mr. Chu, I'm, I'm probably like a lot of parents uh, who are also members of Congress out here. I know um, a number of us. When you testified earlier today, you mentioned that uh, the over 35 segment was a growing uh, group of potential users. Um, as if over 35 is old, and I realize that my own children uh, think uh, that I'm ancient, our four boys. But like a lot of us up here, um, we understand that there is some potential good. And of course, many of your influencers are doing what they're doing for all the right reasons. But one thing in your testimony you said a lot was safety. But as a mother and as a member of Congress and as someone 
who is very concerned about drug use in our country. I was surprised that that didn't come up once in your testimony, no real reference to it here today. You know, I've raised my concerns in general about social media platforms serving as an illegal marketplace for drugs in prior big tech hearings, and I plan to continue that focus during today's hearing. Mr. Chu, a March 8th, 2023 article in the Washington Post detailed the fact that TikTok has made little progress in combating the sale of illegal drugs on your platform. In fact, Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser said that getting drugs on platform like yours was nearly as convenient as using a phone to order a pizza or call an Uber. That same article mentions that law enforcement agencies have been frustrated by TikTok's lack of competition in the form of data sharing. In my view, TikTok has taken little action in response to this crisis. According to a May 2022 blog post from TikTok, you donated $125,000, or 0.001% of your 22 revenue to an anti-drug effort on your platform in the form of ad credits. You also redirected hashtag drugs, hashtag fentanyl, and other obvious hashtags away from posts selling drugs to a community resources page as if a teenager looking for drugs is going to look for them at hashtag drugs. Drug dealers have easily worked their way around this using emojis and slang to communicate that they have drugs for sale. To this day, it is possible for anyone to log into your platform and acquire drugs. And the consequences of that can be fatal. What are you doing to move past these token efforts to prevent teenagers from accessing drugs on your platform? Look, as parents up here today, uh, we, not, we may not understand everything about your platform. I'm not an, a tech guru. Many of us up here may not use exactly the right language, but we know when our kids are at risk, and our kids are at risk on your platform. So. What are you going to do to move past these previous token efforts? Um, Congresswoman, we do take illegal, illegal drugs um, content on our platform very seriously. It violates our guidelines to proactively identify and remove them. And as you pointed out, if anybody searches for any drugs on our platform, we do point them to, point them to resources um, to help them with that. At the same time, we have also taken product changes. Like, for example, we don't allow our under-16 users to use direct messaging. And the reason is because, you know, we wanted to, there was a trade-off here. And uh, we believe that, you know, it will protect these younger users better from getting, con from getting contacts from people trying to push illegal activity. So we will continue to work on it. The, again, no company can be perfect at this. We're Ms. not saying Mr. we are. Mr. Chu, I, I, with all due respect, the no company can be turf perfect line has been used way too much today. I'm going to reclaim my time. You know, clearly in the three plus hours you've been before us today, what you're saying about Project Texas just doesn't pass the smell test. My constituents are concerned that TikTok and the Chinese Communist Party are controlling their data and seeing our own vulnerabilities. If you were an American company, we could look at your 10K, we could see who your shareholders are, the answer you provided earlier today, you'd rather not tell us what your compensation is or how it's derived. Well, no American CEO would like to tell us that, but they have to because they're an American company. So what you're doing down in Texas, it's all well and good, but it is not enough for us to be convinced that our privacy is not at risk. So how can you say that you're protecting American users' privacy with the CCP being so heavily involved with bike dance? It's not possible. China won't even carry your product. How is it that you can convince us that our privacy is not at risk? And more than that, our kids' privacy is not at risk in this country. In my opening statement, Thank you, Madam General, Chair. General Lady's time has expired. We're, we're going to have to continue on. Gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Allen's um, recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Chu, for being here today. September 2021, the Wall Street Journal published an article titled, How TikTok Serves Up Sex and Drug Videos to Minors. This article gives a chilling depiction of the types of content that TikTok's uh, algorithm is cur curating for our children. This article claims that your application served an account that was registered as a 13-year-old, quote, videos about drug use. Referenced, uh, it referenced to, to co cocaine, meth addiction, and promotional videos for online sales of drugs. The alg algorithm was also found to have delivered countless videos uh, depicting, quote, pornography and other adult content. Uh, to the device of an account that was registered as a 13-year-old, could you please explain to the members of this committee and parents across the country why your company deems it acceptable for such inappropriate content to be prominently featured on a child's for you page? The, uh, a lot of the content that you mentioned, Congressman, are violative of our, of our own policies, and we, are, we don't think they're acceptable, and we will remove them when we identify them. We take this very seriously. I mentioned this. This is an industry-wide challenge. We're investing as much as we can. We don't think it represents the majority of the user's experience on TikTok, but it does happen. Um, some bad actors try and come in and post some of this content, and we're doing our best to invest as much as we can to remove them. Well, I would say you're not doing enough. I have 14 grandchildren, Mr. Chu. Do you personally believe that such content is appropriate for minor children to consume? A lot of the content that you mentioned, like uh, porn, for example, is not allowed on our platform. So no, I do not think they're acceptable for young people to consume. Earlier this week, the Wall Street Journal published an article titled, quote, TikTok's Chinese partner has another, another wildly popular app in the US. This app is called CapCut, is a video editing tool to help users go viral on TikTok. While for obvious reasons, most of our attention is focused on TikTok and bike dance, other companies and their applications are also continuing to exploit the privacy of Americans. TikTok, CapCut, Lark, FaceU, all of these apps are also controlled by bike dance and pose serious privacy concerns. In 2022, it was reported that Top Buzz, an international version of bike dance censored Chinese news app, was used to spread pro-China messages to Americans. When it comes to the data privacy of Americans, we must have a clear set of guidelines to ensure Americans' data is protected and not passed along to unknown third-party actors who could pose a threat to our security. I urge my colleagues to continue to work together to pass a national data privacy bill, not just one out of the House Energy uh, in Commerce Committee, but also through the House of this Congress. It is the only systematic way we can address privacy concerns. Unfortunately, I've been given no reason to believe that TikTok does not pose a threat and cannot be trusted to follow our laws when they conflict with the desires of the Chinese Communist Party. Your firewall that you're talking about, uh, if you had a bad actor in your um, what you call your Texas uh, initiative could get through that firewall and send any information that they wanted to send anywhere direct to the, and to, directly to the Chinese Communist Party. Would you deny that? Congressman, this risk that you talk about exists for every company, bad actors. I'm talking about company. TikTok, sir. In fact, the risk is lower for us because these... It is a risk, correct? The, the personnel will be vetted. So the yeah. risk is actually lower than most companies in the industry. Well, that is why we have to deal with your company. And uh, with that, uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Peters, for five, five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Chu, um, thanks for being here today. Uh, you know, your testimony discusses an effort your company has named Project Texas and the investments your company has made in creating a firewall between the United States user data and entities in China susceptible to influence by China's government. And with your company's recent announcement by CFIUS uh, that, um, that CFIUS has instructed TikTok to separate itself from ByteDance or face a ban, TikTok's commitment to retaining this firewall is at a crossroads. 
So I want to ask you some questions about your company's long-term plans to ensure the safety and security of American data. And this, for me, is the crux of the concern for me about TikTok. First of all, does the Chinese government need to approve Project, Project Texas for TikTok to agree to it? Uh, Congressman, we have designed Project Texas um, to move forward in the United States. This is something that we have described at length in the written testimony and in my opening statement. The firewall of American data on, stored on American soil by an American company overseen by American right. personnel. This, but, this is designed to move forward in the United States. But does the Chinese government need to approve Project Texas for you to agree to it? We do not believe so. Um, um, how is TikTok considering the future of Project Texas in the event of a sale or other ownership changes? Are there elements of the Project Texas that TikTok, TikTok would change prior, uh, prior to? Or? I cannot speak on this hypothetical or on, you know, yeah, on potential, you know, owners who I cannot represent. Okay. You don't know? I don't know. Yes. Uh, despite Project Texas's planned positive changes, it does include several broad exceptions that would allow large amounts of U.S. user data to routinely leave the country. I want to know a little bit more about these exceptions so I can understand whether Project Texas can live to up, up to its promise protecting Americans' user, user data. I understand that under Project Texas, business data and public data will be permitted to regularly leave the United States. Is that correct? Um, almost all the data is under the that's not public. It's under the definition of protected data. This accepted data that you mentioned, I can get back to your team on this, is really for interoperability purposes, to make sure that the business can still operate and American users are still getting the benefit well, can you tell us of a global what data, platform. What data where the data goes and how it's used by the company? It will travel outside of the United States, um, but I can get back to you on the specifics. It's okay. data that doesn't, it cannot be used to identify users, you know, so it really is data that ensures the interoperability of the platform. And I understand that I think we would want, we would want to have some understanding of how, how we would distinguish that by definition and then also how it would be enforced. I, I can get back to you on those specifics. Um, how is the U.S. data used to promote certain content back in the United States market, for instance? I'm sorry? So, um, what you'll have uh, U.S. U.S. data feed the, all right. Um, it, how, how, can you discuss, when you discuss where the data goes and how it's used by the company, how and at what points of data transfer does the U.S. data feed the PRC developed algorithm used by TikTok? How would the data that you're talking about? We, we, TikTok does not, it's not available in mainland China. The, it, PR, the PRC developed algorithm used by TikTok, how does US data get fed by that? The, the US, the algorithm that leads to the US app is in the Oracle cloud infrastructure and is trained by US and global data. Again, TikTok does not, is not available in mainland China. How can we trust that these exceptions for Project Texas won't be used, abused by China's government or by foreign adversaries? We can, we, this is the fourth commitment, transparency, third party monitors, including the definitions of these um, exceptions and you know, we, want to, we can be very transparent on how they're used. Okay, I guess, I guess my question will be that you wanna get back to me in writing, that's fine, but how we would distinguish between the data for interoperability that you suggest needs to be shared with what data wouldn't be shared? Okay. It, it, it's, um, again, you know, it's, um, first of all, public data is not part of the protected data definition because public data is what users want to share globally. So if you post a video and you want someone in France to see it, just by definition, it has to leave the United States. Otherwise, the world cannot see it. Now, there are certain aggregated um, and anonym, anonymized data sets that's useful for interoperability for, for advertising, for example. Right. And that is um, part of what we're talking about. Right. I can get back to you on the specifics, but... I think we'd also want to know how it's anonymized and how, what, what oversight and enforcement we can count on. Okay, I, I can get back to you on specifics. Thank you, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fluger is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Chu, I gotta I got hand it to you. You've actually done something that in the last three to four years has not happened except for the exception of maybe Vladimir Putin. You have unified Republicans and Democrats. And if only for a day, we're actually unified because we have serious concerns. Uh, do you, does TikTok support good? I mean, is TikTok a platform for good? Just yes or no? I believe yes. Okay. Uh, does TikTok support freedom of speech? Yes, it's one of the commitments I've given this committee. Do you personally support the First Amendment? Um, Congressman, I'm here to talk about As the about CEO TikTok. of TikTok? 
I'm here to talk about TikTok. As the CEO of TikTok, do you TikTok support TikTok supports freedom Thank of you. speech. Thank um, you. Does TikTok support genocide? Again, Congressman, I'm here to talk about TikTok. Does TikTok support genocide? Does TikTok? No. Yeah, but, okay, thank you. Okay, but so, I'm here to talk uh, about reclaiming my time. Um, I'm going to go to a, uh, a video uh, now, and, and it's from Inez Cantor Freedom. And I'd like you to see Inez Cantor Freedom, who has spent his entire career post-MBA fighting against human rights violations in, within the Chinese Communist Party. Go ahead and play uh, this video, which highlights uh, a situation uh, that allegedly shows some human rights violations inside China. Please play. <laughs> Mr. Chu, this was a video that was posted on TikTok by Inez Cantor Freedom. Are you familiar with uh, this basketball player? I'm not familiar with the specifics yeah. of this, but I can tell you that- Are you familiar with the player Inez Cantor Freedom? Congressman, I'm not, specific, I'm not okay, familiar you're the with this. You, have, you just have to open TikTok and just search for this kind okay. of content. It, it really exists. Does, I, I've read the moderation policy. Let me just quote what uh, you've talked about content moderation. TikTok has a moderation policy, yes? We do have uh, community okay. guidelines. That one, of the, uh, one of the guidelines says material that in the sole judgment of TikTok is objectionable. Is this an example banning NS Cantor freedom? Is that an example of objectionable material inside the Chinese Communist Party in mainland China? We do not, we do not take down content simply what? because it's critical of he China. He was banned we one week after this video. Uh, we do not, um, we do not do that. And if, I can if check you, on if, you need a, if you need a note, go ahead. The note says he's not banned. <laughs> his, his account yeah. was taken off uh, one well, week after. We can check on the specifics. We, we can check. Yeah. So uh, let, let, let's get to some other questions. Um, thank you for the slide. Uh, your privacy uh, policy states that you collect a great array of data, keystroke uh, patterns, app file names and types, sometimes approximate location, GPS location. Um, are keystroke patterns and rhythms part of TikTok gathering, uh, the data that is gathered by TikTok? Uh, if you're talking, uh, Congressman, specifically about keystrokes, you know, keystrokes, we do not, we do not engage in keystroke logging to monitor what the users say is to identify bots. Okay. It's for security purposes, and this is a standard you, industry practice. You, you gather a lot of data, safe to say. We don't, get them, we don't believe we gather more than any other social media company. TikTok gathers a lot of data because your value proposition, as you sat in my office and told me, was to connect people to each other around the world. You told me this in my office. So you gather data on what they like and what they don't like, and then you show them things that they don't know they like, but eventually they may. You told me this. I, I think that's, uh, uh, I don't think that's what I said. What I said is that <laughs> are, we connect are, people together, yes. Are you, uh, I'm These are interest signals, and that doesn't mean that we collect are, more are data. Are you aware other of any instances of TikTok distributing content from Chinese state media? I'm sorry? Are you aware of any instances of TikTok distributing content from Chinese state media on the platform? We will label them clearly to, for our users to understand that. Do you disagree with FBI Director Ray and NSA Director Nakasone? when they said that the CCP could have the capability to manipulate data and send it to the United States? Do you disagree with their statement? Their, their statement says could. Uh, so do you disagree with that? No, I don't disagree with that. Okay, so it is possible that the CCP, under the auspices of ByteDance, which is your parent company, which you get paid from, has the ability to manipulate content that is being shared with 130 million Americans, yes? C Congressman, I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding all these questions. I don't disagree with them that there are data risks in general. That's what I meant. There's a big data risk but because- on, on us specifically- Are there engineers located inside mainland China that work on TikTok? Not Douyin, but TikTok. They are, we are not the only company that has that. Are there engineers inside mainland China currently working on the algorithm for TikTok? Congressman, like I said, as you told other, me in my there office, other, there are other companies that, as I told you in your office, there are other By the companies way, I'm going to reclaim my time. Uh, please rename your project. Texas is not the appropriate name. We stand for freedom and transparency, and we don't want your project. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentle lady from Tennessee is recognized for five minutes, Mrs. Harshberger. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Chu, for being here today. Um, both President Trump and now President Biden have backed forcing TikTok to sell to an American company. However, the Chinese Communist Party has put export controls on algorithms, ByteDance owns, that power TikTok. 
And of course, this has created a gauntlet of regulatory hurdles in China and the US that prevented the sale of TikTok. Now, as a longtime business owner, I want to tell you, Mr. Chu, that waiting until your hands are forced uh, will only drive down the price of your app. And right now, both your hands are tied. And you're going to have to make a deci decision about whether you choose freedom from the CCP or you continue to be an agent of the CCP. And I, I'll tell you why I say it that way. As a former member of Homeland Security, I point blank ask FBI Director Ray. Is TikTok a national security threat? And without hesitation, sir, he looked at me and said, yes, Congresswoman, it is. Now, how much data is ByteDance collecting through TikTok that's worth continuing to fight this regulatory gauntlet? Uh, you know, why not take the money and run like any other company would do? Congresswoman, we built Project Texas in order to safeguard. And we listen to the concerns that have been raised, and we are building something that's unprecedented that no other company is offering to protect US user interests. And we believe it is rigorous and robust. And it, you know, we are even offering third party transparency and monitors to come in to verify this. Frankly, I haven't heard any good reason why this doesn't work. I've heard, I've heard a lot of I've heard a lot of rhetoric around this, but I haven't heard a good reason why it doesn't work. Well, I look forward to these conversations, by the way, yeah, with, with absolutely. you. Absolutely. Well, let me, uh, let me go down this road. When TikTok was unveiled to the public, its business model was solely based on generating revenue from advertising. Of course, ByteDance operated a separate app called Doyen for the Chinese marketplace. TikTok is embarking on becoming a so-called super app. In other words, it's a one-stop shop with everything you do, as uh, Representative Fulcher said. It's reported that TikTok's algorithms are so powerful that owner ByteDance has begun to license it to other companies. TikTok's recommendation engine drives usage on the platform, and this leads to promises of quick exposure and fame that leads to, pe leads to even more people joining. And when you sign up, TikTok starts collecting data about you, your location, your gender, your age, your facial data. The user never gets to the end of the content. And that's by design. And obviously, that makes you a lot of money. Now, I know that the Chinese Communist Party is preventing ByteDance from selling TikTok due to export restrictions on the technology. And this causes me to question, how are you going to power TikTok with your Oracle servers located in the US with that Texas project with ByteDance technology if it can't leave China, how's that going to happen? I just want you to explain how it's going to happen. Um, Congresswoman, the way that we designed this is so that any piece of software, software that is uh, impactful to the code that enters, you know, uh, the uh, that some technical details around this will be reviewed by a third party um, or a few third party monitors just to make sure that we're all comfortable with the code. I want to say this again. I don't know of any other, com other company in my industry who is offering this level of transparency. Well, why are there two different versions of apps, one in China and one in the United States? It's just a different business. Hmm. Well, I think we all know the reason uh, that the Chinese get a different version, because ByteDance puts China first and America last. And, you know, TikTok has, with everything we've heard today, sir, when you see 13-year-olds, 16-year-olds, you see the degradation that's happening to our youth and our society. You know, it's deceptive, and it's destructive comment, and it's comments, and the worst thing is that it's deliberate, sir. And that's not acceptable. And with that, Chairwoman, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Gentlelady from Iowa, Ms. Miller-Meeks, recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and i uh, just like to thank our witness, Mr. Chu, uh, having been in, uh, in the hot seat, so to speak, uh, before when I was in uh, State Senate. Uh, I know how uh, challenging this can be, and thank you for your demeanor throughout all of this. Uh, but certainly, as you can see, in a bipartisan way, we have concerns, and those concerns are valid. Um, and this is a yes or no question. Does TikTok track users' individual keystrokes? Only for security purposes, for, like, for example, like detecting bots, but we don't monitor what users say. 
So the only purpose that you would monitor keystrokes is for security purposes. I can get back to you on more specifics, but this is not unlike what many other companies in the industry does. So the keystroke monitoring does not go beyond what common industry practice in comparison to platforms like Facebook or Instagram use? Yes, I, yes, I believe so. Okay. Um, and does TikTok keep records of users' credit cards and passwords? I'm not aware of that. You, you don't need that to log in. Of course, I can get back to you on specifics if you make a transaction on an e-commerce platform. But regardless, all that US data will be stored within the Project Texas firewall, um, you know, uh, within the Oracle Cloud infrastructure and overseen by American personnel. So you would store credit card and password information? Uh, I, I need to check on the specifics. We are launching a you know, pilot e-commerce plan, and we're making sure that that data is very secure within the Oracle Cloud infrastructure. I think you've made a point of saying that uh, your platform is not different than other platforms on social media, uh, and therefore are no more responsible than Facebook or Instagram or, or Twitter or the other social media platforms. The concern, however, comes with where the technology is generated and whom it is owned by. And in the case of other companies, it is generated in the U.S. under U.S. guidelines, under U.S. privacy laws with, with certain parameters versus uh, generated through a parent company, ByteBands, which as we know, is, um, is susceptible to the laws of the Chinese Communist Party, which has access to all of that uh, data and information. Um, and I understand that uh, TikTok has just reinstated Enos Cantor's account um, uh, recently. Uh, so our concern and the question I have for you is, why would China or the Chinese Communist Party be opposed to a forced sell of TikTok? I cannot speak on behalf of the Chinese government. I can say that we designed Project Texas to take it forward here in the United States. And again, I believe it offers unprecedented um, protection for US user data. Yeah, I think the problem is when there is a lack of transparency, then that leads people to believe that there's something more nefarious and that there is in fact data that is, is captured, is stored, and poses a risk not only to children in the United States, uh, but also poses a risk national security. With that, I yield the rest of my time uh, to my colleague, Jay Obernolte. I uh, thank the gentlelady from Iowa for yielding. Uh, Mr. Chu, I'd like to continue our discussion about Project Texas and the technical details about what you're proposing to do. So uh, you are migrating all storage of US user data to the Oracle Cloud infrastructure, uh, and you think that that'll be done by the end of the year, was that right? Um, again, I can get back to you on the technical, um, the technical parts of it. The, the migration, today by default, all US, new US data is stored okay, by just, default. I'm, sir, I'm just using what you said in your testimony at, in your opening here. So, uh, it, it is stored there by default. What, okay. I'm, what I said in my testimony is I'm deleting legacy data. This is Virginia okay. and Singapore. That's so the difference. Who, when this migration is complete, who will have access to that data? Uh, right now, a team called TikTok U.S. Data Security, US led by US. American personnel, uh -huh. they have access to that. We have began this uh, operations already. Okay, but the app itself has access to the data, correct? Um, only through them. You know, any employees that have the data are well, through no, What them. I mean is, like, if I use, lose my iPhone and I reinstall the app and I put in my username and password, my app will reconnect to the mothership and download some of that data. My I uh, That's, that, that's not the way it works, no. Uh, that's not. not the way it works. It, it will go through the Oracle Cloud infrastructure and that team that no, looks no. after this. Yes, I realize that. So let me ask you this. What would prevent then someone with detailed technical knowledge of the way the app is constructed from creating an almost identical version of the app that could also access that data? They are, that's what we are giving you third party um, monitors and transparency. Yeah, but they're monitoring the source code for your app. I mean, the ByteDance. These engineers have been working on this app for years. What would prevent them from making an app that could also Cong access that data? Congressman, I think we're going into the area where, you know, what if there's a hacker? What if there is this? Okay. You know, if, this if is a common could, industry problem, as you know. Fine. Well, I mean, yeah. it's just, it, I, I see my time's expired. It illustrates the point. Okay. I'm just skeptical that you're technically Gentleman's able to do Gentleman's time is expired. Gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. Chu, I recognize that we have run over. Um, I appreciate your time. We have just a few members left and would appreciate the chance for them to get to answer or ask their five minutes worth of questions. Gentlemen from 
Virginia, Mr. Griffith is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Mr. Chu, you share legal counsel lawyers with ByteDance, yes or no? Yes, we do. And you testified that you prepared extensively with your legal team for this hearing, yes or no? Uh, with my team in D.C., including the Including some of your legal counsel? Yes. All right. And did they tell you about the report uh, to the Australian Senate of March 14th that I referenced earlier? Did they tell you that that report was out there, yes or no? I cannot recall how I found out about the report. But you know about the report. I, I can check. Okay. And, yeah. and did they tell you to favorably cite the Citizens Lab in your written testimony today, yes or no? Congressman, I need to get back to you on specifics. They helped you with the preparation of your written statement, though, didn't they? A team prepares, yes. Yes. And did they tell you that the director of Citizen Lab says he has called out your company for misrepresenting their report repeatedly and, has, and did so as late as yesterday? Did they tell you about that, yes or no? C Congressman, the Citizen Lab is saying they cannot prove a negative, which is what I've been trying to do for the last four hours. All right. But you cited it favorably as saying that it did positive things for you. That being said, let me ask you this. You keep talking about transparency. But you haven't been transparent with us here today. You were asked earlier by Mr. Hudson if you own stock in ByteDance. You said you didn't want to reveal that. Well, we're trying to figure out what the ties are between ByteDance and TikTok. I'm not going to ask you how many shares you own, but do you own shares in ByteDance, sir? Yes, I do. All right, there you go. How about in TikTok? Right now, all employees own shares in one. Yeah, sure. Entity. I expected that. I just don't understand why you didn't tell Mr. Hudson that and we're transparent earlier. Instead, you made us drag it out of you. All right. Now, let's talk about the kids. You told uh, several of our folks that there was a 60-minute deadline. You also told us that if you were under the age of 18, you couldn't access the live section, uh, the live option. So I texted my 17-year-old and my 15-year-old, and I basically got scoffs back, scoffs, when I said, are you all limited to 60 minutes? My older son said, well, there is a notice I get from time to time that says I shouldn't be on more than 60 minutes, but it never has kicked me off. And my younger son said, oh, I'm on as long as I want to be. So I'm just informing you, whoever told you, particularly if it was your legal team, that that's not accurate that they're on for more than 60 minutes and they can access the live section. I believe it was Mr. Carter that you said they couldn't under 18 access the live, you know, being on live section. He's done it. So whatever it is you think you're doing, it ain't getting done. Now, let's talk about the law for a minute. You share legal team, but you keep talking about how you got a firewall between you and bike dance. You can't have an effective firewall under the United States interpretation of such if you're sharing legal counsel because anything that you say to your legal counsel, they can share internally. If you've got the same lawyers, now maybe you have two different teams of lawyers in the law firm, but that's not what you said to us today. You said you share lawyers. There is no firewall legally. I'm just telling you. So if you want to clean it up and be transparent, you need to do something about that. Wouldn't you agree, yes or no, uh, that you need to do something about that? Congressman, I, I respectfully, You'll look into it. I I, yeah. You'll look into it. You've been looking into it all the time. All right, you told Dr. Burgess when asked uh, if your employees, if, if, if your employees who were members of the Chinese Communist Party had access to TikTok data from the U.S., you said you didn't know who was a member of the Communist Party. But then, Congressman Wal to Congressman Wahlberg, you said that the CEO of TikTok was not a member of the, communist, of the Chinese Communist Party. And to Congressman Kelly, you said the founder of TikTok was not a member of the Ch Communist Chinese Party. Sir, either you know who is and isn't a member of the Chinese Communist Party or you don't. Which one is it? I submit that you know and you just aren't giving us the straight story. Clearly, you know, but you denied that to Congressman, Dr. Burgess. I, I can ask one or two people, but we have no policy to ask all the employees. I can ask one or two people, but I, you know, who are in... in but uh, it's reasonable to position. assume that with a significant number of members of the, of the country, of China, being members of the Chinese Communist Party, logic would tell us, you're a logical man, I assume, logic would tell us that there are a fair number of your employees who are members of the Chinese Communist Party, at least a dozen or so, who have access to this data. Isn't that so? 
again, like I said, I can ask one or two people. I, right. We don't so have a policy to ask everybody. I said earlier, you're, you're living in some kind of a cloud world because either you know or you don't know. Yeah. I yield back. Thank you, ma'am. Gentleman from South Carolina, Chair recognizes for five minutes, Mr. Duncan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think what's been revealed today, there's not a degree of separation between uh, Byte Dance and TikTok. I'd like to enter in the record uh, Heritage Foundation document, uh, TikTok generation, a CCP official in every pocket. Without objections, so ordered. And I'd like to yield the balance of my time to Kelly Armstrong from North Dakota. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Chu, the TikTok privacy policy details extensive data collection on users. One line states that we may collect information about you from other publicly available sources. What publicly available data is TikTok collecting and adding to the profiles of users? It will be publicly available, but I can get back to you on specifics. Okay, what is the purpose of obtaining even more data on your users beyond the data collected from the platform? We collect um, uh, data, we want to give our users, by the way, a lot of transparency on what data we collect. We give them choices on the controls of their own privacy settings. And it really is to serve them a better experience. This is the reason why so many people love the app. It's a great experience. So how does, so how does the non-TikTok related data service provide, or relate to the service provided? I, I, I need to check the specifics and understand the question and get back to you. Okay, yeah. do you think the average TikTok user knows that you are, and understands that TikTok's data collection extends to information outside the use of the app? We do give um, tr um, transparent information on this. And like I said, we, I, we don't, I don't believe we collect more information than most other social media platforms out there. Well, and the reason I ask this is because I'm gonna go back into the uh, corporate structure. You, you described that TikTok is a subsidiary of ByteDance. Uh, Mr. Griffith just said that you guys share the same lawyers. You have stated that your direct report is the CEO of ByteDance, but you've also stated that at certain levels, TikTok operates without direct daily control from ByteDance. You have used content moderation as an example for that. TikTok's privacy policy states that, uh, that, states that you may share user data within your corporate group. Does that corporate group include ByteDance? Um, if you are talking about that one entity that has the share the, for the for Chinese media licensing purposes. I think it's called Beijing Douyin Services. We're talking about that entity of the government share. The answer is, you know, we have cut off, you know, all access of uh, US data sets to that. So employees of the entity. <laughs> but your user privacy, so your corporate group, ByteDance is part of your corporate group. Uh, ByteDance is the, is, the, is the top company. So, so yeah, with, you're talking about the other, entities within the group. So you just testified that you firewalled this. Does that statement, so you're saying the TikTok's executives you've, that operate independently of ByteDance, but does that statement not hold for sharing of access to data? Uh, well, I, I was talking about that one entity that has, um, that many of you have raised some concerns, you know, that's the, that's the entity that I'm talking about. The entity with the, the uh, Chinese government's um, investment that has, that is for the purpose of Chinese um, internet licensing for the Chinese business. Well, let me ask TikTok. it a different way. What other entities have access to TikTok user data? Well, after Project Texas, we're gonna move it so that only um, uh, TikTok user data security has, ex has control the access of that data. Okay, so, and we could bring you back either in after Project Texas is done, but right now, what other entities have access to TikTok's user data? Today. Only by requirement, it's really only by requirement. Uh, certain employees may use we need to uh, require some access of data to help build the product. Um, but for US, you know, we have moved it for Project Texas, and by the end of this year, it will be firewalled away. But this is your privacy policy today. Like, I, I understand what you're telling us what's potentially gonna happen in the future. I have concerns again about CFIUS and government involvement, private organization, all of that. I'm just saying, this is your user agreement today. So your user agreement says that you share access with your corporate group. You know, you're, you're telling me what's going to happen whenever Project Texas gets done. I'm asking you today, who has access to TikTok's user data? Uh, in our user agreement, Congressman, uh, in our privacy policy, we, have, we also added a link so that our users in the U.S. can be informed about Project Texas. The link is there. So the link is there to private, but I understand what you're trying to do moving forward. I have my own concerns about that, but we're sitting here today in a hearing and your privacy, your privacy policy is different than your testimony. Your privacy policy specifically says that you can share user data within your corporate group. 
So are you saying even though your your privacy policy says that you're not doing it? Uh, like I said, no, I don't think it, there's any contradiction here. Like I said, Project Texas, when it's done, we firewall off that data. We still have some legacy data in Virginia and Singapore that we started deleting and will be done by the end of this year. So at the end of this year, then you won't share it. Does that mean you're sharing it today? I don't, I don't believe so, but there is some data. And why there. haven't you changed your privacy policy? Why haven't you, we, we why did, haven't you updated it? We did update it, and we gave our users more information on Project Texas. We did update it. Sorry. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Texas. Chair recognizes for five minutes Mr. Crenshaw. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chu, for uh, bringing Republicans and Democrats together. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, I want to get right to the critical point of concern. So TikTok is able to collect massive amounts of personal data. We all know that. That means it could, if it desired to, use this data to influence narratives and trends, create misinformation campaigns, encourage self-destructive behavior, purposefully allow drug cartels to communicate freely and organize human and drug trafficking. And to be fair, all social media companies could do that. But here's the difference. It is only TikTok that is controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. All these other social media companies are not. Mr. Chu, do you agree that TikTok is controlled by the CCP? No. Okay, I thought you'd say that. I disagree, as you thought I might say. Um, here's why I disagree. Your, your parent company is ByteDance, right? That's correct. It is correct. So many of the workers who work at ByteDance, they're Communist Party members, right? I, I wouldn't know. Well, ex well, I think, for example, the, the chief editor at ByteDance, Zhang Vu Ping, is the Communist Party secretary, correct? He works on the Chinese business, not on TikTok. Right. He works for ByteDance. The parent he works company. on the Chinese business. Right, the parent company of TikTok. The Chinese business is uh, called Douyin. Yeah, but it's all associated with ByteDance, right? Um, so ByteDance owns a number of businesses. Right, they are you all report to ByteDance. Everybody's part of ByteDance, okay? And do, do you know of any other employees that work for ByteDance that are part of the Chinese Communist Party? Like I said, you know, they are, ByteDance has, owns Chinese businesses and they operate in China. You don't know how many, but you acknowledge many must be card-carrying members of the CCP, right? In the Chinese business, yes. I mean, yeah, I mean, the CCP holds a what's called a golden share in ByteDance that allows the CCP to control one board seat in ByteDance. That's publicly That's reported. not correct. It's not they correct? Said, it's no, been it's publicly correct. reported. Would, they admitted it's, to it. It's, it's, you can, uh, on our website, we have updated it, so we have, can give people more transparent information right. on this. They have a share in a subsidiary that is only for the Chinese business. It has nothing to do with TikTok. And oh, okay. it's for the purposes of content licensing in China. So there, there's not an internal CCP committee, which is a, a regular thing that happens in China. They have a CCP committee internally inside the company. I, I run TikTok. I, I cannot represent Byte the Chinese Dance. business. Talking about ByteDance. No arrangement in ByteDance. So uh, here, again, here's, here, here's the main point of concern. China's 2017 national intelligence law states very clearly that, quote, any organization or citizen shall support, assist, and cooperate with state intelligence work in accordance with the law and maintain the secrecy of all knowledge of state intelligence work. In other words, ByteDance and also your TikTok employees that live in China, they must cooperate with Chinese intelligence whenever they are called upon. And if they are called upon, they're bound to secrecy. That would include you. So Mr. Chu, if the CCP tells ByteDance to turn over all data that TikTok has collected inside the US, even within Project Texas, do they have to do so, according to the Chinese law? Con Congressman, first, I'm, I'm Singaporean. Um, That's fine, yeah. but there are employees of yours and ByteDance is in China. We, we understand this concern. In my opening statement, we said, we hear these concerns, we didn't try to avoid them or you know, trivialize them. We built something where we take that data and put it out of reach. This is what we did. We put it out of reach. Out of reach, but they own you. No, we put it out of reach by, by storing dance, them. ByteDance owns TikTok. If ByteDance is told, and, and the CCP owns ByteDance, because the CCP, CCP owns everybody in China. Well, and so we, by law, they can make them do whatever they want, and they say that by law, you can't tell anyone about it. So they can make you hand over that data. Is that correct? The data is stored here in American soil by an American well, company you say that. overseen we, by American We thought that, but leaked audio from 80 internal TikTok meetings shows that U.S. user data has been repeatedly accessed from China when you said it hasn't been. And here's the other thing, following back on my, 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 my colleague's line of questioning, in your own privacy policy, it says that you may share information within your so-called corporate group. Is ByteDance part of that corporate group? If you're talking about this, the share of the, the entity with, right. the, with the share, 
I, like I shared so this, with uh, the previous... Um, is ByteDance part of the corporate group? ByteDance as a holding company is, is part of the corporate group, yes. It's part of the corporate group. Yeah. Okay, so your own privacy policy says you have to share data with ByteDance. And if the CCP says, hey, ByteDance, you're going to do what we say, and you can't tell anyone about it because by law, according to that 2017 uh, national intelligence law, they have to do it. That's our concern. Maybe That's you haven't done it yet, but my point is that you might have to. And that's where our concerns come from. I mean, over, over 300 TikTok employees have worked for China's state-run propaganda media. That's just from looking at their LinkedIn profiles. Okay, so here, and, and my last point is this. I want to say this to all the teenagers out there and, and TikTok influencers who think we're just old and out of touch and don't know what we're talking about, trying to take away your favorite app. You may not care that your data is being accessed now, but it will be one day when you do care about it. And here's the real problem. With data comes power. They can choose what you see and how you see it. They can make you believe things that are not true. They can encourage you to engage in behavior that will destroy your life. Even if it is not happening yet, it could in the future. The long-term goal of the Chinese Communist Party is the demise of the American power, and that starts with our youth. At any moment, they could demand that all of TikTok's data be used to design an AI algorithm with the sole purpose of promoting Chinese interests and destroying our society from within. You want to know why that's Democrat? Why that's why Democrats and Republicans have come together on this? That's why we are so concerned. Thank you, and I yield back. Yep. Gentleman yields back. I remind the members they have ten business days to submit questions for the record, and I ask our witness to respond to the questions promptly. Pursuant to committee rules, I ask unanimous consent to enter the documents from the staff list into the record without objection. So ordered. Members should submit their questions by the close of business on April 6th. Without objection, the committee is adjourned. Committee Chair Kathy McMorris Rogers wrapping up the proceedings. Five hours of tough questions for TikTok CEO Xiao Chu by members of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. I'm Libby Casey, and I'm joined this afternoon to talk over what we just heard by opinions columnist James Homan, technology columnist Jeffrey Fowler. They're both here in the Washington Post newsroom, and live on Capitol Hill, Rhonda Colvin. Jeff, let's start with you. How useful was this hearing in terms of getting real commitments by members of Congress from TikTok CEO? I don't think we heard the TikTok CEO commit to anything new today, or frankly even give new information that would make people believe, make members of Congress believe and make folks at home believe that, uh, that the company should be trusted um, in the arrangements that it has promised um, to keep the, the, the Chinese government out of its, um, uh, of its control. So um, uh, if you're a parent who was watching today, uh, I don't think you come away feeling any more satisfied. Um, you know, there were really two different sets of concerns that we were being talked about today, right? There was the concern about Chinese control, potential Chinese control of TikTok. We didn't get any new evidence that that was happening, but we also didn't get um, uh, much new information to make us believe that it couldn't happen. I think it was Representative Crenshaw just said at the end there. Um, you've said that you haven't given data to the Chinese government. And he said, our concern is that you might have to. And that really was where we, we, we ended the day still with that. And, and indeed, uh, he acknowledged that, uh, not in the Crenshaw round, but a few rounds earlier with August Pfluger, he said, I don't disagree with that when he was asked about this threat assessment from the director of the FBI and the director of the National Security Agency, who said that in a hypothetical, if China invaded Taiwan, they could tweak the algorithm or they could for either influence operations or traditional espionage purposes, the Chinese government could, could force them to do something. And he said, I don't disagree with that. Uh, so it, it, a lot of bark got taken off of TikTok today. It was a, it was a rough day uh, for the, the corporation. Not only did parents not get assuaged, but I think anyone who had national security concerns also didn't get assuaged. And this is a question of actual users of TikTok, right. and we'll talk more in a little bit about how they felt about this mm -hmm. hearing and if they learned any more about how their data is being used and how they might have a future relationship with the app that they uh, use so regularly. I want to play one clip that uh, James was just talking about. This is Congressman Austin Pfluger of Texas. He really turned up the heat on TikTok's CEO and poking at this question of the relationship of parent company ByteDance to China. Let's listen. 
So it is possible that the CCP under the auspices of ByteDance, which is your parent company, which you get paid from, has the ability to manipulate content that is being shared with 130 million Americans, yes? C Congressman, I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding all these questions. I don't disagree with them that there are data risks in general. That's what I meant. There's a big data risk but because- on, on us specifically. Are there engineers located inside mainland China that work on TikTok? Not Doujian, but TikTok. They are, we are not the only company that has that. Are there engineers inside mainland China currently working on the algorithm for TikTok? Congressman, like I said, as you told other, me in my there office, are other, there are other companies that, as I told you in your office, there are By other the way, I'm going to reclaim my time. Uh, please rename your project. Texas is not the appropriate name. We stand for freedom and transparency, and we don't want your project. Okay, well, that's how the congressman responded with that 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 final pushback. But let's take a step back before that, Barb, to the content of what we heard. Yeah, and you heard some here here's there from the other members. Basically, the the content is that. There are people in China who are currently working on the algorithm. They're spending a billion and a half dollars. They have this project Texas. But the, until that is online, there are Chinese employees, Chinese nationals, who have access to this algorithm, who have access to this data. There's evidence that Chinese nationals have accessed this data in the past. Uh, in another round of, of questioning, Chu said that spying isn't the word I'd use. Uh, there was some Orwellian twists at point during that hearing where he talked about how they work on the algorithm in their transparency centers. Uh, obviously, it's a very secret algorithm. Uh, so uh, ultimately, they did get him to say, yes, the Chinese do have access to this material under the status quo. Let's go to Rhonda, who's on Capitol Hill and was in the hearing room for much of what transpired today. Rhonda, give us a sense of what Republicans were out to accomplish and what Democrats were out to accomplish and where uh, their goals aligned. Yeah, it appeared to be a unified front with this committee. Uh, all of the members seem to have very critical questions, uh, some more than others, but overall, this committee was very critical uh, from the start. And that's something that we previewed at the start of the day, that this was going to be a bit contentious, that this committee was prepared to have uh, a grilling of this CEO, since it's the first time he has been here on Capitol Hill. Uh, some of the themes that we heard, of course, we heard about national security concerns from members on both sides of the aisle. Uh, we heard about children and the impact on children's health. We heard about all of those things. But one of the things that still stood out to me by the end of the day is that there were so many, there were, was a variety of questions from all of these members. I mean, throughout the day, uh, we, of course, heard a, from a, a pediatrician who said that this could harm children. Uh, we heard from a woman, Annie Craig, a Democrat, who said uh, there was drug availability on uh, social media apps, and that was a concern for her. We heard from a member who was concerned, two members actually, who were concerned about misinformation uh, and how uh, the TikTok team would uh, debunk misinformation when it's targeting the Spanish-speaking community. So this uh, committee did seem to have some substance. Uh, I do not know if uh, the committee or the American public is uh, at rest or assured that uh, the data, data privacy concerns that we started the day off talking about uh, have, uh, that they've been assured that that things are, are any clearer. Uh, I think right now is the question of what happens next. This committee talked about how they have legislation looking at reforming Section 230. That's a part of U.S. code uh, that protects uh, Internet companies. That's a bit separate from just TikTok. Uh, but we'll see if uh, either the House or the Senate will be successful in some of the TikTok proposals that they already have introduced. Quick follow-up on that, Rhonda. You know, the question of Spanish language content, uh, we didn't hear any specifics. It was a lot of, I'll have to get back to you on that. I really want to nail down those numbers, so I'll get back to you on that. What happens now in terms of the accountability and the follow-up? That's exactly right. That's a good example of when he said he wanted to answer that question, and the Spanish-speaking community was uh, a big part of TikTok, but we really didn't hear any certain uh, assurances from him. And we saw that pattern throughout the day. Of course, he didn't have a lot of time to answer such specific questions, uh, but I believe from what we saw in the tone of this hearing that these lawmakers will probably keep this up. I do not see this as a hearing that was a one-and-done where they talked about 
about it. They have their public theater and then they all go home. I do think that there is mo movement and this is a unique time on the Hill uh, to address TikTok. I I've said it before throughout the show that I have seen more momentum, more talk of TikTok and having some sort of prohibitions or a full out ban more so than any other times. And uh, it's been years that TikTok legislation has been circulated around here. This is the first time where you're seeing members of both sides of the aisle say they want to do something. Now, what that will eventually look like, I'm not, not sure at this point, uh, but this, this committee may have given uh, a little bit more weight to the idea of a ban, especially uh, on uh, or curbing uh, with the use of uh, children, uh, because that was such a, that was another big part of this hearing, is showing the human impact of TikTok, having parents there. Uh, who uh, were impacted by their son's use of TikTok, talking about suicide stories uh, that are tied to TikTok. I, it, it's not a hard sell for this committee to tell the American public that uh, there are concerns about TikTok. Mm. Well, with me now is Taylor Lorenz, columnist covering technology and online culture. Taylor, thanks so much for joining us. You know, Rhonda brought up these great questions about how parents are reacting. Let's talk about how the users of TikTok are reacting to this hearing today. As you've checked in with content creators, how much were they, were they focused on this? Well, I mean, this is huge news on TikTok. You saw tons of people streaming the hearing live, um, discussing the content. Some creators hosted watch parties, you know, where their followers could discuss things in real time. Um, it's a big topic of conversation and people are feeling incredibly frustrated. And these TikTok users, by the way, are also parents. They're also teachers. You know, they're also people that go out in the world. This is not just like a bunch of kids. These are um, American citizens that are watching this you know, the whole thing unfold through through the lens of TikTok and getting frustrated. You know, Taylor, you brought up such an important point about just who the user base of TikTok is. Jeff pointed out to us that only one member of this 52 member House committee is known to have an active TikTok account. So um, when we're hearing these questions from a member of Congress, how representative do they feel to the people you've been talking to about their concerns and questions? I mean, from everyone I've talked to, I'm in a group chat with tons of TikTokers and I've spending, I was watching, you know, the trial or the trial, the hearing myself um, through the app. And I think that these lawmakers f seem completely detached from reality, um, you know, according to a lot of these TikTok users. Um, it's very clear that they have no understanding of how the app works, no understanding of its functionality, and no understanding of the broader social media landscape. You know, um, you saw them attributing YouTube and Facebook challenges to TikTok and things that, you know, they just seem deeply misinformed. And I think as you know, power users of TikTok, it's it's frustrating for them to look up there and see their lawmakers ask these questions and yet not address, you know, the issues that they actually care about. So, Taylor, you know, it, if you aren't used to watching these congressional hearings as like James and Rhonda and I are all the time, it may be a little bit surprising of how the back and forth goes, because there were many times where Shochu did not have a chance to even answer the question. He would start to open his mouth and they'd say, you know, my time is up and they'd bounce it off to somebody else. There were other times where he just demurred and wouldn't be pinned down and just really didn't answer a question. So what conversations are you hearing about the nature of a congressional hearing and whether or not it's really an opportunity for dialogue and answers? Well, I, I don't think anyone that I've spoken to considers it an opportunity for dialogue or answers. I don't think we got really either of those today. Um, I think people correctly assess that these lawmakers are out to get a soundbite. Um, you know, one person was like, they're just looking for clout. They're using this to get a YouTube clip, you know, that they hope will appear on cable news, but they don't seem to actually care about addressing you know, these actual really tough questions. As you mentioned, you know, they would ask these sort of ridiculous questions that were yes or no answers and then cut the CEO off. And I think a lot of users, actually, this is the first time that they've really seen the CEO of the app speak and they were hoping to kind of have him, you know, speak a little bit more um, broadly about some of the things they care about. But again, none of that was answered. You know, TikTok, one big thing I heard again and again is like TikTok is so integrated with, you know, the small business community here across America. And, you know, it's a huge um, way that 
that businesses reach, you know, customers. And um, a lot of people were saying, you know, like, I'm terrified of this TikTok ban. This would mean cutting off my entire income. What congressperson is going to talk about that? Why are we not, you know, why are we talking about all these other things that they don't consider relevant, um, you know, like ancient YouTube challenges? Mm. Uh, Jeff, and here we were thinking that members of Congress were actually much more with it in this hearing than they have been in other tech hearings and social media hearings. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing if I could ask to Taylor that I was really interested in is, so part of today was making the argument to Americans who are on TikTok and are skeptical about a ban that this is something that ought to be taken away from them. And I was really listening out for who was making that argument in a TikTok length uh, form. Members that, of Congress. Yeah, members of Congress that might cut through. And the one that I that sticks in my mind is Crenshaw at the end. And I'm really interested, interested to know, Taylor, if that cut through for you as well or someone else. What I heard him say is, uh, most clearly was, look, they can't prove that they will be able to always keep the Chinese government out, part one. And part two, hey, teenagers, hey, TikTok users, data is power, and when you hand p this power over to the Chinese government, they might shape your world. Mm -hmm. They might have some power of you. So he kind of like summarized those two points. So that was the closest I heard. Mm -hmm. On the Democratic yeah, well, side. I actually, yeah. and I just could jump in on yeah. for Taylor yeah. on that. Taylor, are, are, are people that you talk to, are content creators open in listening to these questions about privacy and their concerns about just who has access to their information and data? I think they correctly, I mean, it's so funny you mentioned Crenshaw because I was watching that too. And I think watching it, I was like, oh, okay. You know, he's having some good sound bites. But then when you read the comments on the TikTok live stream, they're eviscerating him. I think I think a lot of people take issue with the fact that they, they feel like um, they're being manipulated, right? They would say, absolutely not. I have autonomy. I choose, you know, how I watch my content, whatever. Of course, we know actually that content you know, these algorithms, like for instance, with YouTube, you know, we've seen time and time again, people get led, led, led down these rabbit holes with algorithmic content. Um, and so I think people kind of overestimate their ability to, you know, fight against that or have make up their own mind. Um, and in terms of the data privacy stuff, I no one I've talked to, I, I and I, I'm on a group chat with like 40 big creators, that is not something that they care about they care about it but but in, in they, they think that this is hypocritical um and i and i you know i see their point in the sense that like we don't have data privacy in america and if they ban tiktok a lot of these nefarious you know actors can very easily get american data elsewhere you know because we don't have this type of protections and so you know i don't know that i don't know i don't mm -hmm. think people i don't know if that is hitting i think that might hit with certain people and it might hit with the media TikTok creators that I've spoken to, they don't care. They're more worried about like, this is a multi-billion dollar industry and you're trying that you're gonna that you're gonna destroy overnight. And what's your plan for us? You know, what's your Jeff's, how are we gonna make a living? Yeah, to Jeff's point of this would be the most in your words, Jeff, the most massive taking away of something of the American people since prohibition. Um, James, you were talking about Democrats. We're yeah. trying to make that resonant argument that this is something you should be aware totally. of. Totally. I thought Angie Craig from Minnesota, yeah. the suburbs of the Twin Cities, did something that Crenshaw did, which was she really did feel like she was speaking to camera, trying to make the case to creators that this is more harm than good. And ultimately, it is a very powerful lobbying force, what Taylor's talking about. Billions of dollars that people have made uh, their entire livelihood coming from TikTok. And that is something that any ad administration action would have to reckon with. So it's a, a case that these members of Congress better be prepared to make if they want to move forward to their constituents. Rhonda, let's talk about how uh, other members of Congress have been interpreting today's hearing. As you've told us, there are a lot of committees that wanted a bite of this apple, that wanted to hear from the TikTok CEO. That's right. In the past, when there have been hearings, he has been sought. Uh, executives have been sought. TikTok did bring in uh, two years ago to a Senate hearing. They brought in one of their executives from the Americas Division, but that was it. So this is the first time Congress is hearing from someone that they've wanted to hear from for a while. Uh, I've been talking about the Restrict Act and how that's probably one of the bills that has been introduced that has one of the best odds at passing or getting gaining more traction here on the Hill. And uh, just to, to show you that 
others on the Hill have been watching today's proceedings. Uh, there was a joint statement that was just emailed out from Senators Mark Warner and uh, Senator John Thune. They are partnering on a bill that would give the Commerce Secretary the power to review uh, if any foreign-based apps are uh, detrimental or uh, pose a national security risk and then ban those uh, apps. They, uh, in a statement, said, under PRC law, all Chinese companies, including TikTok, whose parent company is based in Beijing, are ultimately required to do the bidding of Chinese intelligence, intelligence services. So they should be called upon to do so. Nothing we heard from Mr. Chu today assuaged those concerns. It is vital for Congress to establish a process to review and mitigate the harms posed by foreign technology. So they were watching it, and as I said earlier, uh, that this hearing may give them a little bit more ammunition to tell the other members of Congress if there are parties on Congress who are, are thinking, no, we can't do any regulations, we don't want to go far with this right now. That hearing uh, may have given them uh, some ammunition to keep pushing this bill. And I have seen over the last few weeks that they have really been talking about it. They had a big press conference. They now have 20 uh, co-sponsors on the bill. 20 include those senators that we're always looking at when we're wondering if a vote is going to pass or not. That's uh, Senator Manchin, Romney, Susan Collins. Uh, it's a long list of bipartisan senators. So if that's introduced and voted on whenever it's scheduled to go on the floor of the Senate, and it voted on, you could see perhaps from this hearing that it could be successful in the House. So there will be more on that to watch. But it does seem like all of the Hill uh, was watching today's proceedings. And James, as you have talked about, one of the leading pieces of legislation would actually give it to the Commerce Secretary to, to make some decisions about just how this company would move forward. It, it is a potential leverage point, this Restrict Act. And I just heard from a senior House Republican official who says that uh, he never thought that TikTok could actually get banned, but after today he does. Mm -hmm. He actually thinks it could be in play. And, uh, and you know, that, that, yeah, yeah, so that would, yeah. so mm -hmm. the bill would give the, it would mm -hmm. essentially give the administration bargaining power to negotiate, potentially to force a sale, potentially to force bigger concessions. And we've talked about just what that might look like, Jeff. Yeah, we, we don't we don't know how you ban an app in a, in America. That's not something we have a lot of experience here. You can ask it to be removed from app stores, but that won't disappear from people's phones. Um, you could set up some kind of national firewall, but that starts to sound a lot like China, not really very American. I mean, you certainly would see retaliation from the Chinese, potentially significantly so. Yeah, this is fascinating, but I, the. The big news that I just heard from you is that that Republicans now think that a ban or the power to ban is now closer, mm -hmm. which um, which means uh, something's going to happen. <laughs> I think next. And so let's go to Taylor for what this means for content creators and what you're hearing from them about where uh, a potential ban or some kind of migration might leave them. I mean, there is no app to migrate to because, as we know, um, you know, Facebook. It's, it's it's we live in this monopoly system where it's Facebook and YouTube are really the only main competitors, and neither of them function remotely similar to TikTok. Um, and and it's you know it's a horrible situation where these people, millions of people, are relying on this app, you know, for their livelihood and for to connect with people for activism activism as well. I mean, I think that's also something that a lot of young people are, are concerned about. I talked to kids involved in Gen Z for Change, this activist organization that, you know, does a lot of work in social justice movements. TikTok has been so vital to get underrepresented, you know, marginalized people heard um, in a way that they simply cannot elsewhere on social media. Um, and so I think it's terrifying from a financial standpoint for them. It's terrifying from a silencing effect. You know, these are a lot of members of oppressed groups that really feel like their voice is being completely taken away because there is no competition in our tech landscape, right? It's, it, it's this situation where Facebook has control and Google has control and they crush every other competitor. It's, it's like play by the rules or don't. So it's hard. I mean, you see these creators begging people to follow them on other apps, but those other apps will never be able to give them the, the voice that they have on TikTok because they're fundamentally different. Those are all follow-based, subscription-based apps, whereas TikTok is algorithmically driven. Jeff, one of the concerns we heard early on in this hearing was the question of black creator content and whether or not it's essentially being excluded or suppressed in some way. Tell us more about that. Yeah, um, there, I mean, in addition to the conversation about China today, there were also moments where we saw members of Congress bring up um, 
other big picture questions about how the TikTok app functions um, and how its algorithms work and uh, you know, the, the power that it has to potentially silence groups of people. And so one member of Congress brought up the concerns that, that TikTok was silencing, for example, black creators during the, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Uh, in particular, this is a practice that's sometimes called shadow banning, where certain ideas, certain kinds of people, they're still allowed to post, but they're just algorithmically de-amplified along the way. I, I, and there was a call during, during the hearing today for um, more transparency about algorithms. So these are uh, among the many important issues that, that Congress needs to wrestle with and that TikTok needs to wrestle with, um, but are kind of now getting uh, wrapped up with the China questions, which makes it hard to, hard to tease apart. Taylor, to that point, um that is about standing up for creators, and that is, you know, we talked about how this hearing really didn't represent necessarily the creator perspective very much. Does that start to get at it? What Jeff just referenced was a hoax. That was a hoax that we debunked on our own live blog. This, the, that lawmaker was saying that the Black Lives Matter hashtag was censored. That was a hoax perpetuated in a viral tweet that I had to debunk at the time as well. And I think this is just another example of how you know these falsehoods get posted online and repeated and then make their way to members of Congress. And no matter how many times you debunk that notion, TikTok never censored the Black Lives Matter hashtag. In fact, they featured it. TikTok, the Black Lives Matter hashtag was featured as one of the main hashtags throughout the summer of 2020. In, TikTok was actually encouraging users to create content under that hashtag. And yet you see these lawmakers, you know, saying the opposite because somebody posted a misinformation online that they ate right up because it fed, fed into their narrative. And that's not to say that, you know, black creators don't suffer racism on the app. Of course, this is social media, right? And I've written extensively about that. But, you know, as I've also written about, it's been a huge boost for, for creators of color. I mean, content creators on Instagram and YouTube and marginalized groups, you know, they had such a hard time getting traction because of the subscriber-based, you know, functionality of those apps. And so, you know, TikTok functions very differently. And, you know, to hear members of Congress saying these hoaxes as if they're fact is, is frustrating. Jeff? Yeah, uh, uh, it just goes to show that Congress needs to be having deep focused conversations about these specific kinds of issues, about things like algorithmic transparency. Uh, on the Black Lives Matter thing, there was a lot of back and forth about, uh, I think at some point, TikTok also put out a blog post in 2021 saying that there had been a mistake in one part of their systems that was not allowing people to use certain hashtags about Black Lives Matter, but Taylor is exactly right. They did come forward and, and promote Black Lives Matter content as well. So anyway, we need to be having conversations about this stuff as well, which is hard to do in this context of China, which is not exactly the same thing. Yeah, you know, Rhonda, you cover Capitol Hill hearings so often, and you know that it can be like a spaghetti, throw everything against the wall approach, especially when you have this five minute boom, boom, boom from various members. But what's the conversation like on Capitol Hill about teasing apart these issues and talking about the China national security question in and of itself, totally separate from this question of the mental health of teens and young people. It is totally separate. Uh, all of the issues brought up today are totally separate. But how do you legislate all of those separate issues? And what would be the likelihood of them passing something that just dealt with mental health for kids, just dealt with standards for you know on online use for kids, or or dealt with algorithms? The chances of that is pretty low. I think what you were saying, and another point I've raised too, is one of the reasons you're seeing the momentum of a ban, or at least giving the Commerce Secretary the ability to do a ban is because other countries have done it. And the U.S. now is not going to be alone in a potential ban of TikTok. So that's also a part of the calculation, I think, uh, that's prompting uh, this uh, potential ban or legislation to ban uh, TikTok in the U.S. Um, it's, it's so interesting to talk about the demographic of folks who may have been watching today, maybe for the first time. They're TikTok users and, and may not be accustomed to seeing how uh, these congressional hearings go. Uh, one of the interesting things is Congress probably knows that too. I mean, the people who are out there voting for them are usually not the people using TikTok a lot. You know, the electorate is skews a little older, uh, and younger people may not have uh, been thinking about their elected representative uh, when uh, the midterms happened. And you now see the result of these 
people who are elected have power to do things that are widespread and, and wide-ranging and could affect your life. So that's another civic lesson of today is that uh, Congress is aware that the people who are going to come out and vote are older. Yeah, I, I will point out, though, young voter turnout was very high during this midterm, second highest for a midterm in three decades. It is a demographic that a lot of people are watching uh, to, to make a difference in elections to come. James, final thoughts from you today. Just three years ago, TikTok spent $270,000 on lobbying. Last year, they spent $5.3 million. You can bet that number is going to be much higher this year. I think after today, you're going to see their lobbying effort go into overdrive, uh, making that very case. They have people who have held chop jobs for uh, Republicans and Democrats on Capitol Hill. Uh, uh, you know, if you're a vote for this Restrict Act that we're talking about, which I do think is going to have a lot of momentum, doesn't ban TikTok. It just gives the administration the power to do so. So you potentially could see this scenario where members are ba basically punting. They're saying, well, I just gave them the power to. I didn't vote to do that and try to, to thread the needle. So this is a, a very live issue. And I suspect that in this era of divided government, even with the desire to appeal to young people, this might be uh, a topic where we will see movement. Taylor, where do you see this conversation and this issue going from here? I just want to say one more time, again, I'm so sorry to, to harp on this, but I spent so much time trying to debunk this hoax. No hashtags were censored. No hashtags were censored. Briefly, all hash views on all hashtags on TikTok were temporarily unable to be seen from the search page. But that does, but that was all hashtags on TikTok for a brief period of time. You just couldn't view the view counts on the search page. So it had nothing to do with Black Lives Matter. TikTok has never censored, as far as I've we've seen evidence of, a specific hashtag like that in that context. Can I pause um, you on that, Taylor, for one moment? Yeah. Do you think that um, Shochu was able to give an adequate response to that and enter that dialogue because we're hearing from black members of Congress saying, I want to make sure that my constituents and my community has strength on this platform, is not censored on this platform, you know, is, is, is able to really find community here. Was he able to have that dialogue and prove that point? No, he wasn't because to have those dialogues, we have to have this type of back and forth. You have to have a nuanced understanding of the app. Clearly, these people have zero understanding of the app. You know, if I'm trying to describe, okay, view counts were hidden on the search page for all hashtags, I don't think Congress of members, members of Congress even understand what that means. And just again, it's it's one of those things where this easy narrative will go viral time and time again online, and it's an easy narrative to tap into the truth as with everything, is far more complicated. I co-produced an entire documentary on, you know, black a black TikTok content creator house and the struggles that they deal with in terms of racism and the app and stuff. But that is not coming from the app itself. A lot of racism is coming from users. And of course, there's signals in the feed that might, you know, black creators are, are undeniably have a harder time on Instagram, YouTube, any social media app because of systemic racism. But it's just misinformation to say that, you know, TikTok, you know, removed views of this hashtag. And so that's what's so frustrating about these, the, the conversations with members of Congress is like, there's things that we, there's huge problems with TikTok that we really need to discuss and that we really need solutions for, not just TikTok, but all social media. But instead, we just get quibbling over, you know, viral pieces of misinformation or sound bites and things like this. There's there's so many things that are seriously the matter with the way that our social media ecosystem is set up. But I worry that, you know, because we don't have any lawmakers that seem to understand how these apps function, we're never going to get the type of legislation needed to really protect users. All right. Thank you so much, Taylor. Jeff, I want to get final thoughts from you on where this conversation goes from here and what we take away from this hearing today. I think users of TikTok and parents are, are and people are concerned about are in a really frustrating place mm -hmm. right now. Um, first of all, we're not very used to our technology getting wrapped up in geopolitics, getting wrapped up in congressional politics. It feels very personal. I mean, our, as Taylor is making the case for, our relationship with our social media platforms and our communities that we create there feels very personal. Yeah. And as Taylor is pointing out, um, we need to be having important 
uh, nuanced, technically yeah. sound conversations about uh, about what the what not only TikTok but what lots of social media companies are doing, the choices they're making, how their algorithms work. Um, we didn't get a lot of that today. So on one level, today we saw a lot of outrage. We saw a lot of concern from members of Congress representing some of their their, their constituents. But uh, we saw the CEO of TikTok. Um, largely evading those things. Also not being given a chance to really address these things directly in a way that might have furthered the conversation. So that's frustrating. And then on the other side, we're frustrated because, uh, because the, uh, the, the, the argument did not get laid out, I think, to you know, the 150 million, Ameri million Americans who use TikTok. Uh, why should be taken away from us? We didn't really get any new evidence other than it could be bad, or it could, and your data could up in the, end up in the hands of the Chinese government. We didn't get anything that furthered that conversation, I feel. All right, well, thank you so much to Jeff, James, Rhonda, Taylor, and all of our colleagues like Kat Zakreski, who've been reporting on this, and thank you for watching this hearing today with the newsroom of the Washington Post. We will continue to cover this story on all of our various platforms. I'm Libby Casey. You can keep our coverage live at WashingtonPost.com and pretty much everywhere else. I'll see you again soon. The Washington Post newsroom delivers breaking events around the world as they happen. Unrivaled reporting from the journalists you've come to trust to get the facts fast and meet the challenges of today head on. Get the news that matters most with a special offer by visiting WashingtonPost.com slash watch. Subscribing unlocks instant access, bringing you the Post's award-winning coverage anytime, anyplace, because democracy dies in darkness.